Hello friends. This is Fanfic Adventure. How are you all? So in this video, we will see. What if Naruto was the host of a symbiotic power, movie part 01. But before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video with your friends. Now without wasting any more time, let's begin the story. The night in Konoha had been calm, quiet, and peaceful. Young Naruto, a six-year-old spiky-haired blonde boy slept peacefully in his apartment, his pajamas and nightcap as his choice of clothing. His slumber had been uninterrupted, that was till a foreign object slammed through his roof, destroying the floor below his bed, and killing his neighbors below. During the chaos of the whole event Naruto had fallen to the first floor and practically kissed the uninviting ground. Groggily looking around Naruto couldn't believe the destruction surrounding him as his bedroom no longer existed and the debris from his room mostly covering the current room he was in. Too dazed to truly be aware of his surrounding, Naruto did not see the black slime crawling out of a crater and continuing towards him. The parasite, no, the symbiote, it could no longer be called such a thing as it had made the decision to help its host instead of slowly feeding off them, only to throw them away for another. Odd how its noble belief had angered its race to the point that they had imprisoned it and sent it off in the hopes it would not spread its belief. The symbiote knew not what deity it should thank as it could only be by the hand of some god that its prison had not only been thrown off course from the barren planet that was its original destination, but broken upon impact. The black life form didn't want to think of the hell it could have spent in for the next several millennia if not for its new predicament. As happy as it was to be free it was faced with a problem. It had already been some time since it had been attached to a host and without one it would surely die. Unfortunately the closest living being was the small child a few feet away, and experience had shown the symbiote that most kids were either too curious for their own good or easily scared. Right now it did not want to take any chances. So instead of rushing and scaring the child away, the symbiote chose to silently crawl towards the small boy and attach itself to him. When it had made contact, a thought of success and much more coursed through it as it began to sense the strong emotions inside of the kid. It hadn't long to delve on this new sensation as it had begun to sense several life forms converging on its and the kid's position. Covering the pajama pants of its new host, it blended itself so to not be seen. Unaware of his new passenger, Naruto had begun trying to find a way out of the wreckage that surrounded him. Luckily several Anbu along with the Hokage had arrived and helped him out. The white-robed old man carefully studied Naruto. Naruto are you hurt anywhere? Do you remember anything? He asked with genuine concern lacing his old voice. The young blonde simply smiled. Yeah I'm okay old man, um what did happen? Tension left his shoulders as the Hokage verified that Naruto was fine. I'm not sure, stated the aged cage. Naruto looked over the remains of his apartment. I'm going to need a new place to live in. The Hokage chuckled. Well Naruto that can be easily fixed. In the meantime you can stay with me till I find you another apartment. The young boy jumped for joy at the idea of living at the Hokage's house for a short time. Unknown to either individual, the symbiote was beginning a long and slow process of bonding with Naruto. Six years later Naruto laughed as he bounced off yet another wall as he ran from the several Konoha nins. Why was he being chased? Well that had something to do with a few buckets of paints and a few statues. Naruto let loose another laugh at the thought of his prank. Some would think that Naruto had done it for attention, but no, he did it due to a bet he made and he planned to collect on it. You'll never catch us alive, howled Naruto as he ran across the side of a yellow building. The odd way Naruto referred to himself as being more than one person didn't quirk anyone as it had been a habit he'd picked up long ago. It had worried the Hokage at first, but after a while he simply accepted it as a strange tick. But unknown to all but Naruto, it was thanks to the symbiote that shared his body. After nearly a year of bonding with Naruto, the symbiote had decided to make its presence known to its host. At first it had provided Naruto with hints of its existence in order to not spook him before truly revealing itself. Naruto had taken the news better than most would and was actually excited about the idea of being bonded with the alien life form. He even welcomed the side effects that came along with it. Referring to himself as we and us had only been the beginning, Naruto had learned that he would no longer tolerate being treated less than any normal person would. A nasty temper and a smart mouth seemed to be the only bad side effects so far and were easy to ignore over the positive effects. 
The symbiote had gifted Naruto with a new sense of awareness and had given his body a whole new sense of balance and superiority. Now Naruto could flip through the air with such ease that some would wonder how he had gained his acrobatic skills along with how he never seemed to trip or slip. Increased strength along with what Naruto claimed to be perfect chakra was an added bonus. It had been a simple task for the symbiote to give its host the chakra control he desired once it had learned enough about the new energy that was chakra. As cool as all these things were, Naruto's favorite ability was his symbiote's ability to transform into any clothing needed and even blend into his surroundings when used right. Speaking of clothes, Naruto had his symbiote take on the form of a full black wardrobe. Midnight black boots helped propel him forward and loose leather pants gave off a small, dark, blue, sheen off its black surface and a tight turtle framed his body well enough as to allow his muscles to show while a leather jacket matched his pants was worn unzipped. A pair of black gloves and a mask that covered his mouth was the last piece of clothing on him. There were only two places on his clothing that held any other color than black. The first spot was his mask where a set of razor-sharp teeth crisscrossed over his mouth as if it had been painted there and the second was a large white spider emblem that took up much of his chest and torso as its large head and body had been centered on his torso while its eight legs curved under and around his armpits only to copy the spider onto his back as well. Oddly enough it had been one of his classmates that had given him his fondness to the spider symbol he wore. Flashback. One year ago Naruto had been running late to class again. Instead of walking in, admitting he woke up late, and take a scolding from his teacher Uruka. He opted to sneak into the class. Crawling up the wall of the school on all four, Naruto used his chakra control to climb towards a window quickly and silently. A quick look inside showed that Uruka was busy writing on the board while his other sensei, Mizuki and the class had their attention on him. Opening the window quickly, Naruto used the same skill crawling up the building, to crawl along the wall and ceiling unnoticed. An empty seat next to his fellow classmate Shino was his destination. The poor Aburame nearly had a heart attack when Naruto had simply dropped down next to him and had visibly flinched. A few seconds was all it took for him to regain his composure. I swear Naruto, you remind me far too much of one of my insect's most hated enemies, said Shino in his usual stoic voice. Naruto blinked a few times before giving Shino a questioning look. Oh and what would that be? Arachnids, was Shino's simple answer. A quick, huh? was Naruto's reply. Shino let out a sigh before pointing to a corner in the room. Spiders. Following the direction Shino pointed to, Naruto spotted a web in the corner of the room and sure enough in the middle of the web was a large spider. Why do we remind you of spiders? Naruto asked, being sincerely curious. You crawl along walls with all your limbs and by the time anyone notices you, it's too late, said Shino, a slight shudder running through his body. Naruto pondered on what Shino told him before a feral grin crossed his face. Maybe you're right. Hey seeing as you're the bug enthusiast, how about you tell us more about spiders? Before Shino could answer a chalkboard eraser bounced off Naruto's head, which lead to Naruto turning towards his assailant, Uruka and begin a heated argument on whether he was truly late or not. End of flashback having grown tired of his game of cat and mouse, Naruto decided to pick things up. Ricocheting off a nearby wall, Naruto let out a small thread of his symbiote from his glove to latch onto another wall and swing around to the other side of the building, an idea he had come up with when Shino had begun explaining the anatomy of a spider and their many abilities. The two chunins following behind him had jumped around the corner only to be greeted by Naruto's once again miraculous disappearance. As soon as the chunins left, a small section of the side of a building began to shimmer before Naruto appeared as plain as day. He he he, works every time he stated proudly before making his way towards his class. The class buzzed with gossip thanks to the absence of both of their senseis, so much that few even realized that Naruto had opened a window and entered the class. It wasn't until Naruto landed harshly on a desk in front of Kiba in a squat that the whole class knew he was there. We win our little bet, Kiba. Kiba for his part had only jumped a little while the dog on his head, Akamaru, gave an angry bark from being awakened. Ha as if you actually outran all of them, you're probably just getting back from the Hokage's office. Naruto used his eyes to give Kiba a threatening sneer, one that Kiba returned instantly. The fact that neither Uruka nor Mizuki is here proves that they still haven't caught us. 
Once finished with his sentence, Naruto held out his hand, palm up. Kiba allowed a defiant look to stay on his face for a few seconds more before letting out a huff and slipping his hands into his pocket to retrieve a roll of money. Kiba slapped the money into Naruto's hand before sitting down while mumbling curses. Naruto didn't even bother counting it before heading to his preferred seat next to Shino. Kiba was loyal and honest to a fault. He may not have liked losing a bet, and he and Naruto had gotten into several fist fights over the role of alpha male, but that didn't mean he would cheat Naruto. Hanada gave Naruto a shy smile before looking away. Her crush had become rather frightening, but his confidence had still drawn her towards him. Her seat next to Shino was her way of trying to get to know him, but her shyness prevented her from talking to him. Instead she had only been able to give him hopeful glances every now and then. What have you done? Shino accused Naruto as he took his seat. The teeth on Naruto's mask seemed to groan into a menacing smile. Oh nothing much, just redecorating the four cage faces. Hanada openly gasped while Shino slowly turned to Naruto. Shino's voice had been unusually loud and held the annoyance that few doubted Shino could feel. You did what? Before Naruto could reply, the classroom door burst open to reveal Ruka among several other Konoha nins, all of which were leveling a collective glare towards Naruto. Naruto, you're to come to the Hokage office now, said blonde began snickering uncontrollably, we guess we have no choice. An impatient Chunin gave a quick command before launching himself at Naruto, get him. Naruto laughed as he simply jumped over the lone Chunin and then out the still open window. Once outside he made a beeline for the Hokage Tower. Scrubbing off the paint he put on the four cage faces was Naruto's punishment. Thank God we had the foresight to use watercolors. Regular paint would have taken hours to remove. Uruka had been the one to watch over Naruto as he cleaned the faces. Naruto why do you pull these pranks? You have the potential to be at the top of your class, in fact the only thing stopping you is your lazy attitude when it comes to studying. Naruto who had just finished wiping off the last face dropped his sponge into a bucket before giving Uruka a bored look. What good are those grades you write down in that booklet? Today we've proven that we can outrun and even hide from Chunin. The only reason we haven't proven that we can outfight a Chunin is the fact that an assault charge could actually land us in jail. Especially since that would be assaulting a ninja. Uruka shook his head before responding. While that may be true, you should apply yourself. A little too late for that, don't you think? The graduation test is tomorrow and we've proven to you time and time again that we can perform any and all of the necessary ninjutsu, and we now just enough to pass the written portion. Naruto stated confidently. At least give it your all during the tests, Uruka said with a little hope in his voice. The chuckle Naruto let out bothered him, but Uruka, if we actually tried, Sasuke wouldn't be top shinobi, and if that happened, his entire group of fangirls would commit mass suicide. Now we wouldn't want that, now would we? He said with much sarcasm. It was no secret to Uruka that Naruto despised Sasuke. It all started when Naruto and Sasuke had a spar together at school. Sasuke not only beat Naruto in one swift move, but insulted him as well. A few months later Naruto had started going through his changes and the two were once again selected to spar with one another. Sasuke still thought Naruto was nothing to worry about and had turned his back on him at the start of the match to anger Naruto and make him rush in like a fool. He angered him all right, but things went completely south for Sasuke the second Naruto destroyed the gap between them within a blink of the eye and proceeded to beat on him like a drum. Much to the horrors of Sasuke's fan club, by the time Uruka had been able to restrain Naruto, Sasuke had a broken nose, several bruises and five broken ribs. From that day forward Uruka had to be ready to interfere in a moment's notice whenever Naruto and Sasuke were pitted against one another, as Naruto made it a hobby to tear the self-righteous Uchiha apart whenever he could get away with it. That was another thing that bothered Uruka. Naruto knew how to dance on the fine line that bordered on the difference of him being arrested or just given some small chore like punishment. We're done Uruka, stated Naruto before proceeding to climb down the mountain on all fours and head home. Uruka said a goodbye to Naruto before heading to his own home. A week later as Naruto had promised he passed the test easily, though he didn't give it his all as Uruka had hoped. Still a Konoha headband was wrapped around his head in the form of a bandana that covered the top portion of his head, giving his mask an even more terrifying look as his eyes were now the only visible feature of his face. Hey Shino, 
Think we'll be on the same team, or will we be your predator? Naruto asked. A small shudder went through Shino. I don't know Naruto, although I'm in favor of being on your team, said Shino, whispering the last part. Shino didn't know why, but he felt some kind of connection to Naruto, as if he were kin. Hanada, who was listening to the two, let out a small giggle as she heard Shino's whisper. The classroom door opened and Uruka entered the class alone, causing many of the students to give questioning looks. All right, class, as you know, this will be our last day together, so quiet down. One student raised a hand and Uruka nodded to him. Uruka sensei. Where's Mizuki sensei? The disappointed look on Uruka's face wasn't missed by Naruto and a few others. Something came up and Mizuki couldn't be here. If there aren't any more questions, I'd like to start the day off by telling you how proud I am of you and. Naruto had stopped paying attention after that as he was sure he knew that Uruka was going to tell them what was expected of them and how they were being given an honor, and blah blah blah. After his speech, Uruka pulled out a piece of paper and began informing the students of which team they would be a part of. Once again, Naruto didn't pay much attention till he heard his name Naruto Uzumaki, Sakura Haruno, and Uruka's face paled slightly before stating the last part Sasuke Uchiha will be Team 7. Looking up towards Naruto, Uruka couldn't help but sweat when Naruto's mask looked as if it were smiling and Naruto let out a bone chilling laughter. Oh, this is going to be lots of fun. Ten minutes after Uruka had finished explaining who was in what team, Naruto decided to find out what happened concerning his other sensei. It wasn't hard to see that Uruka didn't want to tell everyone what had happened, but Naruto was curious. Getting up from his seat and walking towards Uruka, Naruto briefly saw the disappointed look on Hinata's face. Maybe she doesn't like one of her teammates, or she didn't get put on the team along with someone she wanted. Uruka took notice of Naruto's presence. Now Naruto I know you're not happy about your team but. Uno sensei. We are rather happy about our team. Naruto spoke in a near sing-song fashion. Uruka couldn't help but feel bad for Sasuke, but then again Naruto would be watched by a janin. We are just curious about Mizuki. What happened? Naruto asked. Look Naruto I don't really want to tall, on second thought I guess I can tell you, just not right now. How about you come by tomorrow after you and your team gets associated? Naruto narrowed his eyes at how Uruka said associated, he could just smell a hidden meaning behind it. Satisfied with Uruka's promise, Naruto began heading back to his seat just in time for the Jonin instructors to arrive and begin collecting their teams. It wasn't long before the only remaining people in the class were Naruto, Uruka, Sakura and Sasuke. Uruka, who had just finished collecting his things, headed for the door to leave before sending Team 7 an apologetic look. I guess your Jonin instructor is running late, again. Just wait here, I'm sure he'll get here, eventually, said Uruka before leaving them alone. Naruto shook his head as he was now alone with the two people he hated most. Sakura wasn't as much hated as she was disliked. Naruto had liked her at first thanks to the bright color of her hair, but just as the symbiote got rid of Naruto's goofy attitude, so too did his crush disappeared. Sakura's infatuation with Sasuke did make him dislike her. Now Sasuke on the other hand was a different story. Hate was the right word for what Naruto felt towards him. Sasuke had everything Naruto could want, but didn't care as he ignored the people that cared and respected him so he could stay in his world of self-pity and loathing. Despite this he still acted as if he was above everyone and insulted all those who didn't agree with him. Sasuke how about after we meet our new sensei, you and I go out to dinner? Sakura asked in hope of accomplishing what all other girls had failed to do. Naruto rolled his eyes as he predicted what would happen next and even mouthed the reply. No, oh come one Sasuke it will be fun, Sakura stated, undismayed by Sasuke's blatant dismissal. Sasuke didn't even give a response. Things went like this for another two hours before Naruto lost his patience. Getting up and heading towards the door, he planned on kicking down the door. He stopped when he thought of the consequences of doing such a thing. A fine for destruction of property, a scolding from Uruka, and in the end he'd solve nothing as the person he was angry at could probably care less about the wooden door. So instead, he lightly slammed the door open, lightly in the fact that the door only cracked instead of shattering, before leaving. Sakura and Sasuke stared at the exit for a few seconds as they both thought along the same lines. Freak, loser, 
the Hokage was bored beyond what he thought was possible as he was once again signing papers. Tap 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 some would wonder how such a sound could seem like wonderful music to the Hokage, but it was. The sound was Naruto using his index finger to tap onto the window behind the old cage. Hiruzen gave a small signal to Naruto giving him the go-ahead to come him. Using his hand to stick to the window, Naruto lifted it open just enough for him to slip in. Oh how he loved his chakra control and his many uses for it. There wasn't so much as a crack on the window and thanks to his gloves, a print neither. Naruto what brings you here? The Hokage asked. Naruto let out a chuckle. Oh nothing much, just bored. Hiruzen let out a chuckle. Oh I see, how do you like your team? Ha! Huh. Was Naruto's response. How many laws have we been accused of breaking concerning the Uchiha? The Hokage couldn't help but shake his head as he reached into his desk and brought out a stack of papers nearly 30 pages in total. 5 charges of attempted murder, 10 charges of assault, 9 charges of battery, with 3 charges being both assault and battery at the same time. Naruto smiled as if remembering fond memories. Yeah we thought as much. Oddly enough Sasuke wasn't the one to press charges against us. You're just lucky that he didn't press charges or you would be in serious trouble Naruto stated the Hokage. Naruto simply shook his head. Luck had nothing to do with it. If Sasuke did press charges he would have to admit that we were strong enough to commit such crimes. One of the invisible Anbu snickered in the corner of the room, ruining his sense of invisibility. Hiruzen sent a raised eyebrow towards his Anbu, silencing him. Though he had to admit that using someone's pride to get away with beating the shit out of him was indeed funny. That may be so Naruto. But now that you are a ninja you can't go around doing such things anymore. If I were to be shown one of these. The Hokage said as he picked up one of the many papers. Then I would have no choice but to give you the appropriate punishment. Naruto let a huff. Fine we guess. Would we be able to beat him within an inch of his life in spars? No, and besides it's still not determined whether Team 7 is official. Naruto's reply was instant. What do you mean our team may not be official yet? Naruto's words caused Hiruzen to blink at him a few times. Didn't Kakashi tell you? Who? The Hokage placed his fingers onto his temples and began rubbing. Your Jonin instructor never came, did he? Naruto shook his head the Hokage let out a deep sigh before mumbling. I told him about you and he still decided to arrive late. Once his little rant to himself was over, Hiruzen gave Naruto his attention again. Naruto I need you to go and find one of your teammates, and ask them what Kakashi has told them. All right, we guess. Naruto said before leaving exiting through the very window he entered through. Guess we'll go find Sakura, at least she won't piss us off too badly. After Naruto left, Hiruzen looked over to the same corner that was occupied by the snickering Anbu. Get me Hitaki. Apparently I need to remind him that orders are orders. All good humor left the Anbu as he let go of his illusion and gave a quick bow before disappearing. Naruto opened his bathroom door, entering as he planned to start a bath, turning the knob for the hot water all the way while he only turned the cold water a quarter of the way created the perfect mixture of hot and cold for his body. While he waited for the tub to fill up he thought about what Sakura had told him. Great, just great. All those years spent we spent in that school and we still haven't become ninja. And what was that about 66%, something about that just doesn't sit right with us. Seeing as the tube had filled up enough for Naruto to enjoy himself, he gave the command for his symbiote to withdraw into him, leaving him except for the headband on his head, which he simply threw onto the counter before settling into the water. No point in us worrying over tomorrow, we'll just have to take things one step at a time. Thought Naruto before scrubbing himself down with a soaped rag. The next day just as Sakura told him to, Naruto arrived at training ground 7 at around 8. Near the three erect training posts sat Sakura and Sasuke, both of whom looked miserable thanks to a mixture of hunger and lack of sleep. Naruto simply shook his head before leaping onto a nearby tree branch. He had tried to give her fair warning that not eating was a mistake and that their new sensei's threat was ill found as if they did work so hard that they could puke, that they would whether there was substance in their stomach or none. The only difference food would make is the difference between a dry heave and a hurl. We give him 30 more minutes before we have a nice chat with the Hokage, said Naruto as he began mentally counting the minutes away. The two on the ground didn't say anything, 
but were in full agreement with him doing so. The thirty minutes had quickly come and gone, and just as Naruto was getting ready to leave Kakashi appeared in the middle of the training ground via leaf body flicker. All right that was far too convenient Hitaki, Naruto thought. Kakashi wore the standard Jonin uniform which consisted of dark blue shirt and pants with a green Jonin vest zipped up over it. His headband was worn in a fashion that covered one of his eyes and probably assisted his gray hair in its gravity-defying stance. Before we begin the test I would like for everyone to say a little about themselves seeing as we couldn't do so yesterday thanks to a missing teammate, said Kakashi while looking at Naruto. Sakura looked confused. Um like what sensei? Likes, dislikes, hobbies, and goals of the such, Kakashi stated in a bored tone. Oh, how about you go first sensei? Sakura asked. Thirty seconds later Sakura was annoyed while Naruto and Sasuke could have cared less about the lazy nin and his evasive answers. Kakashi pointed towards Naruto. Alright how about we start off with you? Naruto chuckled. What's the point? You already know about us, as I'm sure the Hokage told you many things about us, and these two have been our classmates for several years. True, but I'm sure that there are things that me and them don't know about you, was Kakashi's reply. Yes, and if we haven't told them as classmates then why would we want to tell them now? Naruto said. Kakashi let out a sigh. As a team we should attempt to form a bond between one another and the best way to start is by getting to know one another. But it's not definite that we are a team yet. His hand slapping his own forehead was all Kakashi could do in response. Dear God I can't wait to fail this team, fine, we'll do the test first said Kakashi as he pulled out two bells and began explaining the rules of the test. After explaining the rules Kakashi rung the proverbial starting bell and all three gen and wannabes leapt into the trees. Well at least they're hiding well. I can still sense Sakura and Sasuke, but where is Naruto? Kakashi asked himself. Guess what the Hokage said about Naruto's ability to completely hide his presence is true. It had been twenty minutes into the test and nothing had happened. Sakura was getting antsy as she was waiting for a chance to help Sasuke. Her only concern was that Naruto would get a hold of one of the two bells, leaving her alone as she doubted that Sasuke would be unable to attain his own bell. Suddenly a hand covered her mouth and pulled her back, she'd have screamed if not for the obvious futility. Naruto then turned her towards him and put a finger to his lips. S is shish, we want to tell you something, will you be quiet and listen to us? Sakura disliked Naruto and would probably tell anyone else to go screw themselves, but at the same time she feared him even more. So instead of providing resistance, she simply nodded her head dumbly. Before speaking Naruto decided to remove his hand from Sakura's mouth. Only two of us can pass this test and to be truthful we don't like this team all that much. So here is what we propose. We will remove ourselves from this test so that you and Sasuke can team up together without worry that we will jump in and take a bell. Sasuke is over there in one of the trees, we advise you to inform him of our decision. Sakura nodded her head fast before a smile crossed her face and she left to find Sasuke. Just as Naruto promised, he left and began heading towards the academy, he had questions and Uruka had promised him answers. It didn't take long for Sakura to find Sasuke as Naruto had been right about his location. Sasuke for his part had sensed Sakura coming and had sent her an angry glare. What are you doing here? You've most likely alerted Kakashi to our location. Sakura looked down in disappointment before reminding herself as to why she was there to begin with. Wait I have to tell you something. It can wait till after the test, now go, said Sasuke cutting her off. Sakura shook her head. No it concerns the test. Naruto told me he doesn't want to be a part of the team and has left. Now it's only the two of us and we can focus on getting the bells without worrying about being dropped from the program. Why should I believe you, for all I know he lied to you, was Sasuke's reply. Sakura's face now sported a dead panned look. Sasuke, this is Naruto we're talking about. He doesn't lie, if he says he going to do something he typically does it. Sasuke shook his head at this. She was right about that, Naruto didn't lie about what he planned to do. Sasuke knew that all too well, though he loathed the very thought of admitting it. A thought crossed his mind at the moment and an angry growl escaped his throat. Damn it! I've been waiting for him to attack Kakashi all this time for nothing. As much as Sasuke hate to, he turned to Sakura. When I go to attack Kakashi, can you give me some support? 
Sasuke knew better to try and attack Kakashi without some support or at the very least a distraction, something he was hoping Naruto would have provided. Sakura nearly squealed from the question given to her, of course. With that said the two prepared to confront Kakashi. Kakashi flipped yet another page of his orange book. He had been surprised by how patient the three had been. Normally there was at least one genin would charge in head first, he or she thinking that they could actually take Kakashi. Twenty more minutes and he had begun to wonder if they had any intention of trying to pass the test at all. Two shurikens flew towards him and he simply tilted his head as the projectiles passed by. Well it's about time something happened, said Kakashi as he looked towards his yet to be students. Naruto used his favorite window to get into the classroom. Haruka saw this and shook his head. You're never going to use the door, are you? Naruto laughed at Aruka's expression. That's not true sensei. Just yesterday we used the door to leave class. Well that explains the cracks. Aruka mumbled. Naruto walked over to the first row desks and sat down. So Aruka, what happened to Mizuki? Aruka let out a sigh. Mizuki had been caught trying to steal the forbidden scroll of jutsus from the Hokage's office and leave the village. Naruto scratched his head. So he tried to go traitorous. You mentioned that we deserved to know. Why is that? Aruka walked over to the door and ensured that it was locked before approaching Naruto and joining him on the desk. When Mizuki was interrogated, he tried to name you as his accomplice. A growl reverberated through Naruto's throat and his eyes narrowed. We take it that they didn't believe him, seeing as we're not behind bars. Aruka nodded. Inoichi Yamanaka delved into Mizuki's mind and discovered that it was a lie. Though he discovered that Mizuki had thought about tricking you into stealing it for him. But you had become too self-reliant and Mizuki figured that you wouldn't fall for his trick and decided to steal it himself. Why would he pick us? Naruto asked. Aruka's face darkened, I don't know. Despite Aruka's lie Naruto understood instantly why thanks to the look on his face. Mizuki had been hoping to prey on the feelings of a Jinchuriki. It was wise that Mizuki didn't try to trick him as he would have come to a disturbing surprise, one that would make his imprisonment seem small. Naruto knew about his status, or to be more correct, his previous status. Flashback it had been nearly a year since the symbiote had inhabited Naruto and it had come to a shocking discovery. It wasn't alone? For some time it had decided to study its neighbor. With enough time the symbiote learned enough to categorize its neighbor and discovered it was some kind of large fox. Why something like this inhabited Naruto, the symbiote didn't know, but it would find out if the fox could prove useful or at the very least find out if it was harmful. Months went by and the symbiote discovered many things about the fox, both good and bad. If its host could ever learn how to wield the power of the fox then they would be nearly invincible, but that was highly unlikely as the fox wasn't like the symbiote. The fox had no intentions of helping Naruto and would kill him if ever given the chance. Luckily the seal on Naruto's abdomen prevented the fox from doing so and ultimately made the fox harmless. In the end, the symbiote decided that the fox had to go. It came to this decision not because it viewed the fox as a threat or hindrance to Naruto, but because it felt that the fox was nothing but a waste of space. As long as Naruto had the symbiote, why would he need the fox, especially when the fox would rebel against Naruto at every given chance. Instead of having a battle of the wills inside of Naruto's mind, the symbiote decided to simply crush the fox at the source. Ironic how the all-powerful fox was unable to even defend itself so long as it was sealed in Naruto, while the symbiote was capable of so much more while in Naruto. The fox did attempt to fight back but ultimately failed as the symbiote took no form and simply smothered the soul that emitted the mental image of the fox till death to hold of it. Flashback end. It's a good thing that Mizuki didn't go through with his plan to use us cause we would have ripped his skull and spine from his body. Naruto stated. Aruka shuddered as he knew full well that Naruto would do so. Let's put this behind us Naruto, what's done is done, so how are things going with your team? Naruto let out a chuckle, not sure, we left Sakura and Sasuke to complete the test. Aruka had to ask himself if he heard Naruto right. Yeah Naruto had done many unbelievable things, but never something like this. And Naruto. Why did you do such a thing? Uruka yelled. Because Kakashi attempted to pit us against each other. Naruto simply stated as if it was such an easy concept. Uruka gave Naruto a questioning look. What do you mean? 
He gave us a test that required us to get two bells from him, the person that didn't get a bell would be dropped from the ninja program. So we decided to remove ourselves so that the others could pass without worrying about our interference. Uruka nodded at this line of thought, though he knew it was bullshit that Naruto would be removed from the program he decided to ask his question. So what about you? You just going to give up on being a ninja? A hearty laugh came out of Naruto's mouth, no I know there's no way the old man would prevent me from becoming a ninja, just because of a silly test like this. Naruto paused before continuing, especially with my status as a jinchuriki, he lied. Uruka's eyes widened, so you know, Naruto nodded his head, for a while now. Jumping off the desk he was sitting on and making his way towards the window, Naruto stopped only to look at Uruka for a brief second. Our chat has been fun Uruka, maybe we'll be seeing you soon. Uruka sent a sad smile towards Naruto, though he was hopeful that Naruto wouldn't be attending the academy for another year. After leaving the academy, Naruto decided to get a bite to eat before heading home, he was simply jumping from roof to roof, minding his own business as he made his way through the village when three kanai embedded themselves in his path. Sensing a presence a few feet behind him, Naruto turned his head to find Kakashi glaring at him with his lone eye. So tell me Naruto, what made you think that leaving in the middle of the test was a good idea? Naruto simply shrugged his shoulder in an I don't care fashion, it was for the good of the team. Kakashi looked like he didn't believe Naruto, at least that was the emotion his lone eye revealed. Well just so you know, your absence has caused your team to fail, I hope you're happy with a civilian life, said Kakashi. Ha, huh, as if you would simply track me down to tell me this you lazy bastard. Don't try to rile us up just because we refuse to play your game, Naruto said before jumping off the side of the roof and disappearing from Kakashi's sight. Naruto was right, Kakashi had come for more, he had hoped that if he confronted Naruto, he could get a response from Naruto that would help him figure him out, but Naruto was unfazed from Kakashi's words and had simply laughed them off. Looking at the time Kakashi decided that he better head to the Hokage Tower and give his verdict on Team 7. The Hokage's office was filled with several janin, as each one began giving their verdict on whether their team passed or failed. This went on till there were only three teams left, and two of the janins of the team approached the Hokage's desk. Team 8 has passed their test and are prepared to be administrated into service, said women that could be described as a supermodel. Her long black hair was filled with waves and curls. Red eyes filled with respect gazed at the old man and her choice of clothes was a battle dress composed of several bandages that had been sewn together in a spiraling pattern that stopped mid-thigh and only had one red long sleeve. Same goes for Team 9, said the second Jonin who wore a similar Jonin outfit that Kakashi wore. A lit cigarette bobbed up and down from his mouth as he talked. His other defining feature was his tan skin, spiky hair and beard that made him look like a younger Hiruzen Sarutobi. Now only one of the teams was remaining and its Jonin had yet, not truly surprising all who knew of his habit. The Hokage was just about to signal for an Anbu when Kakashi appeared in a swirl of leaves. Sorry for being late, I had to deal. Can it Kakashi, what is your verdict? The Hokage interrupted. Kakashi's reply was instant. Team 7 failed. Kakashi before your decision is final I would like to inform you that I watched over your test and the actions your students took. Please explain in detail why you feel that your team failed, the Hokage asked. A slight widening of Kakashi's eye was the only indication that Kakashi was surprised. I gave my usual test of teamwork and being able to see past lies. Naruto left in the middle of the test, leaving his teammates to fend for themselves. Many of the Jonins began murmuring to one another about Naruto's action while others didn't seem all that surprised, especially when one considered that Sasuke was his teammate. The Hokage gave a few seconds for the Jonins to quiet down before raising his hand for silence. Kakashi are you basing your decision on Naruto's action alone? Because as I saw, both Sasuke and Sakura had fulfilled the part of working as a team. The Hokage stated. Kakashi thought for a second before responding. No while Sakura and Sasuke did work together, they didn't do so until Naruto left. While they show that they are capable of working together, they also showed that they aren't capable of working with Naruto. The Hokage nodded. As that may be, they can learn to. I'm going to be honest with you Kakashi. Whether you fail Team 7 or not, Naruto will still go on to be a Konoha ninja. 
The room once again filled with murmurs as they couldn't believe what their Hokage had said. Kakashi was the first to recover from his shock and decided to ask the question everyone was wondering. Why would Naruto still be a genin if Team 7 has failed? There is a reason I put Naruto into Team 7 and not because of his grades. I wanted to test Naruto, and he passed. Naruto hates Sasuke, this is no secret. He could have chosen to sabotage Sasuke and ensure that he couldn't become a genin. Instead Naruto chose to remove himself so that the team would be able to operate effectively. I wanted to see if Naruto would put the mission before his feelings and he proved he could. Several of the Janins nodded as they had heard of the several times Naruto had put Sasuke into a hospital during what was supposed to be a friendly spar. Hokage, does Naruto's status as a Jinchuriki have anything to do with this exception you're making for Naruto? Kakashi asked out of curiosity. The Hokage shook his head, not entirely, if Naruto was ineffective as a ninja I wouldn't allow him to pass. Kakashi some would refer to yourself, Sasuke and I as prodigies due to our ability to learn almost anything. But people like the first Hokage, Hanzo the Salamander, and Naruto fall into a category I like to call naturally skilled ninja. No one truly taught them, yet they are powerful ninja for one unknown reason or another. Despite Naruto's massive chakra stores, his chakra control rivals that of a medic nin. On top of that his natural athleticism has been the bane of most of my anbu and neither I nor Kuranai have been able to find a single genjutsu that he couldn't break out of in a matter of seconds. Many of the janins looked towards the genjutsu mistress only to receive a nod in affirmation. Naruto is too gifted to simply live a civilian life, and I won't let his talent go to waste when he wants to pursue a career as a ninja. So I'll ask you again. What is your verdict for Team 7? Kakashi closed his lone eye as he thought over all he had been told. Sir you do realize that if I did pass my students that they wouldn't work together. Hiruzen shook his head. The question isn't whether Naruto will work with Sasuke and Sakura. He proved that he could set aside his feelings today. The real question is if Sasuke and Sakura will work with Naruto. Kakashi let out of sigh as he agreed that was the situation. Maybe if I have them work on a lot of team building exercises they will get along. Team 7 passes. That's good to hear Kakashi. Everyone is now dismissed. The Hokage said as he planned to get to work on finishing the paperwork he was falling behind on. Every Janin except Kakashi left. Seeing this, the Hokage gave Kakashi a questioning look. Is there anything else I can help you with? Kakashi nodded his head. Has Naruto always been so talented? And if so why hadn't he graduated earlier like Itachi? The Hokage pulled out a pipe and lit it before answering. Naruto's life has been hard enough with his burden. I wanted him to enjoy his childhood. We all know the various horrors that ninja risk facing, no reason to throw him into that life so soon. Satisfied with the answer he was given, Kakashi left. Naruto opened his door and immediately headed for his fridge. Once opened he pulled out a carrot before his mask receded and he chomped down on the orange vegetable. As much as he loved ramen, Naruto didn't get his muscular and healthy body from just eating mass amounts of noodles and broth. The only thing that the symbiote ever did that bothered Naruto was to alter his taste buds and give him cravings for other foods. When the symbiote saw that Naruto wasn't getting enough of one protein or vitamin, then it would give Naruto a craving for something that held what he lacked. One time Naruto found himself drawn to the Yamanaka's flower shop by some scent that him made unconsciously lick his lips and ended up buying a dozen flowers he never had of only to go home and eat the petals. A knock at his door alerted Naruto to a possible visitor, or someone too dumb for their own good. Silently making his way to the door, Naruto ignored the second set of knocks as he wanted to ensure that the person on the other side of the door couldn't detect him. It wouldn't be the first time someone had tried to attack him at home as his new attitude had garnered much negative attention. His door didn't have a peephole, so instead he sent small thread of his symbiote to squeeze in between the keyhole of his door while he readied his fist to punch through the door and knock out the possible fool. Without leaving the shadow of the keyhole, the symbiote saw everything that existed on the other side of the door. Once his symbiote confirmed that the person was an anbu, Naruto retracted his thread of symbiote and have it reaffix his mask before opening the door. Sorry for the wait, we were busy. Naruto said the Anbu gave a nod. It's okay. The Hokage just wanted you to be informed that you and your team are now officially Genin of Konoha. 
he would also like for you to stop by his office tomorrow so that you can have your picture taken for your license. Thank you and tell the Hokage that we will see him tomorrow, said Naruto. You should be proud Uzumaki, the Hokage thinks very highly of you. Naruto smiled before closing the door. Naruto let out a sigh as he and his team walked dogs through the street for rich elderly women. This was his so-called mission. This wasn't the only mission he and his team completed as they had also pulled weeds, clean up trash, and chase a cat that had every right to run from its owner, among various other chores. How these things actually took military manpower, Naruto nor his symbiote would never know, but they were sure of one thing. This team was doomed. After Team 7 became official Kakashi went back to running three hours late and the animosity between the genin hadn't changed. Naruto still hated Sasuke. Sasuke still had the delusion that Naruto was weaker than him and would only slow him down, and Sakura still made futile attempts to date Sasuke. Kakashi had given them many team-building exercises, but this had solved nothing except giving each member a good understanding on how the others fought. While Naruto would admit that it did help to know a little more about Sakura's habits when she fought, he had already known plenty about how Sasuke fought. Sasuke was the type of fighting that made others dance to his tune. If Sasuke took a step forward, then he expected you to step back, if he took a step back, then you took a step forward. If he lowered his guard on his left side, he expected you to strike his unguarded side so he could easily deflect the predicted attack and counterattack your now unguarded area. Not that it helped him against us, Naruto thought as he chuckled, causing his teammates to give him odd looks. Back when they fought in the academy, Naruto destroyed Sasuke's prideful style with brute force and ferocious speed. Sasuke had tried a feint on Naruto before only to receive one in return. When Sasuke's real attack missed, Naruto followed up with a lariat. Sasuke had been just able to put up a guard, but with the momentum of his speed combined with his strength, Naruto's attack had caused Sasuke to backflip, landing hard on hard on his abdomen first with the rest of his body following. Despite the pain he felt, Sasuke had been able to continue fighting after that, but he had learned that when it came to Naruto, blocking was next to useless. One of Naruto's dogs tried to chase after a cat and nearly caught it when a a r r r k k k a strong yank of his leash solved that problem. Was that really called for? Kakashi asked, clearly not liking the act. Naruto shook his head. It's a dog Kakashi. Show it who's boss and it will obey, let it do as it please and, well. Kakashi followed Naruto's line of sight to find Sakura having trouble with her dogs as they tried to split up into different directions. Still, your dog made an awfully loud yelp. I would prefer it if the owner doesn't find out. Kakashi stated in a bored tone. One of Sasuke's dogs attempted to split off from the group and Sasuke tried to mimic Naruto's action, or at least he tried. Sasuke did succeed in keeping his dog from leaving the pact, but lacked the strength to yank it back into the group. Instead his dog stood on his hind legs as its body weight leaned forward while it let out a troubled breathe thanks to the collar digging into its throat. Naruto didn't miss the look of anger on Sasuke's face and didn't even bother hiding his awareness as he let out a laugh. Students please don't manhandle the client's dogs, Kakashi said in a bored yet ordering manner. Sasuke simply grunted in response and Naruto ignored Kakashi as he slowed his pace in order for him to fall back with Sakura. With one hand he took hold of her leashes and with the other, gave her the leashes to his now obedient dogs. Sakura nodded as they traded off dogs. Thanks Naruto, she said as Naruto began getting the dogs under control much to the dismay of Kakashi as several yelps could be heard. Over the last few weeks, Sakura discovered that Naruto wasn't such a bad guy, as he would offer her help whenever she needed and usually didn't act like an ass if she didn't do something to upset him first. She still thought that he could be scary and didn't approve when he badmouthed Sasuke or worse. Despite seeing Naruto in a new color, Sakura still saw Sasuke as a diamond compared to all other boys their age. There had been several times that she had tried to defend Sasuke by implying that Naruto was just jealous of Sasuke or trying to act cool. Something that Naruto just laughed off which had slowly caused Sakura to decrease the number of rants she made. Turning one last corner and walking an additional block, the three genin and their sensei stopped in front of a gated yard that surrounded a luxurious two-story house. Walking through the gate, each genin unclipped their leashes from each dog's collar before dropping off the leashes and heading back to the Hokage Tower. 
Naruto along with his fellow genin and sensei stood in front of the Hokage's desk giving their reports. As if walking dogs requires a report, Naruto thought. And preparing to get another mission, sure. Well Kakashi it seems your team has done well to finish their previous mission. Any chance they're up for another D rank mission today? For a second the Hokage and Kakashi looked towards Naruto, both wondering if he would object to yet another D rank mission. Naruto for his part was thinking about doing such a thing. Only thing that stopped him from making their thoughts reality was a question he asked himself. Even if we bug him for a C rank, will we get something exciting or boring? Naruto thought back and forth between the possibilities and the differences. Sure it would be nice to get out of Konoha for a C rank mission, but what if all he ended up doing was escorting some paranoid merchant? That would be four or five days of him just walking on civilian roads. Hell we could do that here. Despite his inner thoughts Naruto still wondered about the possibility of going on a nice action-packed trip. Hey old man, got any C ranks lying around? The old Hokage smiled while a few others gave him glares for his lack of respect. Naruto, I'm sorry to tell you, but your team isn't ready for a C rank. The razor sharp teeth on Naruto mask seemed to form into a feral grin as Naruto caught the fact that the Hokage told him that his team wasn't ready, instead of saying that he wasn't ready. We know. We're just curious of if there are any available and what their objectives are. Kakashi gave Naruto a questioning look. Why do you want to see them if you know we can't take the mission? Naruto shrugged his shoulders before replying. We just want to see what's in store for us when we are allowed to take such missions. The Hokage chuckled as he knew there was more to it than what Naruto said. Picking up a scroll that he had yet to file, the Hokage handed it to Naruto. Naruto opened it, scanning through the mission objectives and locations involved. Hmm, seems like an escort mission, bridge builder from Wave. Looks like an old drunk, huh, if he traveled all the way here in one piece then he can travel all the way back just as well. Just as we thought, paranoid old fool, or ease lyi, no no we're overthinking things. Rolling up the scroll and handing it back, Naruto took his place next to his team. Both the Hokage and Kakashi stared at Naruto a second, waiting to see if he would make any demands. To their surprise he stayed silent. So Kakashi, do you think your team is able to take on another mission? The Hokage asked. Kakashi shrugged his shoulders and was given another D rank for his team to complete. A week later Naruto dashed through the village and towards the Hokage tower, leaping and bouncing from building to building. Why was he in such a hurry? Well that was thanks to an Anbu informing him that his presence was immediately required in the Hokage office. While Naruto acted out a lot and didn't play by others rules, he knew that when an Anbu was sent to retrieve you, fun time was over. He respected the old cage too much to gripe about being woken up so early, and was truly interested in what was so urgent. Arriving at the tower, Naruto chose to climb up the wall and use his usual exit instead of simply walking through the front door. As far as he was concerned it was faster and less of a hassle. Reaching the window, he opened it with his usual trick and flipped himself in. Once inside he saw that his other two teammates were already there and much to his surprise, his sensei as well. Ha ha ha, guess he knows not to rock the boat when it comes to the old man. Kakashi merely gave Naruto a puzzled look as he watched him enter via window. Though Kakashi wanted to comment on it, he knew that the Hokage was in no mood. Guess the Hokage's favorites are allowed to enter through the window. Once Naruto was standing next to his team the Hokage spoke. I'm sorry for waking you up at this time, but I'm in need of Team 7's services. Three days ago I sent Team 10 out on a C rank mission because I believe that they have built a reasonable amount of teamwork. I got a letter today informing me that their client lied when he filled out his request forms and that Team 10 had been ambushed by two missing nins, the Demon Brothers. The client is currently being hunted by a man known as Gato, a man who has a large wealth and is hiring missing nin to kill our client. This mission has been increased to an A rank now and Team 10 needs reinforcements, which is why I've called you here. Before Kakashi could even add in his two cents, Naruto jumped in. We'll accept. He stated excited. Now hold on Naruto. Kakashi ordered before turning to the Hokage. I don't mean to question your thoughts, but why not order team 10 back and send more qualified ninja to complete this mission? The Hokage nodded at this question. I understand your concerns Kakashi, but I believe that team 10 and team 7 combined will be enough to complete this mission. 
I also believe that this will act as a good experience for both teams. Besides it's not like I'm only sending the genins out, you and Asuma will be with them as well. Once again Naruto decided to speak for his team, like we said earlier, we accept. The Hokage looked towards Kakashi and the rest of Team 7. Sasuke looked slightly happy, or was he smug? The Hokage couldn't tell. Sakura looked unsure and unhappy from the reactions of her two teammates. Kakashi just shook his head. I guess Team 7 will head out and assist Team 10. All right, everyone meet at the gates in two hours. Be sure to pack supplies. Good answer, Cyclops. We'd have made your life miserable if you denied us this chance, Naruto said before leaping out the window he came in. The Hokage couldn't help but chuckle at Kakashi's expense as said John inside before leaving via leaf body flicker while his other two students took the door. Three days later, upon arriving in Wave, Team 7 could just smell the despair that emanated from the water surrounded village. But for Naruto none of this mattered as he was bothered by the fact that the mission he discarded turned out to be the adventure he wanted. Making their way though town, it didn't take them long to arrive at the client's house, once there they met their client, Tazuna. Just as Naruto believed, the man was an alcoholic as his breathe reeked of sake. Naruto easily ignored this while his team made their way to a guest room, only to discover that Asuma was bedridden. Both Ino and Choji immediately seemed relieved when they saw their much needed support. Surprisingly, Ino didn't pounce on Sasuke as she normally would and instead stayed by her sensei's side. Seeing as the original leader was down, Kakashi decided to take charge and investigate. What happened to Asuma, and where's your third member? Ino decided to be the one that explained for her team, while Choji didn't seem to have the confidence to talk at the moment. Shikamaru is outside keeping watch and Asuma. She paused for a moment. Asuma got injured when fighting a missing nin. I don't remember his name, Asuma sensei kind of mumbled it. Choji decided to put his two cents in. Asuma sensei said his name was Zabuza. Kakashi's lone eye widened. You mean Zabuza Momochi? Choji merely nodded his head in response. Looking over Asuma, Kakashi didn't doubt Ino and Choji's claim. Asuma had many blood soaked bandages wrapped around what Kakashi could only guess were lacerations. Ino, I need you to give me a detailed report of the fight, said Kakashi. Giving an affirmative nod, Ino began explaining how they crossed over by boat and were attacked by Zabuza shortly afterwards. The fight had gone good for Asuma at the beginning, but a slip up landed him trapped in a water prison. Luckily, Team 10 had been able to free Asuma. Unfortunately Zabuza had been able to land a few slashes and Asuma had started to lose thanks to a mixture of fatigue and blood lost. At the end Asuma had been able to turn things around using one of his wind jutsu and had slammed Zabuza across a few trees, knocking him out. But before Asuma could give Zabuza the finishing blow, Akiri hunter Nin beat him to the punch with a few senbon needles to the neck and afterwards carried Zabuza's body away. Naruto couldn't help but get excited at the tale yet sad at the thought that most likely, there wouldn't be any more missing nins to take on after Zabuza. Once Ino finished telling him what he needed to know Kakashi decided to speak again. Thank you Ino. I have a feeling that things won't settle down yet, but I want to talk to Asuma before I start jumping to conclusions. Naruto I want you to go and keep watch with Shikamaru. In a couple of hours, I'll send two others to replace you. Naruto simply nodded before exiting the house, two days later. All members of Team 10 and 7 were crowded in one of the spare bedroom of Tazuna's house. Asuma had just woken up and Kakashi was confirming what he already thought. So you also believe that Hunter Nin was just Zabaza's partner, said Kakashi. Asuma nodded before putting a cigarette in his mouth and lighting it. Unfortunately that not only means that Zabaza's alive, but that he has back up, an unknown. Naruto who was using his chakra to stick his feet against the wall while leaning his back against it as well in some strange form of sitting, couldn't help but smile. We may have our chance yet. Choji chewed on chips as he responded. Munch munch, I don't see what the problem is. Munch munch, now that Kakashi is here, munch, there are two Jonans here. Munch. Asuma shook his head. We only have one Jonan capable of fighting. I'm not sure if my wounds will heal before Zabuza reappears and we don't know how strong this unknown partner is. For all we know, he could be as powerful as Zabuza. Ino was the first to ask the well-known question, then what are we going to do? It's not like we can actually fight someone of Zabuza's level? 
Kakashi chose now to intervene. Well first we're going to start you off with some training. You might not be able to take on a Janin, at least not alone. But with a little training and if the six of you work together, you should be able to at least fend off one. Half of the Genins seemed worried while the other half held different emotions. Naruto and Sasuke were excited. Sasuke was looking forward to proving himself while Naruto simply looked forward to the challenge. Shikamaru was among those that weren't nervous, though his emotion was simply a lack of care. Kakashi looked at Naruto, and how he was sticking to the wall. Well Naruto seeing as you're such a master of what I want the others to train on, why don't you explain how it's done? Naruto gave a confused look towards Kakashi. What do you want us to explain Cyclops? How do you expect us to explain something when you don't tell us what you want us to explain? Kakashi let out a sigh before giving the genins a sign to follow. He took them outside of the house and a few feet into the forest before stopping. Okay Naruto, what I want you to explain is how to do the tree walking exercise. Once again Naruto gave a confused look, the what? Kakashi wanted to slap his own face before he responded. The way you cling to surfaces, that is typically known as chakra clinging, or thanks to the fact that most start off by climbing up trees, the tree climbing exercise. Ooh, was Naruto's response while he laughed internally. He understood full well what Kakashi was asking him earlier, but Kakashi seemed to have a liking towards being cryptic. Naruto enjoyed frustrating the Janin by acting naive thus forcing the Janin to explain in detail what he was telling or asking them. Walking towards the tree, Naruto easily walked up the tree at a slow pace. In order for you to cling to surfaces you need to focus a certain amount of chakra to your feet to ensure you stick. Too much and you repel yourself from the surface, too little and you won't stick, at least not very long. Kakashi nodded at Naruto's explanation. Very good, also as you begin you might want to get a running start. With that said Kakashi threw a kanai in front of five trees. Mark the tree at each attempt. This way you can keep track on how far you've reached. Naruto, I'll go watch over Tazuna to today. Watch over their progress, and help them if they need it. Naruto gave a mock salute as Kakashi left. Looking back at the others Naruto gave a questioning look. So what are you guys waiting on, a starting bell? As if he actually rung it. The five began running up the tree, well four ran up their tree while Shikamaru decided to take it slow. Oddly enough it was Sakura who made it the farthest, with Ino only a few steps behind her. Choji and Sasuke had gone up a tenth of their tree before having to jump off due to lack of control. While Shikamaru had yet to leap off his tree, he was going at a snail's pace. Looks like Shikamaru's got the right mindset, Naruto whispered to himself. Redirecting his attention to the two girls, Naruto saw that they had yet to retry. Sakura, Ino, what are you doing sitting around? We've already proven we have great chakra control, we don't have to do this training. Said Sakura with Ino giving a supporting, yeah. Naruto shook his head at this. Keep repeating the exercise, it'll be good for you. Ino looked unconvinced. How many times do we have to do it? Over and over and over again till we say stop. Sasuke who was trying to focus on climbing his tree decided to put in his two cents. And what are you going to do while we're doing this, idiot? Naruto's chuckle caused Sakura to freeze as she feared the worst for Sasuke. She let out a breathe she didn't know she was holding when Naruto spoke instead of beginning to tear into Sasuke. Ooh it's not what we're going to do that should be the question, Naruto said as he reached for his back pocket. The real question is what's Kakashi sensei going to do? Both Sasuke and Sakura immediately stopped as Naruto held the all familiar book that Kakashi was constantly reading. Naruto, you didn't! Sakura yelled. Ino, Choji, and Shikamaru all gave confused looks to each other before dismissing the occurrence and decided to go back to their training. Naruto opened the book and began reading. I've always wondered what these little orange books hold. I mean, even the old man has a few of them stashed away. Sasuke returned to his training with renewed vigor, the thought of Naruto actually being able to pickpocket a janin infuriated him. Sakura just shook her head as the action was only typical of Naruto. Nearly 30 minutes later, Naruto took his attention off the book and checked how the five were doing. While they all were beginning to sweat, Naruto was sure there was another way to make things interesting. Looking between the current page he was on and his teammates, a wicked grin spread across his face. Satoru's hands glided across Kari's flesh, 
brushing across her erect pink tit and giving her a firm squeeze. A honey-filled moan was released as a reward from Carrie as she enjoyed the feel of his rough, calloused hands. The effect was immediate. Eno who was taking a break turned beat red while Sakura nearly fell off the limb she was standing on. Shikamaru was forced to finally fall from his tree. A nose bleed as his undoing. Sasuke slipped and ended up slamming his face into the dirt and Choji, who was running towards his tree, ended up fumbling forward till he slammed his face into his tree. Once they all recovered, they looked towards Naruto. Shikamaru, Ino, and Sakura were too shocked and embarrassed to do more than gawk. Sasuke and Choji on the other hand had enough pain on their face to allow them to send heated glares toward Naruto. Naruto for his part was too caught up laughing his ass off to care. Tazuna entered his house with Kakashi following him. The second Kakashi entered the dining area he felt two sets of eyes, giving him all the female fury they could. Kakashi gave a dulled look in return. Griat. First I've lost my book, and now I have to deal with two teenage girls. What else can go wrong? Taking his place at the table, Kakashi looked around to notice that aside from Tazuna, his daughter Tsunami, and her son, that Asuma had joined them as well with the aid of some crutches. Another thing he noticed was that Naruto seemed to be in a rather good mood. So Naruto how did their training go? The seemingly innocent question seemed to cause a mixture of reactions from the genins, though embarrassment seemed to be the more common feeling. Naruto's chuckle didn't bode well to Kakashi. Okay Naruto what did you do? Don't worry sensei, we believe they did well. Though I'd have to say I'm more proud of our team bonding than anything else. Kakashi's lone eyebrow rose. Team bonding? Naruto's chuckle began turning into a snicker. Yeah. We decided to read them a story to help us bond. Oh a story. That's not so oh dear god that's my book. Naruto pulled out the orange book and brandished it in front of Kakashi. We decided to read them a story from your book. Hope you don't mind. Asuma fell back laughing. Oh god, I knew something was up I just cool. He stopped laughing and wrapped his arm around his torso in a pained expression. Ow h h, my stitches, he said between locks. Three days later Kakashi and Asuma watched over their students except for Naruto who was sent to guard Tazuna as he worked on building his bridge. At the moment the two were discussing their teams. Asuma had just finished talking about his team and the plans he had for them. So Kakashi, how do you believe your team is doing? Kakashi gave a sigh. My team is doing okay, I guess. I just have concerns over Naruto and Sasuke. Asuma pulled a cigarette and lit it. Well you knew those two didn't get along. Well yeah, but not to this extent. I tried forming a rivalry between them once. And let me guess. Naruto blew that plan up. Asuma interrupted. Kakashi nodded. Yeah, how did you know? Kuranai told me a bit of what she learned about Naruto from when she was experimenting Genjutsu on him. Naruto doesn't believe in rivalries. The person before you is either a friend or foe, no in-betweens. So what do I do? The team suffers so long as Sasuke and Naruto hate each other. I've tried several team work exercises, tried rivalries, and have even tried getting them to understand each other. Kakashi stated. Asuma rolled the cigarette in his mouth. Maybe you're just approaching things wrong. You've been trying to get both to get along. Maybe you just need to have one of them understood the other or something. Naruto isn't really an ass, he just doesn't let anyone push him around or get way with insulting him. Asuma took a drag off his cigarette before continuing. Sasuke believes that being an Uchiha makes him superior. If you can get him to realize that, at the very least, Naruto is his equal. Maybe he will stop trying to treat Naruto like dirt. And then maybe Naruto won't treat him like a punching bag. Kakashi took a moment to think over what he'd been told. You really think that'll work? Nope. Was Asuma's simple reply, Kakashi giving an annoyed look in response. Well thanks for the help, Kakashi said sarcastically. Asuma shook his head. Your best bet is that Naruto gets bumped up to Chunin. That won't stop them from being on the same team, Kakashi stated. No, but it will get Naruto away from the team, or at least Sasuke every now and then. A nod from Kakashi showed he agreed. While Kakashi and Asuma continued their conversation, Sakura and Ino began conversing about the blonde teen as well. Geez Sakura, Naruto hasn't changed at all since the academy. He's either being an ass or annoying, Ino stated. 
Sakura shook her head and she began running up her tree again. He can be annoying every now and then, but he usually isn't an ass. You kind of got to provoke it from him. I mean when has he snapped at us or been mean to us during our entire trip? Ino shrugged her shoulders. Well he hasn't been an ass, but I still can't believe he read that book out loud while we were training. Sakura blushed as she remembered the occasion. Well luckily he's guarding Tazuna today, so we won't have to worry. Thank God for that. Ino thought. It could have been a lot worse. Shikamaru added, deciding against his nature to get involved in the conversation. How so? Ino asked. Sakura and Choji decided to listen in as well. He could have replaced the character's name and description with ours. Truth be told I'm surprised he didn't. Both Ino and Sakura paled at the thought, though Ino sported a slight blush as she thought of her name replacing Kari's and Sasuke's replacing Satoru's. Each genin got the thought out of their minds and went back to their training. Soon afterwards Kakashi began approaching them. Alright I think that's enough for today. Naruto and Tazuna should be returning to the house any second. Three days later Naruto slept on a black hammock out in the woods as his light breathes were the only real sound. His hammock took on a spider web-like pattern and if one were to look close enough, they would see that Naruto's sleeping arrangement was slightly melded to his back. Why was he sleeping out in the woods? There was a rather simple answer for that, he didn't want to commit murder. Tsunami's son had one day criticized the ninjas at the table, telling them how stupid they are for going up against Gato and how they were going to die. He further went on to say how none of them knew anything about suffering and pain when Sasuke boasted on how Gato's men had never fought ninja before. Naruto had been livid upon hearing the boy's pessimistic whining and ended up leaving in order to vent his rage. Despite having a bad temper, Naruto knew that ripping the boy in half wouldn't solve anything and instead chose to take his anger out on a few trees. But ever since then Naruto chose to only be around the house for food or seeing what the Janins had planned and nothing else. His eyes fluttered open as he began to stretch and wake. Sitting up, he rubbed his eyes before standing. As he stood, the hammock slowly began to meld into his clothes till they were back to their original state. Guess I should head back to Tazuna's house and find out what we're doing today, were Naruto's thoughts before making his way back. As he walked he began to pick up weird signs through the woods. At first he ignored the slash marks on the trees, but when he noticed how numerous they were he began to grow curious. A close look at the ground showed two sets of tracks and he couldn't help but dislike the fact that they were going in the same direction he intended. It was when the smell of blood hit his nose that he began running forward. Before long his run turned into a sprint and then into leaps. Jumping off one tree, he looked down at the carcass of a boar. Open wounds riddled the animal's body and a touch of it told Naruto it hadn't died long ago. Looking forward Naruto saw more tracks and decided to follow them. Just because he found one source of blood didn't mean he wouldn't find another. And if he could help it, he would prevent the spilling of innocent blood. Asuma Serutobi had heard the ruckus downstairs almost immediately. The sudden rise of his body caused pain to shot through him and remind him of his condition. Despite that he tried to get up and make his way downstairs. Making his way around the hall, he began to hear voices as whoever was invading the house felt confident that they would succeed in whatever they were doing. Suddenly Asuma was reminded of the owners of the house as he heard Tsunami beg whoever was intruding. He quickened his pace, hoping to protect both Tsunami and her son. Unfortunately his haste had caused him to trip. The sound he made alerted the two goons and Asuma cursed as he heard one of them making their way towards him. Maybe this is for the best, Asuma thought as he grabbed one of his trench knives. He prepared himself as the footsteps got louder and readied his hand to strike. His opportunity never came as the two intruders turned their attention to something else. A fight broke out between a newcomer and thugs. Whoever the person was, he took out the two brutally but quick. The sounds of hard, powerful hits echoed towards Asuma and the obvious sound of a neck snapping was the last he heard before silence filled the house. It almost seemed that the fight was over as quick as it started and Asuma decided to make his way to the living room. Once there he saw two dead bodies near the center while Tsunami and her son were huddled in a corner. What happened? Asuma asked. After giving her son an assuring whisper she turned to Asuma. Those guys came, hired thugs of Gato, and Naruto killed them. Asuma thanked her before going over and checking the two corpses. Just as he thought, one of them had been killed via broken neck but the other had died from internal bleeding. 
Further study revealed an already showing bruise over the man's temple and a sideways footprint sunk into the man's chest. If Asuma had to guess, he'd say that Naruto had punched the man over the head to stun him before kicking the man's chest in, crushing his rib cage while simultaneously causing the new broken bones to rip and tear the flesh around them. A little brutal for a ninja, but efficient none the least. Tazuna's unfinished bridge was covered in a thick fog and the sound of fighting could be heard. Sakura stood in front of Tazuna as his only guard while the rest of her team and partners fought. Zabuza, who was wearing a sleeveless blue shirt along with urban camo pants fought with a giant sword that stood nearly as tall as himself against Kakashi. The masked Konoha Nin had raised his headband to reveal a healthy mature sharing on eye. While Kakashi and Zabuza fought, Team 10 stood outside of an ice dome. The trio watched as Sasuke tried to fight Zabuza's partner, only to be pelted by Senbon. Entering the dome was suicide while nothing they did on the outside seemed to harm the dome. It was this scene that Naruto arrived to as he flipped over the railing of the bridge. The three standing on the outside jumped back and only let go of their tension when they recognized Naruto. What's going on here? Naruto asked. Shikamaru decided to speak for his group. Troublesome blonde. Sasuke got himself trapped in there. We've tried to help him, but there doesn't seem to be anything we can do. Breaking this ice seems near impossible and the enemy is too fast for us to do anything. Naruto looked inside the dome just in time to see a flurry of blurs rush from one mirror to the next while Sasuke received a few more senbon into his skin, a fact that caused Ino to gasp. Walking over to the ice dome, Naruto punched one of the many ice mirrors that acted as its wall. Yeah, things solid as they come, Naruto said as he pulled his hand back only to reveal a few small cracks repairing themselves. If we can get Sasuke out of there can you get him medical attention? Naruto asked. Shikamaru shrugged his shoulders. We can at least pull the needles out, but how are you going to? After Naruto heard what he needed to, he jumped in between two of the mirrors. The emergence of the new presence shocked the enemy Nin and Sasuke. This shock was all Naruto needed in order to land next to Sasuke and throw him unceremoniously out of the ice dome in one fluid motion. That was very noble of you but now you're trapped in here. Naruto looked at the enemy Nin or at least one of the many reflections of him. His enemy wore his black hair in a white bun except for two bangs that framed his face and wore a brown turtleneck under a short green kimono with white trimming, tied off with a greenish brown obi. A pair of loose pants that matched the color of his turtleneck along with a pair of sandals made up the lower portion of his body. The only other features that Naruto took note of was the green finger nail polish and the hunter nin mask his enemy wore. Noble? Anything we do concerning Sasuke can be considered noble. To him, a saving his life is nothing but a spit on his face. As far as being trapped is concerned, we don't believe in such a thing. Naruto didn't see the raised eyebrow on his enemy's face, we? It's how we refer to ourselves, now how should we refer to you? The enemy Nin stayed silent for a moment before replying. Call me Haku, and how should I refer to you all? Naruto chuckled at how Haku asked his question, we're Naruto. As soon as that was said, Naruto jumped to the side and immediately flipped forward. Senbon embedded the ground where Naruto once was as he flipped from one spot to the next. Team 10 watched Naruto as he used his acrobatic skills to dodge the projectiles. They couldn't help but be amazed by the sight. Ino who was pulling the senbon from Sasuke's body nearly froze in her work from the site. Sasuke only glared as once again he gave witness to being outdone by the blonde. Suddenly the barrage of needles stopped and Naruto stood in the center. Impressive, you're certainly quick on your feet. I wonder how long your fancy flips will save you before I hit my mark, said Haku. The same can be said for this jutsu of yours, Naruto stated. What no one knew was that Naruto had been tried to hit Haku using his leg like an axe kick during his flips. Unfortunately he had yet to land a hit. Once again blurs filled the dome and hails of Senbon rained down forcing Naruto to stay moving. Naruto's fighter instincts kicked in and he began to notice certain things that people outside of the dome might not take notice of. Like how despite the constant rain of Senbon only a handful was thrown at a time or how Haku's blurred movements never crossed the center of the dome and instead went from one mirror to the diagonally closest. A thought hit Naruto as he continued studying his opponent. He's not as fast as everyone thinks he is, 
He only appears that way with how fast he's moving between mirrors. Another thing Naruto began to notice was the slight bits of water dripping down the mirrors. Just as he was beginning to question this, Haku stopped once again. Tell me, what do you fight for? Haku asked. Why give us these breaks? Naruto thought. An odd question. I guess we fight for what we believe is right. Why do you fight? Haku shook his head. You're in the wrong business then. As for your question, I fight for the one person who has given my life meaning. Naruto could care less about Haku's reason to fight. His question was merely a means to buy time. That's it. These breaks and small conversations he starts with us are merely to buy time. But for what? Naruto thought. His mind went back to the small drops of water forming on the ice mirrors and he looked at them now only to see frost upon the mirrors. His mind began filling in the spots and soon after he finally understood Haku's jutsu. Haku leapt from his mirror once again and Naruto went on the move once more except at a slower pace. He wanted his opponent to think he was beginning to slow down and allowing a few senbon to pierce him was an added bonus to aid in his deceit. Naruto used his lesser speed to allow him to monitor Haku's movements more closely and waited for the perfect time to strike. A blur clearer than usual of Haku came into his vision and Naruto didn't waste any time in throwing his fist forward while unleashing a small tendril of his symbiote. Haku had been struck by the sticky substance and in turn retaliated with a handful of senbon. Naruto didn't even attempt to dodge them and instead used Haku's momentum against him and swung his tendril sideways guiding Haku straight into the ground. Before Haku could even react, he felt himself sent airborne towards Naruto, thanks to the still-connected tendril and set back towards the ground from a strong right hook. Haku didn't allow himself to stay dazed for long and tried to get into one of his mirrors when he discovered that Naruto's black tendril was no longer attached to himself. Unfortunately for him, Naruto attached yet another tendril and yanked up on it to send him airborne. While his opponent was no longer touching the ground Naruto pulled his tendril over his shoulder and down. This act sent Haku crashing into the ground once more and before he could even get to his feet, an uppercut from Naruto sent him flying once more. A quick turn from Haku revealed that he was heading towards one of his mirror. A little hope filled him as he prepared to sink back into his protective ice. But things didn't turn out as Haku wanted, for as soon as he entered his mirror, Naruto's fist crashed through one end and sent Haku out the other. Haku rolled several times against the harsh ground and his mask broke apart from the abuse Naruto put upon it. Naruto stopped in front of Haku's laying body. How did you break through my ice mirror? Haku's asked in a defeated tone. Naruto allowed a smile of pride to grace his face, though his mask blocked most of it. You have to be inside your mirrors in order to pump chakra into them, so they are sustained. It was the reason you would take breaks in between volleys. You would talk to us in order to distract us from the water that was formed from your ice melting. After discovering this it was rather easy to find out that your jutsu would weaken if you had been forced away from them long enough. Just as Naruto finished talking, Haku's other ice mirrors broke apart and fell to the ground and melted. I see, Haku said, then I've become a useless tool. Naruto used both of his hands to grab Haku's collar and pulled him up so that they were looking each other in the eyes. Tool. What do you mean? Naruto questioned Haku didn't seem bothered by Naruto's action. I am Zabaza's tool, for he gave me purpose. And a tool that does not serve its purpose becomes useless. Naruto's look told Haku that he still didn't understand, so he decided to tell Naruto his tale. Haku told Naruto how he defended himself from his father and how the results turned him into his father's murderer. How Zabuza found him a year or so later when he was homeless and how the man took him in and gave him a purpose. Naruto stood and allowed Haku to tell his tale, listening to every detail and so forth. He understood how it felt to be feared for something you have no control of. The feeling of being alone and having to fend for yourself. Had the symbiote not bonded to him, Naruto couldn't help but realize that Haku's life could have been his own. Some powerful ninja, finding him and deciding to manipulate him for his or her own agenda. It would have been far too easy. Despite all this Naruto understood another fact, that he and Haku were enemies at the moment and no amount of pity would change that. But it did change how Naruto would handle the situation. You've had a tough life, we can sympathize with you. We can't just let you go, but we won't kill you. With that said Naruto reared his head back and slammed it onto Haku's. The impact caused Haku's eyes to roll back into his head, successfully knocking him out, 
Afterwards Naruto wrapped a tendril of his symbiote around Haku multiple times until he was sure he couldn't break out of it. As a finishing touch, he sent two more pieces of his symbiote to splatter around Haku's hands to ensure he couldn't cast a jutsu. So long as Naruto kept contact with the bindings, they wouldn't disintegrate. It was at this time that the fog lifted and revealed a victorious Kakashi standing over a dead Zabuza. Team 10 and Sakura spirits rose as they could clearly see Kakashi and Naruto, but they weren't allowed much rest when a short man accompanied by nearly a hundred hired thugs showed up. Naruto and the others began packing their stuff as they prepared to leave, also making sure that his prisoner, guest was still tied up. Haku simply fixed Naruto with a blank stare while this was happening. The man that showed up after the fight on the bridge was none other than Gato. Feeling confident that Zabuza and Haku had weakened the Konoha Nin enough so that lowly mercenaries could kill them, Gato decided to appear in person and watch. A fatal mistake, especially when he tried to make an exchange to Naruto for Haku. Naruto's only response was to tell the man to come over here and try, you little bastard, followed by flipping him off. Afterwards Gato ordered his thugs to kill them only to find that while the Konoha Nins were outnumbered, they were not outclassed. Kakashi, while tired had still been able to fight and Sasuke had recovered enough to help. Team 10 had yet to see any real action and had also joined the fight in a fresh state. Naruto would admit that his fight against Haku had not been easy, but wouldn't say he was anywhere near being tired. Surprisingly despite the number of men, it hadn't taken long for the nins to take out over half of them and scaring away the rest. Before Gato could attempt to leave, Naruto had cut the man off while still holding onto Haku. The small man had whimpered and begged for mercy only to receive Naruto's twisted form of it. Setting Haku aside Naruto easily picked up the small man and knelt so that one of his knees faced towards the sky before slamming the man down onto it. Gato's back connected with Naruto's knee and a multitude of sickening cracks rang out, much to many of the genin's horror and slight nausea. Kakashi walked upstairs in order to check on Naruto. Opening the door, Kakashi instantly felt the glare Haku gave him but ignored it. Naruto had told Haku all about what happened after his defeat. While Haku showed no emotion most of the time, Kakashi's presence evoked such hate that it almost rivaled Naruto's hate for Sasuke. You about ready Naruto? Naruto nodded before picking up his travel pack and hoisting Haku's still bonded body over his shoulder. Once that was done he joined his fellow ninja outside the house before they left towards Konoha. Asuma was still reliant on a crutch to walk around though that would change once they returned to Konoha and had a good medic heal him up properly. While they walked Naruto felt some of his team members staring at him. He turned his head to find that it was Sasuke, Kakashi and Shikamaru who were looking at him. What? Sasuke turned his head away and grunted while Kakashi decided to ask a question. What do you plan to do with your prisoner and what is that stuff you've restrained him with? Naruto nodded his head as he thought these were legitimate questions. We plan to get him help, and the stuff around him is something we created. Kakashi waited for Naruto to add on and gave him a bored look when Naruto didn't. Instead of pressing on he dropped the subject as past incidents revealed to him that Naruto wouldn't reveal what he didn't want to. Naruto gave Shikamaru a questioning look and the lazy nin looked away after saying, troublesome. Once Naruto no longer felt the stares, he concentrated on moving forward, and questioning himself of how he was going to make his request to the Hokage. It had been nearly a month since the events of Wave and Naruto made his way to the psychiatric ward of the hospital. Haku was in room 142 and Naruto was making his weekly visit. When team 7 and team 10 returned after their rank mission, Naruto waited till only he and the Hokage were the ones in the room when he made his request. It was a simple request. Give Haku therapy so that hopefully he would one day be able to move on with his life. The Hokage only asked for one thing in return and that was for Naruto to visit Haku's room at least once a week, a request that Naruto easily accepted. Signing in at the front desk Naruto made his way down a hall before opening a door on his right. Haku registered the door opening and watched as Naruto came in, taking a seat on a chair nearby. Hey Haku, how they treating you? Naruto asked. Haku looked out of the window, ignoring Naruto's question. The feminine male's lack of attention didn't discourage Naruto as this had been how Haku had become ever since Zabuza's death. Only one person could get any emotion out of Haku and that was hate, hate for murdering the one he called master. 
Yes, yeah, Scarecrow gave us forms to sign up for the Chunin exams this morning. Naruto said while smiling as he saw the angry look on Haku's face form at Naruto's new nickname for Kakashi. Ever since he learned that Kakashi had two healthy eyes, he changed his nickname for the man to something that would fit. In the end he took the meaning of his sensei's name to create his new nickname, much to Kakashi's dismay. If all goes well we'll be Chunin soon. Haku still didn't respond though he removed the snarl from his face. Naruto got up and walked over to Haku's chart. Patient refuses to cooperate. We believe a Yamanaka would be more effective at helping. Naruto read off the chart. Naruto shook his head. Haku, you don't want a Yamanaka searching through your mind. Once they find out that you killed your parents they will want to discuss it with you. A frown appeared on Haku's face. Why did you bring me here? Why did you ask your cage to put me here, to help me? We were hoping to give you a new start. Possibly a new life. What would you do without Zabuza? Haku didn't hesitate with his reply. What I want to do now, die. Naruto let out a sigh before exiting the room. He had tried time and time again to help Haku only to receive either silence or a talk similar to the one he just had. Once outside Naruto leapt onto the nearest building before making his way through Konoha. After swinging and leaping two miles Naruto spotted Team 10 heading towards a barbecue restaurant. Seeing them Naruto jumped to a building in front of them before using one of his tendrils to lower himself. Team 10 spotted Naruto and waved towards him. This had been another change in his life after the wave mission. Shikamaru had taken an odd interest in Naruto and Ino had begun to see what Sakura saw. Choji took a bit longer to warm up to Naruto as he was still sore over Kakashi's copy of Make Out Paradise being read out loud during their training. Hey Naruto what are you doing here? Shikamaru asked. Naruto shrugged his shoulder. Nothing much, we just got back from visiting Haku. Ino perked up hearing about the young man, so any changes in his mood? A shake of Naruto's head was all that was needed in response. Deciding to change the subject Shikamaru spoke once more troublesome. So, is Team 7 signing up for the Chunin exams? Naruto nodded. As far as we know, then again Sakura could decide she isn't ready. Want me to go goad her into participating? Ino asked. Thanks, but no if Sakura decides she isn't ready to participate then we won't push it. Ino shrugged her shoulders. It's your call. Well we were about to eat, feel like joining us. Naruto gave a nod and followed them in. Once done eating Naruto began heading home as he saw nothing else to do. As usual a meal with Team 10 involved fighting over food portions as the Akamichi had begun shoveling the food into his mouth the second he thought it was done. Naruto and Choji had almost gotten into a fist fight over the last piece of grilled beef. Just as the thought of slamming the large kid's face into the grill occurred, Ino intervened and ate the last piece. The fact that she had taken the last piece had shocked both teens to the point that they hadn't been able to react in time before she swallowed it. Taking his mind off the meal he just had, a fence surrounded street caught Naruto's attention. There he saw two Sunanins and his teammate Sakura with a few kids. One of the Sunanin, a 15 year old male, wore what appeared to be a black one piece ninja suit with a cat like cowl over his head while purple war paint crisscrossed over his face. On his back as a bandaged contraption and he held one of the kids off the ground by the scruff of his shirt. The second Suna Nin was a female around the same age as the first that wore a light purple off the shoulder garment that went down to her knees while what appeared like a full body mesh covered her exposed shoulders and stopped at her thighs with one of the legs going a bit further than the other. A red sash wrapped around her waist and a large folded fan was wedged between her back and her sash. Her hair was a sandy blonde and was put in an interesting style of four bushy ponytails in the back while two bushy bangs stopped at her teal eyes. You have to admire a deadly woman with style, thought Naruto. As Naruto watched what happened from his comfy spot on the roof, his only real question was how he was going to intervene. Sneak up behind the pair and scare the hell out of them or jump down in front of them and scare them nonetheless. A look at their headbands helped Naruto's decision. Must be here for the Chunin exams. Better not show anything I don't want them to know. Konkuro let's go, we're going to be late, said the blonde Suna Nin. Konkuro just waved her off. Just a second Tamari, I want to teach this kid a lesson. Sakura was going to make another attempt to defuse the situation when the little kid began yelling. Do you know who I am? I'm the grandson of the Hokage? 
I don't care who you are kid. You don't go around bumping into others without apologizing. Konkuro replied. No one saw the slowly growing shadow that appeared in front of Konkuro. Naruto didn't even try to make his landing soft and instead purposely hit the ground as hard as he could. A spider web of cracks appeared beneath his boots and Konkuro fell on his ass from the surprise. Naruto ignored the makeup wearing nin and looked at the small boy. Konohamaru. What have we told you about abusing your status as the Hokage's grandson? The now free boy began cowering. That if you ever see CC caught me doing it again why why you wouldn't just dangle me over the Inazuka hound's pen as you did the last time and would ttt throw me in, CC covered in bacon. Good, now why shouldn't we keep our promise? Naruto asked. At this point Konkuro had gotten back in his feet and pointed at Naruto. Hey asshole what's the big deal? Naruto turned his attention on Konkuro. Shut it make up boy, we'll deal with you in a sec. Konkuro gave a growl as he prepared to reach for the bandaged contraption on his back only for a rock to smash into his knuckle. Without look, Naruto pointed a ball up first towards one of the trees and shot a ball of his symbiote from the back of his hand. All eyes turned towards the tree Naruto pointed at only to find Sasuke on one of its limbs, struggling to get the black goop off of his mouth. Sasuke the men are talking right now. Please don't butt in again, Naruto said followed by some laughter. Sasuke for his part simply glared at Naruto, unable to shout his rage with the black substance covering his mouth, while Sakura attempted to scold Naruto. Naruto why did you do that? Sasuke was only trying to help. Yeah, help his ego. If he hadn't decided to act cool we could have seen what makeup boy had hidden away there, thought Naruto. A new presence appeared in the tree Sasuke was in and only Naruto seemed to sense him. Sasuke get out of that tree now. Despite his ego, Sasuke obeyed and jumped over to where Sakura was. Everyone gave Naruto a weird look while he simply glared at the tree. His glare suddenly shifted from the tree to the spot behind Tamari and Konkuro where a cloud of sand dispersed to reveal a short red-headed teen. Following his gaze, both Suna Nins seemed to freeze in fear. G Gara, said Tamari. Gara carried a large gourd on his back and wore a full bodysuit like Konkuro's except short sleeved and brown. A large leather strap that held the gourd up wrapped around his body diagonally while white cloth wrapped around the other side of his body, intersecting with the leather strap. His green eyes had raccoon like rings around them and the symbol for love seemed to have been tattooed in red ink on the left side of his forehead. Naruto didn't let his guard down one bit, and was ready to defend himself and his team at a second's notice. He might not have been the Nine Tails Jinchuriki anymore, but his symbiote had spent enough time studying the tailed beast to recognize the foul chakra of it and its fellow demons. Naruto and Gara stood and stared at each other for a good two minutes before Gara turned to Konkuro. You are pathetic Konkuro. Before turning around and walking away Gara looked towards the Konoha Nin. I'm sorry for my brother's stupidity. Tamari, Konkuro, we're leaving. Konkuro began sputtering in response. B but Gara. Konkuro, shut up or I'll kill you. This had succeeded in quieting the makeup wearing boy and Gara turned to the Konoha group once more as if forgetting something. Pointing towards Naruto, Gara asked a simple question, What's your name? We are Naruto, and we will be seeing you soon, he said, making sure to put emphasis on we. A manic grin appeared on Gara's face. We? He he he, yes we will be seeing each other soon. With that the Suna Nins walked off and disappeared from sight. Sakura looked towards Naruto confused. She had never seen him this hostile except for Sasuke and even then he never showed this level of seriousness. Naruto reached over to Sasuke and ripped off the small piece of symbiote before leaving. Sasuke had managed to hide the pain that was caused from the symbiote being ripped off so abruptly and was wondering the same thing Sakura was wondering. What got Naruto so concerned? The next day Sasuke floated in the air for a few seconds before gravity seemed to return to normal and he plummeted to the wooden floor. At the last second Sakura appeared beneath him and broke his fall. On the wall across from them, Naruto sat stuck to the wall and focused on the one responsible for Sasuke's fall. A teenage boy only a year older than Naruto stood in a green skin tight bodysuit with orange leg warmers and bandages wrapped from his knuckles up to his forearm. His black hair was in a bowl cut while his eyes took on a circular fashion and his thick eyebrows hovered above them. His name was Rock Lee, 
and he had just beat Sasuke in three moves. The only thing that had stopped him from knocking Sasuke out and truly claiming victory was a pinwheel that had been thrown at one of the loose bandages and pegged it to the wall. They had been heading to the room where the first part of the Chunin exams would be held when Rock Lee had stopped them and challenged Sasuke to a fight. Sakura had been worried about the time they had to arrive and Sasuke had confidently said that the fight would only take five minutes. Yeah, five minutes to get your ass handed to you. A turtle suddenly appeared next to Lee and soon a bizarre scene began as an older carbon copy of him appeared on top of the turtle. At first Lee was punished and then the two began some weird hug. We get that it's weird but why do Sakura and Sasuke seem so disturbed? Thought Naruto as he was oblivious to the genjutsu behind Lee and the new man. After that fiasco they arrived in front of the designated room and found their sensei waiting for them only to be told that if Sakura hadn't decided to join then they wouldn't have been allowed to continue. Which Naruto thought was hilarious by the fact that if she didn't Sasuke would have gotten his ass kicked for nothing. Once their talk with Kakashi was over they entered the exam room. Instantly everyone in the room turned their gazes towards them. Naruto simply brushed off the stairs and instead watched how Ino leapt onto Sasuke's back, much to his and Sakura's displeasure. How can he not like the feel of a woman pressing onto him? Naruto asked out loud. Because it's troublesome. Shikamaru stated. Turning around, Naruto saw Choji and Shikamaru standing nearby. Naruto let out a chuckle before waving them over. Glad to see that it wasn't too troublesome for you to come. Shikamaru shook his head. Oh it's troublesome alright. It's just more troublesome to deal with the repercussions of not coming. Naruto let out a laugh. Typical. Three new presences approached the group and Naruto smiled as he saw Shino, Hanada and Kiba. Well Shino. It's been a long time since we've seen you, how have things been? Shino fixed his sunglasses before answering. Depends on how you look at it. Peaceful would be a word to describe it yet dull fits just as well. Hanada blushed as she began to speak. HH how ha have you been in Naruto? Naruto shrugged his shoulders. Things could be worse, gotta say, life's been good for us. The other rookie Jenin began to be drawn towards Naruto conversation. Kiba saw all the other rookie genin and decided to boast. Well looks like we're all here, too bad for you guys we're going to win this. Sasuke let out a, HN, before making his reply, like we'll lose to you. While the rookies were conversing, Naruto was looking around the room and noticing all the other participants were beginning to stare at them. One guy wearing purple pants and a matching sleeveless shirt over a white short sleeve shirt. He wore round circular glasses and his hair was grey with two bangs hanging over his leaf head and the rest pulled into a low ponytail. You guys should quiet down. You're bringing too much attention to yourself and that's not good, especially for rookies fresh out of the academy like yourselves," said the glasses wearing Jenin. Who are you? asked Sasuke. The glasses wearing Jenin chuckled. I'm Kabuto, but that's not what you should be worrying about. Take a look behind you. The genin stopped talking and turned their attention to the rest of the room and saw what Naruto saw. The attention seemed to unnerve them while Naruto didn't even seem affected. Almost everyone here is nervous about the exams, so quiet down, then again I can't blame you clueless rookies, you kinda remind me of how I used to be. Um Kabuto, is this your second try at the genin exams? A nervous scratch of his head was his first response. Actually this is my seventh. There are two exams every year, so this is my fourth year trying. Naruto raised an eyebrow at this, but decided not to comment. Wow then you know a lot about these exams, Sakura stated. Kabuto nodded. That's right. Here take a look at these, he said as he pulled out a deck of cards. Pulling one of the cards out, he placed it on the ground before rotating it with his finger and pumping chakra into it. These are my ninja info cards. I have over 200 cards with info on every ninja, 4 years of data. He stopped spinning his card and a puff of smoke appeared and dispersed to reveal a card showing a chart of ninja villages and their statistics. Kabuto then began to talk about the different villages and mentioned a recently started village known as the Sound and stated that not much was known. Sasuke decided to step forward. Do you have any info on Gara of the Sand and Rock Lee of the Leaf? Seeing as you know their names it shouldn't be too hard to find them though I should warn you that not all the data will be perfect. Pulling out the two cards, Kabuto proceeded to pump chakra into them till their data was visible and explained their info. 
Naruto gave Kabuto an odd look. Something isn't right. We understand why he would have information on old participants, but why does he have information on participants that have never taken the exams? Naruto decided to test something. We'd like to see the information on Naruto Uzumaki of the Leaf. Everyone gave Naruto an odd look and Kabuto was beginning his procedure. When the card let off a little smoke, Naruto's hand snatched it off the ground before anyone could see it. What the hell? There's no way he should know this. This information shouldn't be this accurate. The data on the card displayed Naruto immunity to Genjutsu and listed his camouflage as a jutsu. Naruto's many escapes from Anbu and other official ninja was stated as well. Various other pieces of information was on the card that while true, Naruto never openly showed it or even revealed it except to the Hokage. The Hokage most likely made a report of his skills and hid it in his desk. So how did Kabuto get a hold of it? Everyone waited for Naruto to reveal his card, but instead he pocketed it in his jacket and walked away. I guess I won't be getting that card back, Kabuto stated. Naruto suddenly sensed three people quickly pass by him and head straight towards Kabuto. He did nothing and watched as the sound nin attack. One boy threw two kanai at Kabuto's feet, an obvious distraction as another teenage boy with bandages dashed forward and swung his fist in a hook. Kabuto dodged this only to fall over and puke. Luckily everyone was too focused on Kabuto to notice the grimace that formed on Naruto's face. When the sound nin swung his arm and the contraption let off a high-pitched whistle. Naruto felt his skin crawl or to be more specific his symbiote, the sound wasn't strong enough to really hurt him, just sting. Naruto knew he had two weaknesses that revolved around his symbiote. Fire which was his lesser weakness and high frequency sounds, his larger weakness. Shortly after the attack, a loud voice boomed over the room and several Konoha nins appeared in front of the room. Quiet down you bastards. I'm Morino Ibiki, the examiner for the first part of the exams said a black trench coat wearing nin. The genin had been randomly placed at desks in the room and each handed a written test. Ibiki explained the rules before giving them the go ahead to begin. Ten minutes into the test Naruto had already discovered the hidden meaning in Ibiki's words and soon turned his test over. The next second Naruto jumped from his desk to the desk in front of Ibiki, standing in a squat in front of said man so they were at eye level. The chunins in the room all tried to move but Ibiki's raised hand told them to do nothing. All the genin stopped working on their test and watched as the two in the front of the room simply stared at one another for what seemed like forever. Sasuke and Sakura were too shocked at their teammates' actions to even form thoughts. He had done some brazen acts before, but never something like this. After a while Naruto's mask seemed to grin, does this count as an offense to your rules? Ibiki returned the grin. Well seeing as I don't have the answers I don't think so. If you chose to waste your time, that's your business. It's a good thing we're done then isn't it? Naruto stated. How do you finish so quickly? Ibiki asked. Naruto snickered, cheated. A few genins simply looked at Naruto dumbly, especially his teammates. Did he just admit to cheating? Was the collective thoughts? Ignoring the stares at his back, Naruto continued. You know the old man once threatened this with you. Ibiki raised an eyebrow. Old man? The Hokage. He promised that if we didn't calm down when we were young, he'd set up a meeting between me and you. You're Naruto Uzumaki, aren't you? Ibiki asked. A nod was his response. Well I've heard plenty about you. Have you heard that we don't play other people's games? Naruto asked, his voice full of mirth. I've heard that you like to step on some toes. Naruto chuckled more like stomp. Some of the chunins began calling names and removing genins from the room as they had been caught cheating five times. Naruto gave a brief glance behind him before continuing his talk with Ibiki. We've heard that you're an interrogator. Got any more scare tactics other than the ones you've presented so far? Ibiki just grinned. Sure, maybe you will get to experience some of them when you screw up in the future. Ha! Huh. Highly unlikely considering we've never been caught unless we've allowed ourselves to, Naruto stated. One of the chunins threw a kanai at a genin's test paper. That's five times, you and your team are disqualified. What, do you at least have proof that I cheated, yelled the genin. Suddenly the chunin appeared next to the genin and slammed him against the wall while saying a few condescending words. Naruto shook his head. You know he has a point. 
If you're going to accuse him of cheating you should at least have proof. It would only be right that the Chunins set an example for us Genins. Another Chunin disappeared before everyone's eyes and appeared next to Naruto hoping to repeat the action of his colleague. Unfortunately as he made a grab for Naruto, the blonde Genin ducked at the last minute allowing the Chunin's grab to pass over him. Without missing a beat Naruto's hand grabbed the back of the Chunin's head and slammed it into the desk, knocking him out cold. Speed doesn't mean anything if you are predictable, so Ibiki, does that count as an offense? Ibiki chuckled. I guess I should count that as strike one. Looking around the room, Ibiki began noticing how several of the genins were sending Naruto cautious looks. He began rubbing his chin as he thought over Naruto's actions. I know enough about you Naruto to know you're not stupid, so why have you been doing this? A few more minutes of thinking and Ibiki openly laughed, confusing many in the room. I can't believe what you did. So simple, yet effective. You've managed to shift the fear I've created here onto yourself. It's not like you won't see the other participants in the later parts of this exams. By staring me down and challenging my authority, you've shown that you have the guts to take on stronger, older opponents. I bet you even backed up the Genin's protest in order to get one of the Chunins to attack you. Checking the clock, Ibiki realized that it was 45 minutes into the test. All right, it's time to answer the last question, but before that we need to determine whether or not you'll take it. Tamari stood up and asked the question everyone was wondering. What happens if we don't take it? Then your points will be reduced to zero and you will be removed from the exams. Then of course we'll take it. An evil grin appeared on Ibiki's face hearing this. But if you take the test and get it wrong, then you will never be allowed to take the Chunin exams again and will forever be a genin. There were several protests from random genin, you lot got unlucky to have me as an examiner. Accepting their fates, some genin began leaving, Naruto simply let out a laugh. Ibiki turned his attention from the genin still in their seat to Naruto, who was still on his desk. What's so funny? We'll wait for a few more to leave before telling you. More teams began to leave and Ibiki kept glancing at Naruto waiting for him to spill it. It was only after 26 teams remained Naruto decided to talk. I highly doubt any cage throughout the lands would follow your rule Ibiki. Several genin's eyes widened in realization. A quick scan through the room showed Ibiki that no one was leaving. He smirked before shocking many by congratulating them. Naruto ignored Ibiki's explanation of the exam and the meaning behind it. Being told what he already knew was boring and pointless. A sudden whizzing sound caught his ears and Naruto leapt up and stuck himself to the ceiling in time to dodge a large black projectile that shot through the window. The projectile unrolled into a large banner and kunais flew out to stab the corners in place. Naruto didn't pay attention to what was written on the banner and instead focused on the women standing before it. The back of her medium purple hair was tied in a wild high ponytail and her eyes were light brown. The tan trench coat failed at hiding her slender curves and her modest bust especially when the only thing hiding them from view was a short-sleeved body mesh similar to Temeri's and a short rust orange min skirt. The feral grin and seductive look in her eyes told Naruto she knew full well what her outfit did to the male population. A few other accessories was present on her body such as grey shin guards on her legs, a blue belt wrapped around her skirt, and a peculiar necklace hung from her neck. It looked like a fang of some sort was the necklace's weight yet Naruto couldn't tell what kind. The fanged necklace brought Naruto's focus back to her bust and he couldn't help but openly comment. Damn, what a view. He whispered. Despite his whisper, the woman known as Anko heard him and looked up to see Naruto with his back towards the ceiling, using his hands and feet to stick to the surface. Like what you see? She asked in a slightly seductive tone. Naruto only nodded before an alarm went off in his head and he proceeded to disappear from his spot as a few kanai took his place. Anko looked over to a corner of the room and gave Naruto a grin that promised pain. Here's a warning to any teenage boys with raging hormones, I hate, perverts. Ibiki watched with much amusement as Anko led the group of genins away. Walking around the room, he began gathering the tests. Picking up one of the tests he saw Naruto's name on it. A blank look formed on his face. That little bastard didn't even answer a single damn question. After Anko had given her warning and led the group out to a fenced area, she began to explain the objectives and rules of her exam much like Ibiki did. Turned out that it was a survival exercise along with another main objective that included the gathering of two different scrolls. 
Before the exams began Enko began handing out forms that alleviated Konoha of being responsible for the deaths that could occur inside exam or to be more specific the training area 44, aka the forest of death. Naruto looked at the forest and gave a chuckle as he was more than pleased with the newest exam. Mistaking Naruto's chuckle as a mockery of the forest, Enko threw yet another kanai at him. Naruto for his part didn't bother dodging and instead allowed the kanai to graze his cheek. A small sliver of blood spilled from his slashed mask but was soon removed by Anko. It's carefree guys like you that end up spilling that delicious blood all over my forest, Anko stated. Naruto felt a shiver crawl down his spine. The shiver wasn't from fear, rather it was from excitement. While he predicted that Anko would appear behind him, he never sensed her nor did he expect her to clean the blood off his cheek using her tongue. Wow that was rather hot, he thought as he began to notice other things such as the closeness of her body and her breathe tickling his ear. Anko suddenly shifted her body so that she brandished a kanai towards a grass nin behind her. The grass nin was an odd one, odd because her tongue had stretched to unbelievable lengths, which held Anko's thrown kanai in it. You shouldn't sneak up behind me, stated Anko in an overly friendly voice. The grass nin chuckled. Sorry but I just wanted to give your kanai back, it cut my hair, and I love the sight of blood. Anko forced a friendly smile. Thank you, quite a bloodthirsty bunch we have this year. Afterwards Anko left and Sakura walked over to Naruto. Geez she's such a weirdo. You alright Naruto? Naruto was still watching Anko walk away, we like her. Sakura shook her head and only sighed. It would only be natural for Naruto to like someone as odd as their present examiner. Once everyone had turned in their forms, each team was guided behind a curtain before being given their scroll and guided to a gate. While they waited, Sasuke decided to try and gain authority. Alright I'll hold on to the scroll. We should focus on at least reaching the halfway point first and then set up an ambush. We have no problem with your plan, but we'll hold on to the scroll, said Naruto. Sasuke held on to the scroll of heaven tightly, obviously not prepared to give it up. I'm the strongest all around in this group Naruto. You might have me beat a taijutsu, but you have no genjutsu, and your ninjutsu is academy basic. If the enemy were to discover that I had the scroll I'd be able to defend it better. Naruto was about to argue, but Sakura chose to step in. We have to be able to trust each other. How else are we going to get through this? We trust Sasuke to save his own ass when the going gets tough and you to help him in his time of need, said Naruto. Sakura flinched at the way Naruto saw her. When Naruto saw that Sasuke didn't have any plans of giving up the scroll, he dropped the subject. The signal went off for them to begin and Team 7 began their mad dash for the halfway point. The forest was like many that surrounded Konoha. Large trees, plenty of shadows, only difference Naruto could find was the sound of abnormal animals and insects. A few screams echoed through the area and Naruto snickered. Guess there have been a few unlucky encounters. A bit later Team 7 had their first encounter with a foreign team. After Naruto went to relieve himself of his bodily fluids, a fake came by and tried to attack the team. Naruto returned in time to see Sasuke chase away the imposter. After this little event Sasuke had decided to come up with a password that Naruto called Asinine. Shortly after the creation of the password a torrent of wind blew across the area threatening to send all in its path flying. With interest Naruto noticed that the wind was solely focused on him, so when the piece of ground he glued himself to was beginning to give, Naruto decided to humor whoever was so determined to split him from the group and see what was planned for him. The powerful wind sent him soaring several miles away. Deciding he had enjoyed the free ride enough, Naruto grabbed a passing branch and allowed his momentum to send him somersaulting to the ground. Once standing, he allowed his awareness to spread through the forest. The sound of kunai's whistling through the air was the greeting he got. As soon as he leapt back to dodge the simple weapons, an image of another person with his palms pointed forward entered his peripheral vision. Decapitating. The teenage boy was cut off as Naruto dashed from his current spot to in between his arms. Suddenly Naruto wrapped his arms around his fellow teenagers, preventing him from moving away. Naruto recognized the sound nin in front of him and quickly proceeded to lift his legs off the ground and plant them on the nin's chest. Allowing gravity to take effect, Naruto fell on his back only to roll back and used his legs to send the nin flying towards the female of the group, who was trying to sneak up behind him. 
Predicting the third member's attack approaching, Naruto wasted no time in flipping back on his feet. Sure enough a third member was dashing towards him. Naruto backflipped just in time to kick the mummified nin in the jaw. Unfortunately the kick wasn't enough to stop the contraption on his opponent's arm from ringing and Naruto landed on his knees with his symbiote shaking. The pain he felt this time was far worse and he had to shakily get up. The three sound nins stood a few feet away from him and Naruto instincts forced him to take in more details of them. The sound ninja seemed to have a dress code of sorts as all three wore urban camo scarves around their necks with matching baggy pants. Instead of just regular blue shinobi sandals the group wore black ones that seemed to have shin guards attached to them and their sound headbands tied across their foreheads. Naruto listened carefully as they conversed and picked up on their names. The one who stood in the middle was Dosu, the apparent leader. His head was all wrapped in bandages except for the spot around his left eye. A lavender shirt with overly long sleeves was his choice of upper wardrobe and for some unforeseen reason he wore a shaggy fur on his back. The second male of the team was Zaku, the one Naruto had tossed. His black hair resembled Kakashi and two metal plates bordered his jawline. A beige short sleeve shirt with the kanji for death on it adorned his upper body while two black pieces of cloth covered his forearm tightly. A closer look at his hands revealed two pipes sticking out of the middle of his palms. The last member of the team was Kin, the female of the team. Her forehead protector kept her long black hair out of her face while it ran down her back. Unlike her male teammates she wore some armor in the form of a pale green flak jacket. Just as Zaku did, she wore a similar pair of black cloths around her forearm. Finally the sound Nin had decided to strike and Naruto had been given enough time to recover. Kin started off by acting as support and began throwing Senbon. She formed the perfect distraction especially with the bells tied to some of the senbon to make naruto focus on them though these projectiles distracted him it didn't prevent naruto from dodging zaku's decapitating airwaves these two were not the ones naruto was concerned with as he was waiting on dosu to strike the entire time finally dosu decided to make his move and appeared in naruto's blind spot sensing a presence behind him naruto spun around and aimed to backhand dosu a mistake that Naruto regretted making as Dosu simply blocked with his sound device, the melody arm as Naruto learned it was called. The instant his hand hit the melody arm, a loud reverberating ringing was let loose. The portion of his symbiote covering his arm was blasted away and Naruto's entire suit shook violently as Naruto covered his ears and screamed. He took a few steps back as he tried to gain control over his symbiote. While this happened the sound nins watched Naruto with confused faces. Dosu gave his melody arm a quick glance before a smile could be seen through his wrappings. Zaku blast him. Dosu ordered. Said sound Nin didn't hesitate as a vicious grin appeared on his face. Decapitating airwaves. A large blast of air was shot from Zaku's hands and headed towards Naruto. Despite Naruto's pain, he leapt back in time to only be nicked. The nick sent him hurtling and Kin decided to follow up with a few senbons. Naruto shrugged off the thrown projectiles as he decided to focus on his real threat, Dosu. Unfortunately the sound Nin predicted this and used his other two teammates as a means to keep his distance. Seeing that Naruto wasn't slowed down enough, Dosu slammed his melody arm against a nearby tree and used his chakra to magnetize the sound created. Once more Naruto's symbiote shook violently and Naruto himself began screaming in pain. Small pieces of his symbiote fell off as dead cells leaving Naruto's clothes looking torn. The pattern repeated once more before one of Zaku's air blasts hit home and sent Naruto flying away through several branches. The sound Nin quickly followed after, only to find nothing. Where'd he go? asked Zaku. Dosu looked around, studying the surrounding forest with sharp eyes while Kin was busy listening for the tiniest sound. Having experiences with different sound-based jutsu she could hear the breathing of a living person and even their heartbeat if she was close enough. Unknown to them, Naruto was only a few feet away, he stuck to one of the trees using his back and limbs. One his hands were held forward and the majority of his symbiote extended from it leaving him nearly except for a few small bits of black ooze. His symbiote had formed a small dome over him and was camouflaging them as merely a part of the tree. Luckily the dome also served as to prevent any noise from escaping though Naruto could hear the sound Nin perfectly through his symbiote. Come out here you freak! yelled Zaku as his bloodlust was getting the better of him. Dosu seemed to give up. Let's go! 
Orochimaru told us to only stall him. Warning bells went off in Naruto's head. Orochimaru. Why would he try to have us ambushed, better yet, what does he want with our team? Gotta get back and help. The female shook her head. You sure about that Dosu? This could easily come back to bite us in the ass. Don't worry Kin. If he decides to face us again we'll kill him easily. Dosu brandished his melody arm. We know his weakness. Kin didn't feel any better about the situation but didn't argue. Damn. Just when I was enjoying myself. Stated Zaku before following his team. Once Naruto was sure they were gone he allowed himself to slide down the tree he was on. The symbiote slowly began returning to him and formed his clothes again. Due to the damage done to him and his symbiote, several holes and tears littered his clothes. Have to rest first, we can't help anyone in this condition. Naruto leaned against a tree as he waited for his strength to return. The second he could begin jumping from tree to tree, Naruto took off. Unfortunately this had only given him around 5 minutes of rest. He was still slightly shaking but he wasn't letting that stop him from being cautious and stealthy. A piercing scream filled the forest and Naruto decided to trade in a little stealth for more speed. He arrived in time to see Sakura crouching protectively next to a kneeling Sasuke, a figure standing on a branch parallel from them. Sasuke was screaming in pain while one of his hands was grasping the side of his shoulder. A better look at the other figure revealed him to be none other than Orochimaru. Naruto merely thought the title Snake Charmer referred to his snake-like abilities, but a first-hand look at him revealed that the man resembled a snake in many ways. The best way to describe his skin was to compare it to the pale underbelly of many snakes and his eyes were yellow and slit. Orochimaru's body was thin and his face narrow with a barely visible nose. So far his only human-looking quality was the long black hair that covered his scalp. What did you do to Sasuke? Sakura yelled. Kakeke, I've merely given him a gift. Soon you will seek me and then I will teach him how to use it. Said Orochimaru before sinking into the limb of the tree and disappearing. Naruto thought on the choices present before him. He could either tail Orochimaru or look after his team. Looking down at Sakura he couldn't help but feel for her. She looked helpless and the realization that dawned on her face only increased her grief. Despite this he felt that tailing Orochimaru was more important. He hated leaving her like that, but he trusted her enough to protect Sasuke. With that thought in mind Naruto left. Despite having disappeared, Orochimaru wasn't untraceable. Naruto jumped from tree to tree soundlessly as he followed the sound of the snake charmer slithering from tree to tree. By now he and his symbiote had recovered from the sound attacks and Naruto could move once more without worry. Naruto made sure to keep a distance from Orochimaru without losing him. Some would wonder how an S rank missing nin could not detect a genin such as Naruto. The secret behind this mystery was once again because of the symbiote. It couldn't just make Naruto soundless, but it did give him a sensitivity that allowed him to feel the different temperature degrees that flowed from spot to spot. Much like a bird used pockets of hot air to fly, Naruto would use these same pockets to move through more quiet as the warmer air molecules passed around him with more ease than cooler ones. This alone didn't allow Naruto to travel silently but it did help give him an advantage over others. Naruto suddenly stopped when a new figure entered his vision. Anko. Sure enough the purple-haired proctor stood on one of the thick tree limbs. Naruto was confused at the sight and merely considered her appearance as a coincidence until Anko began talking to Orochimaru and soon began fighting him. At first Anko seemed to have a chance of fighting on equal ground, but soon the fight turned sour when she was assaulted by some unknown pain, kneeling on the tree limb. The similarity between how Anko was in pain in front of him and how Sasuke was moments ago wasn't missed by Naruto. He cursed as he moved closer to the two and prepared to strike. When he tailed Orochimaru he hadn't planned on fighting the missing nin. Naruto was confident in his skills, but he wasn't stupid enough to think he could actually take on a ninja of Kakashi's caliber or above. He had merely wanted to tail him and report his findings to the Hokage. A tree limb above Orochimaru's and Enko's was Naruto's current position. As if preparing to jump to another tree limb, Naruto ran towards the edge of the limb before jumping. While still mid-air he shot a line of symbiote onto the tree branch he had just jumped from. The line stuck and instantly stretched as Naruto hovered in the air for a few seconds before gravity took affect. Orochimaru had heard the sound of air being displaced but hadn't reacted in time before Naruto thrust both of his feet forward and kicked him off the large branch. 
Anko eyes widened as she recognized Naruto. What the hell are you doing here? Anko growled out between gritted teeth. Naruto ignored her question as he was more focused Orochimaru was. He couldn't see him, but he knew better than to assume that Orochimaru would leave after only one kick. Several snakes extended from a bush of leaves and wrapped around Naruto's torso. Orochimaru had tried to pull Naruto off the tree limb, but the chakra on his feet kept him glued to it. A quick spin of one of Naruto's hand had gathered all the snakes in his grip. He thought about using his superior strength to yank Orochimaru, but threw the idea away in favor of ripping the snakes apart. Naruto wanted to stall Orochimaru and trying to fight the man in an obviously lost battle wouldn't help. A piece of bark a few steps away from Naruto began morphing and Orochimaru rose from the limb. So tell me Naruto. Did you enjoy the welcoming party I sent you? Said Orochimaru, a smug sense of amusement filling his voice. Your guests were most unwelcomed. And we plan to make you pay. Naruto replied with partial anger. He could only blame Orochimaru for setting up the hornet's nest, it was himself who knew of it and decided to kick it regardless. His main concern at the moment was to make Orochimaru believe he was just an angry genin. Hopefully the image would make Orochimaru not take him seriously. The snake Sanin turned into a blur and Naruto tilted his body just in time to dodge a two-finger strike to his shoulder. Orochimaru's assault didn't end there as he followed up with several more kicks and strikes. Naruto stayed on the defense, hoping to be able to throw in a counter strike, but with how odd and unpredictable the strikes were he was finding himself unable. An overpowered sweep kick left Orochimaru open and Naruto flipped forward, slamming his heel on top of Orochimaru's skull. Naruto wasn't surprised when a long tongue suddenly wrapped around him, especially with how Orochimaru's body in front of him turned to mud. Lifted off the ground, Naruto was brought to a branch higher up and met face to face with the real Orochimaru. You did better than I thought you would. Orochimaru admitted as he began performing hand seals. Not wanting to find out what the hand seals were intended for Naruto began trying to rip the tongue off of him. Unfortunately the tongue was too slippery for him to grab. Feeling himself brought closer to Orochimaru, he looked at the man and watched as he the Sanin's digits were covered purple flames. The hand was thrust forward and connected with Naruto's stomach. A blinding pain was expected by both parties and Naruto was surprised that the worst that happened was having the wind knocked out of him. He looked down at the hand that was still connected with his stomach and waited for something else. That should take care of the nine tails, Orochimaru stated with a chuckle. With Naruto staring at his hand, Orochimaru was unaware of Naruto's consciousness and was unprepared when Naruto acted. Two hands clamped down on his shoulders and a knee slammed his mouth close, causing his teeth to sever his elongated tongue. With the tongue severed, Naruto began falling towards the forest floor. He used his freedom to remove the no longer living bindings and shot out a tendril of symbiote. His thread carried him to a nearby tree where he immediately hid himself. Orochimaru's curses could easily be heard, how he wasn't dying from blood lose was beyond Naruto. I will get you for this you damn brat. Fortunately for you I don't have any more time to play, but know this, we will meet again and I will make you suffer. Silence filled the air and a few minutes passed before Naruto began making his way back to Anko. He did not find her on the branch he originally saw her on and instead found her on the forest ground. He dropped down and landed in front of her, causing her to jump into a sluggish fighting style before she recognized him. Geez, don't just surprise me like that, she said as she dropped her stance. Naruto couldn't help but chuckle, we apologize for scaring you. Anko scoffed. Don't kid yourself, you didn't scare me, so what happened with Orochimaru? He retreated. We assume you've warned Anbu considering you decided to take him on, Naruto stated. Anko nodded in response and was going to explain the situation when a thought occurred to her. Hey, where's your team? I left them back a mile or so. Decided that tailing Orochimaru was more important than this exam. Naruto replied. Look you should get back to your team, Orochimaru mentioned, doing something to Sasuke. Chances are he's in no condition to fight and with you here that only leaves bubblegum to protect him. Anko stated. Naruto laughed at Anko's nickname for Sakura, sure you'll be okay on your own? Anko raised an eyebrow. What, you concerned about me? We don't know how bad the pain that mark on your shoulder causes, but from our point of view it isn't the most pleasant, Naruto pointed out. 
She unconsciously raised her hand over her curse mark. I'm okay, you should worry about yourself. You're hiding it well but I can see that you're favoring your right side. We'll be fine in a few minutes, wasn't able to dodge all of his attacks, you sure you'll be okay? Anko gave a short laugh but haughty laugh, I'll be fine, I'm a tokabetsu janin, a little pain in my neck isn't going to leave me defenseless. In that case we guess we'll see you at the tower, said Naruto before leaping away, leaving no sound to indicate he was even there. Hiding under the roots of an enormous oak tree was one of the few places Sakura ever expected to find herself. Doubt swept over her as she watched over Sasuke's unconscious body and she couldn't help but remember what Naruto had told them before his disappearance. We trust Sasuke to save his own ass when the going gets tough and you to help him in his time of need. How true those words were. Sakura thought. After Naruto had been literally blown away, Orochimaru appeared and proceeded to attack them. Once Sasuke discovered that they stood no chance of winning, he tried to offer the scroll of heaven as a trade for their lives. Sakura would never forget the mixture of fear and anger etched on Sasuke's face as he pulled out an obvious fake scroll with Naruto's signature on it. Not that it mattered as Orochimaru made it clear that he had no interest in the scrolls. Once the snake Sanin finally did leave Sakura found herself carrying Sasuke to their current hiding spot. After she had laid Sasuke on the earthen ground in a comfortable position and placed a wet rag over his forehead she proceeded in setting up traps around the perimeter. It was only after she had finished ensuring that she and Sasuke would be fine that Naruto entered her mind. Naruto was right. I took care of Sasuke without even thinking if he was okay or even alive. Is he okay? And if he is, where is he? Sasuke groaned and gritted his teeth. Sweat trickled down his face and Sakura used the rag to wipe away his perspiration. She squeezed the mixture of warm water and sweat from it before damping it with some of the cool water from her canteen. With her rag in a more suitable condition, Sakura placed it once more onto Sasuke's forehead. Before putting her canteen away, she took a much needed sip of her water. Please be okay. Naruto. The forest of death was indeed a vast training field, something Naruto was growing to dislike as he leapt and swung from tree to tree. He had hoped that finding Sakura and Sasuke would be a simple task of retracing his steps but the thousands of similar trees and vegetation left little indication of where he was or where he was going. The only real key marker was the large tower located in the forest and that was only because of the fact that it was located in the middle of it. Another thing that impeded his search was the several other genin teams and overgrown wildlife. He had already chanced upon a few foreign teams and didn't want to start an unnecessary fight. Especially with how the gathered fatigue from his previous two fights was beginning to set in. If Naruto had to judge, he'd say he had one good fight left in him before he would need to rest. His vision suddenly became unfocused and he felt dizzy. Stopping on one of the many tree branches near him, Naruto waited until his vision returned to normal. Damn sound nins. Even now we're suffering from their attack. His head cleared as did his vision and once more he continued his search. Ten minutes passed and the only difference in the forest Naruto could find was the scars left from battles and a few dead bodies in the case that one team wasn't so merciful. Ten minutes turned to fifteen and fifteen turned to twenty. His frustration had begun to get the better of him along with his fatigue when an all too familiar shout rung a few yards from Naruto's left. Decapitating airwaves. Naruto stared at the direction and couldn't help but feel anger. He began turning away as he hoped to think logically instead of letting his anger dictate his actions, but stopped when he recalled that the sound team was Orochimaru's minions. It wouldn't be too far of a stretch to say that the sound nins would be ordered to attack his team, especially with how Orochimaru's anger was now directed upon him and his previous interest with Sasuke. We best at least check, Naruto whispered to himself. Landing on a nearby branch, Naruto studied the scene before him. Naruto's only guess was that God decided to smile upon him as he found Team 10 defending Sakura from Dosu and his teammates. A closer look revealed Rock Lee laying unconscious a few feet from Sakura. The fact that his back was facing her was a nice hint that he was protecting her as well. Team 10 had the sound nins distracted, something that Naruto would take full advantage of. He made his way closer to Dosu and prepared his sneak attack. While he stalked across the branches, Naruto couldn't help but notice how still the sound nin was or the fact that he was mimicking Shikamaru. A better look at the ground cleared that question. Oh, it seems Shikamaru has him ensnared. 
Well that just makes things all the easier for us. Naruto thought with a laugh echoing in his mind. Ino had succeeded in using her family's jutsu, invading Kin's mind and took control. Reaching into Kin's pouch, she retrieved a kanai and placed it at the girl's neck. All right if you don't want your teammate killed you'll give up, Ino threatened. Dosu who was still trapped in Shikamaru's shadow merely glanced over at the now possessed Kin and Zaku looked over confused once he had successfully defended himself from Choji. Neither seemed to care that their teammate was seconds from slicing open her own neck, a fact that made Ino nervous. Hey you guys listening. Give up now or else, Ino said as she brought the kanai even closer to Kin's neck. Dosu moved his gaze away from Kin and towards Shikamaru only to move it once again towards Zaku after a few seconds. Do it. Dosu's words caused Zaku to grin and unnerve Shikamaru. Seeing Zaku raise one of his hands and point it towards Kin caused the lazy genin to shout out a futile warning. Ino watch out. He cursed as he not only watched Kin's body be sent hurtling into a tree, but for his shadow possession to release Dosu as well. The now free sound Nin immediately went to charge Shikamaru, but a strong grip on his forearm prevent him from moving. Dosu turned his head to see a grinning Naruto, you again. The shock of seeing Naruto wasn't enough to prevent Dosu from trying to retaliate, he instantly went to strike his melody arm only to have Naruto grab that arm as well, mimicking the grip of his other arm. Sorry, but we don't intend to let you hurt us again, Naruto said increasing the strength of his grip to ensure Dosu couldn't escape. Sakura saw Naruto and couldn't help but smile, thank god. Shikamaru smiled at seeing Naruto as well, but frowned when he saw Zaku point one of his hands toward Naruto. Oh no you don't, said Shikamaru as he performed his shadow possession jutsu. Zaku's hands suddenly shot up and released two loud blasts of pressure. What the hell? Zaku yelled. Naruto nodded towards Shikamaru. Thanks Shikamaru, we'll quickly take care of this. Shikamaru nodded and replied through grid teeth. No problem, just hurry up, it's too troublesome to keep him still. Dosu struggled to break free from Naruto's grip, but found himself lacking the strength to do so. The wicked grin Naruto's mask seemed to make only fueled his attempts to break free. Naruto slammed his head against Dosu's, momentarily stunning him. Have you ever heard the saying, never hurt what you can't kill? We don't plan on making the same mistake. Naruto stated before placing one of his feet against Dosu's chest. And we don't plan on letting you keep these devices, he added. Dosu quickly caught onto Naruto's plan as did Shikamaru and the others, much to their collective horror. No don't. Naruto didn't know whether it was Dosu who yelled the protest or one of the others, but that didn't matter as the words were quickly replaced by Dosu's agony filled scream. Too useless. Bloody appendages were dropped from Naruto's hands and he made his way to Dosu's armless form as he flailed around helpless with blood quickly spraying from the nubs that remained of his arms. Sakura's complexion nearly turned as bone white as the two splinters that jutted from Dosu's nubs. The image before her seemed to burn its way into her mind and she couldn't bring herself to look away. Blood covered much of the ground and was clearly visible on Naruto's hands as small droplets fell from them. Despite the nightmarish picture before her, Sakura wished she could mute out the scream she continued to hear to hear even more. Please. Please just put him out of his misery, Team 10 wasn't faring any better than Sakura. Shikamaru was lucky enough to be too busy holding Zaku in his shadow to focus on Dosu, but his pain-filled screams got to him. Ino had let go of her hold on Kin and returned to her body, hoping that she wouldn't wake up while the sound Nin still suffered. Naruto's action seemed to affect Choji most as his kind heart couldn't handle what he witnessed. Bending over, the Akamichi released his stomach's contents. Surprisingly the one who seemed least affected by this was Dosu's own teammate, Zaku. The look on his face wasn't of horror or disgust, but surprise. Didn't think any of these tree huggers had it in them, he thought morbidly. Naruto had finally reached Dosu. He simply placed one of his boots on Dosu's throat slowly adding pressure and choking him. A quick jerk of his foot was all Naruto needed to end the sound Nin's life and silence him forever. Zaku didn't have much time to think afterwards before Naruto appeared behind him and knocked him out. Luckily for Shikamaru, he had let go of Zaku's shadow just in time for Nordo's bald fist to slam over the pressure point at the back of the sound Nin's neck. Naruto wasn't allowed to relax despite both Zaku and Kin being unconscious, 
It wasn't the morbid stares his fellow Leaf Genin were giving nor was it Lee's teammates watching over them. No it was the dark chakra that was now floating around the now conscious Sasuke. Following Naruto's gaze she soon found Sasuke standing a foot or so behind her. She was glad to see that he was awake, but the weird flame-like markings that covered over half of his body and the visible purple chakra unsettled her. Who did this to you? Despite the concerned question Sasuke asked, Sakura couldn't help but feel the malice behind it. The sound Nin attacked us while you were unconscious. B but it is okay, Naruto and the others protected us. At the mention of Naruto's name, Sasuke's anger grew and his focus shifted from Sakura to Naruto. Reaching into one of his pouches, he produced the fake scroll of heaven. This your idea of prank? Sasuke growled out. Naruto only returned Sasuke's glare. What, you angry that your bargaining chip wasn't available? He proceeded to pull out the real scroll of heaven, an act meant to mock Sasuke. Sasuke's anger rose and he threw the fake scroll at Naruto. The fake scroll was batted away and Naruto leapt to the side in time to dodge Sasuke's rushed kick. Never thought we'd use the last of our strength to defend ourselves from Sasuke, thought Naruto as he fought back. Sakura watched in confusion and fear as her two teammates fought. It just seemed like no matter what happened something horrible seemed to follow. Naruto showed up to protect her, only to traumatize her with one of the goriest kills she'd ever seen. And Sasuke woke up only to be surrounded by a chakra that disturbed her and had even begun fighting Naruto. Team 10 didn't try to intervene as they didn't know who to help and were unsure if they could stop either one. Sasuke was sent flying thanks to a hook from Naruto. Instead of his back slamming into the tree, he flipped himself over and used it as a springboard. Kicking off the tree, Sasuke launched himself above Naruto and began a series of hand seals. He's stronger and faster than before, Naruto thought to himself. A large intake of air from Sasuke warned Naruto of the fire jutsu coming. Unfortunately he had been prepared for a large fireball, not the multiple fire blasts that exploded forth. Explosions littered the forest floor around Naruto and a pained cry filled the air. Smoke slowly cleared, and Naruto stood amongst the burnt earth, half of the clothes on his upper body were burnt off. His mask gave way to reveal the right side of his face, showing his long forgotten whisker marks and the matching side of his jacket and shirt were now replaced by the burnt skin of his pectoral and arm. The blinding pain Naruto felt was easily ignored in place of the anger that coursed through him. Sasuke and Naruto stared each other down once more, waiting for any signal to let loose the pent-up rage both had for the other. Finally the two dashed towards each other with the intent to end each other. Mere inches away from each other, both seemed frozen and unsure. Their hands were pulled back and ready to strike, but the pink-haired girl between them prevented either from finishing their attack. Sakura's soft hands pressed against both teens' chest and they looked at her face to see the tears spill from her eyes. Please, just please stop fighting, she begged weakly. Naruto hesitated for a few seconds before dropping his fist and walking over to Dosu's corpse. Sasuke simply stood stunned, unsure of what happened. Relief filled Sakura when she saw that Naruto wasn't continuing the fight and that the dark chakra and odd marks began to fade from Sasuke. Rummaging through Dosu's supplies, Naruto found the scroll of earth. Pocketing the scroll, Naruto walked over to the hollow Sakura had used before to hide in and slowly let his body fall and relax on the cool earth. Sakura. Naruto yelled out. Hearing her name called, she turned her attention over to Naruto and panicked when she saw his prone form. Rushing over, she kneeled next to him and rested a hand on his side, being cared to not put too much pressure on his burnt skin. You okay Naruto? She asked with genuine concern. Naruto didn't look up but he did nod. We need you to use any ninja wire we have and restrain the remaining sound nins. They work for Orochimaru, we need to take them to the Hokage. The seriousness in Naruto's voice told her to do as he asked without question, but the exhaustion that echoed from him only fueled her concern. Are you sure you're okay? Yes Sakura, we just need to rest. Please tell Shikamaru we said thanks, Naruto replied. Two days later it had taken two days of rest for both Naruto and Sasuke to be able enough to fight. In truth Naruto could have been ready the next day, but with his symbiote it was expected for him to recover faster. Sasuke's curse mark was another factor in his slower recovery. Ever since the seal had been put in place he hadn't been able to mold chakra as easily and he would go through fits of pain at random moments. 
Once Sasuke was able to confidently fight, they decided to complete the second portion of the exams. Team 7 made their way towards the tower with Naruto carrying both Zaku and Kin. Just as he did with Haku, he used parts of his symbiote to bind them. Speaking of his symbiote, it had regenerated enough as recreate his clothes. This didn't go unnoticed by his teammates and when they asked how his clothes had returned to normal Naruto lied, using the excuse that he had storage seals with spare clothing. It would be another day of travel before they reached the center of the forest and both Kin and Zaku presented much protest and struggle as they moved on. Naruto had wanted to arrive at the tower sooner but Sakura argued that with both scrolls in their possession, they shouldn't rush to the tower and make themselves an easy target. Once they finally did arrive at their destination, they were greeted by a riddle written on one of the walls of the room they entered. In the end Team 7 had to risk disqualification by opening both Heaven and Earth scrolls which resulted in summoning someone Naruto hadn't expected to see. Uruka? The Chunin teacher smiled as he looked at Team 7, but it lessened as he looked at Naruto and noticed the two tied up sound nin. I don't think you're allowed to take prisoners Naruto, Uruka stated with a jesting voice. Naruto shook his head, they work for Orochimaru. The mere name made Uruka's face grow stern and he moved closer to Naruto. I heard that he's been seen here in Konoha, but I didn't know that the sound was his ninja, I take it you will want to see the Hokage. Naruto nodded as he adjusted Kin over his shoulder. Hiruzen Serutobi could feel his age really affect him at the moment. An S-ranking nin was currently using Konoha as his personal playground and to make matters worse it was his old student. At the moment the Hokage could only be happy that both Naruto and Enko had managed to escape with their lives and that nothing further had occurred. He took a long drag of his pipe and letting the smoke float form his mouth before turning to Team 7 and the other occupants of the spare office room. Kakashi stood behind his students while Uruka and Enko stood at the side. Everyone I want to thank you for the information you have provided. Kakashi I need you to place a counter seal over the curse mark. I would have Jiraiya handle it but he isn't here at the moment. Kakashi nodded before placing a hand on Sasuke's shoulder and disappearing in a swirl of leaves. The Hokage then turned to Uruka. I would like you and Ms. Haruno to wait outside, there's something I want to discuss with Anko and Naruto in private. Uruka did as he was told and exited the room with Sakura. Closing the door behind him, he could faintly sense seals going off. Most likely to prevent any sound from escaping the room. A few minutes passed as the two simply stood in silence while they waited for Naruto to exit the room. Uruka sensei, Sakura whispered. Yes Sakura? Uruka asked with a curious look. Sakura opened her mouth to speak but nothing came out, she closed her mouth and bit her lip before opening it again. Wa well, what have we gotten ourselves into? Don't think too hard about Orochimaru. You and the others did nothing to drag yourself in. That's not what I'm talking about. Uruka looked at Sakura questionably before understanding came across his face. He placed a gentle hand onto her shoulder, feeling the shudders that racked her body. I had hoped my students wouldn't have to face this side of a ninja's life for a bit longer, Uruka stated. Sakura shook her head. Naruto, he ripped that sound nin apart, before our very eyes. I didn't even kill him, and yet I'm still haunted by his screams. How could Naruto do that, and appear completely unfazed? I don't know. Uruka whispered. Naruto has been an enigma to me ever since I've known him. I know that Naruto has had a hard life, even more than most orphans have. Maybe Naruto has had to kill before in order to save his own life, or maybe he's just holding it in where no one can see, I mean he is wearing a mask. Uruka allowed Sakura a minute to soak in everything she had been told before continuing. That being said, I understand what you are feeling right now. It's not easy to witness such horrid deaths, whether it be an enemy or an ally. Unfortunately this is a part of life for ninja. I have seen my enemy hit with a fire jutsu and survive, only to scream for the remainder of their life as the burns send them into shock. I had a close encounter with a wind jutsu once. I never even saw it coming until someone pushed me out of the way. Watching my comrade's body fall to pieces due to hairline slashes is one of the few things I never want to see again. Sakura shook her head in the hopes of ridding herself of the mental images that formed. What am I supposed to do about Naruto? I haven't been able to speak two words to him without talking to the team as a whole and every time I look at him, I see blood covering his hands. Uruka let out a sigh. I don't know what to tell you, 
but I should inform you that Naruto will most likely see the blood on his hands far more than you do. Whatever reason Naruto had for killing in such a way, it doesn't change the fact that he killed that ninja. He will have to live with it, and the sad fact is that there will be many more. For Naruto, and you as well. Sakura's eyes widened upon hearing this. Instead of trying to deny or lie to herself, she just went silent. Inside the office. There is a lot going on and Orochimaru seems to be at the center of everything, Naruto stated. Hiruzen nodded before taking a puff of his pipe. With the sound nins taking orders from Orochimaru, it's safe to say that he is Otto's leader and has its entire army at his disposal, which still doesn't explain why he has marked Sasuke with the curse mark. Orochimaru wouldn't return just for Sasuke, not during a time when our security is at its highest. Not much is known about Otto, but it isn't large enough to successfully attack Konoha. Maybe he has more than just an army, Naruto stated as he reached into his jacket and pulled out a slightly burnt card. Luckily Sasuke's fire jutsu didn't hit the majority of it, thought Naruto as he handed the card to the Hokage. A participant by the name of Kabuto Yakushi had a deck of cards. Each card holds information on different ninja and this card was among them. The Hokage studied the card for several seconds before he understood what was wrong with the situation. There's no way he should know all of this, Hiruzen spoke out loud. We thought the same thing. Ever since we've met Kabuto we haven't been able to trust him. His demeanor and the things he says, tells us that he's far more than he pretends to be, said Naruto. Anko opened her mouth to speak. Kabuto Yakushi, I remember his name. He's the one that John and Medic brought to our village from a battle several years ago. His record is rather ordinary, nothing really impressive, but if he's a spy, then this would explain a lot. Hiruzen shook his head in disbelief. A spy amongst us. This would explain how Orochimaru managed to slip by the patrols. Hopefully the two sound nins we brought in will give us some information. We would advise extra guards for their cells, don't need them killed off under our nose, said Naruto. Bratz got a point. I doubt Orochimaru will simply let them live, Anko added. The Hokage nodded in agreement. True, I'll assign more Anbu to watch over them. What about Kabuto? It wouldn't be smart to allow a spy to roam around as he pleases. The Hokage nodded in agreement with Naruto's statement. We'll wait until after the second portion of the exams before we apprehend him. Same goes for the sound Jonin. This way Orochimaru will believe that we haven't caught onto Kabuto or Otto. A grunt escaped Anko's clenched teeth. The hand she had pressed against her shoulder told the Hokage exactly what the cause was for her pain. The curse mark still acting up. He stated. One of Naruto's eyebrows rose as he took interest in the subject. What exactly is the curse mark? He asked. The Hokage didn't answer immediately, as he took time to think. I'll admit that I don't know much about the curse mark. It's a seal that Orochimaru created in order to enhance the abilities of the bearer. Unfortunately there are severe and even fatal side effects. The chance that the curse seal won't kill the person it's placed upon is slim. Anko decided to continue the explanation. Even if you do survive, resisting the seal can cause bouts of pain. Giving into the seal is even worse as you're taken over by anger, hate, and even greed. It can take the worst of you and bring it out to the surface. He plans to have Sasuke come to him. Naruto stated. Sasuke wants power to avenge his clan. If he gives into his greed, he'll leave. The Hokage blew out a cloud of smoke. Hopefully the suppression seal Kakashi puts on him will prevent that. Naruto gave an unconvinced look, though it was hard to see as his eyes were the only indication. We wouldn't put too much trust into it. Anko laughed at this. What, you don't have confidence in your sensei's skills? It's not that we don't have confidence in Kakashi, it's Sasuke that we lack confidence in. The Hokage cleared his throat to regain both ninjas' attention. Is there anything else that either of you would like to inform me about? Both nins thought for a second before shaking their heads. In that case you are both dismissed. I would recommend resting for the majority of your stay here Naruto. Naruto nodded and didn't bother asking why. If the Hokage was going to tell him, he'd have done so. Following Anko out the door, he saw Sakura standing next to Uruka. The fact that Sakura looked away from him wasn't missed and he decided that he would figure out what it was about later. For now he just wanted a decent meal and a place to sleep. Hey Anko before you go any chance this place has a cafeteria? 
we haven't eaten anything but fish for the past couple of days. Anko shrugged her shoulders. Yeah yeah, there's one somewhere in this place. Just have Aruka there lead you to it, she said before disappearing into a hallway. Naruto turned to Aruka afterwards. All right, lead the way. Two days later Naruto stood in a room with twenty other genins around him. All attention was towards the Hokage and many others that stood around him. Behind the Hokage were two statues of mesh covered arms forming a hand sign. The Hokage began explaining the true meaning of the Chunin exams and how they were meant to supposedly prevent wars. Naruto only gave partial attention to what was being said as he chose to study his surrounding instead. The circular floor they stood on was littered with cracks and scuff marks. An upper level surrounded them and was fenced off by sets of rails. The Hokage's advice from the day before and his observations helped Naruto realize that the room they were in was an arena of some sort. Naruto picked up on the bickering around him and heard the Hokage mention something about a preliminary round. A smile crossed Naruto's face at the thought of being able to actually fight one on one. Suddenly an ill-looking man decided to take over for the Hokage and explain the reason behind the preliminary round. Once the new examiner was done explaining he decided to inform them of their choices. If you don't believe you can continue the exams, let us know now before we start, before letting out several coughs. The Hokage, Anko, and Naruto all watched as Kabuto raised his hand. Sorry but I don't think I can continue. The new examiner, Hayate, check him off a list. All right are there any more that would like to quit now? The other genin were talking amongst them while Naruto watched Kabuto leave. As this happened Sakura began trying to convince Sasuke to drop out due to the curse mark, something he had no intentions of doing. This is the one time where I can test myself and see where I stand in the world. I've told you before, I'm an avenger. If you take this away from me, I wouldn't forgive even you Sakura. Sakura's eyes went wide as the tone of Sasuke's voice told her that he was serious, she relented afterwards and simply prayed that he'd be okay. Seeing as no one else was going to leave, Hayate began the preliminary. If everyone will leave the arena we will begin. The genin walked up a set of stairs and were soon joined by their Janin sensei. Some of the genin wondered how their opponents would be selected, only to get their answer in the form of a flat screen that lowered from the ceiling. Two sets of names rapidly flipped through the screen before stopping. The selected names were Sasuke and Kiba. The Inazuka gave an excited yell before taking his place on the arena floor. Sasuke simply jumping down into his spot opposite of Kiba. Naruto couldn't help but feel disappointed as he watched Medic Nins pick up Kiba's burnt body and carry it out of the room on a gurney, his faithful dog following after them. Kiba had told Akamaru to stay out of the fight as he wanted to prove that he could take on Sasuke by himself. The fight had started out as a trade of punches and kicks. Sasuke's eyes were blazing with the Sharingan 2 Tomo form. With his Sharingan active, Sasuke began winning the Taijutsu fight as he began to predict Kiba's movements. Realizing that he was losing the fight, Kiba retreated away from Sasuke, who threw several kanai and shuriken. Without hesitation, Kiba pulled out his trump card. His features became more beast-like as he hunched over and jumped towards the projectiles. Many had gasped as Kiba suddenly spun his body around till it appeared as nothing but a grey cyclone. Easily knocking the projectiles aside, Kiba continued flying towards Sasuke. A stinging pain in his neck caught Sasuke off guard and he had only been able to barely dodge and three long slashes ran down Sasuke's arm as proof that he had not been able to fully dodge the attack. As soon as Kiba's feet touched the ground, he turned around and leapt towards Sasuke again. This time before spinning his body he threw a smoke bomb onto the ground. The clouds of smoke effectively blocked both participates' vision as well as hiding them from the spectators. But Kiba's sight being taken away did little to hinder his attacks as he could still smell Sasuke, who on the other hand had to trust his ears to alert him. Sasuke had managed to dodge Kiba's airborne body, but only by split seconds. When the smoke cleared, Sasuke stood with various claw-like slashes riddling his body. An overconfident Kiba didn't even bother throwing another smoke bomb and spun towards Sasuke again. Not intending to throw away an opening Sasuke spun through hands seals before leaping to the side. Once again pain throbbed from his curse mark, this time however Sasuke gritted his teeth and ignored it. As Kiba's hurling form passed by, Sasuke launched a fireball from his mouth. The second the large fireball hit, the torrent of winds spread the flames and soon covered Kiba's body. 
The Inazukas rolled against the ground and his body shook as the scorch marks covering him throbbed. A pain-filled cry rolling out of his mouth. He had tried to get up, but quickly collapsed back onto the ground. Seeing that the fight was over, Hayate declared Sasuke the winner. After that fight, a few quick ones passed by. Tenten had fought Gara and had to forfeit when she discovered that none of her thrown weapons could get through Gara's sand. The fact that his opponent had quit before he could even fight had infuriated Gara. A stern command from his Jonin sensei seemed to keep Gara from attacking his defeated opponent, though Naruto doubted Gara even considered the man as his sensei. The fight afterwards was Hinata against one of the Rain Genin. The fight began with the Rain Nin performing a Jinjutsu that created several copies of himself and scattering them among the room. The shy Hyuga, though nervous, kept herself from being too distracted from the copies and activated her by Kugan. The Rain Nin had ignorantly ignored the change in her eyes and made his way towards her back. The second he was within a few feet, Hanada spun around and began stabbing her index and middle finger into several spots of his body, shutting off his chakra points in the process. The Rain Nin had tried to make a retreat only to have his legs shut down as well. With her opponent unable to move, Hanada took a few steps back and waited for Hayate to declare her the winner before taking her place back on the upper level. Naruto decided to make his way over to Team 8 and congratulate Hanada. Good job, Hanada. TTT thank Yu. She stuttered out with a dark blush covering her cheeks. Naruto chuckled at Hanada's shyness before looking at Shino and seeing his tense figure. Looking at the screen, he noticed that Shino's name was shown on the screen while the other name had yet to be picked. Shino's posture relaxed and he let out a sigh of relief when the name Masumi Surugi appeared. Naruto chuckled as Shino's team gave the Abarame heir a questioning look. Having noticed the looks he was given, Shino decided to explain himself. There are two people here that I do not wish to fight, Gara and Naruto, he said in his usual stoic voice. Ah, oh, what's wrong Shino? We wouldn't bite, much, Naruto said, chuckling after he said much. Hanada and Kurinai couldn't help but giggle at Shino's expense. As true as that is, I rather not fight you, Shino stated as he walked by them and made his way down to his spot in the arena. Naruto looked over at Masumi and noticed that he was one of Kabuto's teammates. The realization came from the fact that just as the sound nins seemed to have a dress code, so did Kabuto's. The only difference between Masumi and Kabuto's choice in clothing was that Masumi draped a purple cloth over his face and wore his headband in a bandana style similar to Naruto along with thin glasses. His skin was slightly tanned and his eyes seemed in a permanently narrowed manner. The fight didn't last long after Hayate announced the start as Masumi didn't appear to have any long-range jutsu. With nothing preventing Shino from swarming the so-called fellow leaf nin with his bugs the match ended. When Shino returned to the upper level, Naruto decided to state his disappointment. Geez, how the hell did he get this far? Looks like you were given a free pass Shino. The bug user agreed with Naruto and began thinking of several reasons his opponent was so simple to overtake. Seeing as his friend was analyzing his situation, Naruto turned his attention back to the board and watched as two more names were picked. He burst into a fit of laughter when Sakura's and Ino's names appeared. The other leaf nins that knew Sakura and Ino didn't join in Naruto's laughter as they were aware of the broken friendship and rivalry between the two teenage girls. Oddly enough the match lasted far longer than any of the others before it. But 15 minutes into the match, Ino had captured Sakura in her family's jutsu and possessed her body. Naruto had to admit that what Ino had done was rather smart, using her hair to stop Sakura's from moving. But he couldn't help feel bad for Sakura and decided to at least cheer for his teammate, hopefully help boost her morale and give her a small boost in the fight. Strangely enough, Sakura had managed to break free and Ino had returned to her body. Afterwards the two ended up knocking each other out with a single punch, something that once again had Naruto laughing loudly while the others simply stared in shock. Both Asuma and Kakashi dropped down onto the arena floor in order to retrieve their respective students. With the arena now empty save for Hayate, the board once more began the process of choosing the next two participants. Naruto jumped over the railing without a second's hesitation when he saw his name flash to life and waited for his opponent. For some reason unknown to Naruto, Hinata's eyes widened when she saw her cousin's name appear. She sent a worried look towards Naruto, hoping he'd leave the arena in the same condition he entered. 
Naruto looked towards the opposite end of the circular room and saw Neji Hayuga. Aside from the obvious fact that he was a Hayuga, Naruto didn't know much more about his opponent. He didn't know about his status, the fact that Neji was Hinata's cousin, nor the real reason he wore his headband over his forehead. You should give up and spare yourself the embarrassment, Neji stated in a matter-of-fact tone. Naruto chuckled as he began to approach the center of the arena. Oh, and what makes you believe you'll win? Because fate has already determined the outcome of this fight. Neji had expected many responses. Defiance, anger, shock, and even fear. But never did he expect full-blown laughter. Naruto bent over and held his ribs as his laughs bounced off the walls and his eyes filled with tears of amusement. As he began to calm down, Naruto gave Neji an amused look. If there truly is such a thing as fate, then it has abandoned you. Neji's pupil less eyes seemed to focus as veins around his eyes bulge. You can't say I didn't warn you, he said as he dropped into a low stance. One arm pulled back and allowed it rest behind him while his other hand was brought forward with the palm facing Naruto. Naruto's amusement had yet to fade as he let out a few small laughs. If there is such a thing as fate, then it brought the symbiote to us. Hayate looked at both teens before starting the match, begin. Neji had chosen to remain glued to his spot while Naruto began to walk a slow circle around him, a lax posture as his only stance. As his opponent stalked around him Neji turned his body so as to keep him in front of him, not that he needed to. Naruto finally stopped and dashed towards Neji. When they were within striking distance, the two clashed. Naruto threw in several punches and kicks while Neji retaliated with many thrusts using his middle and index finger. After landing a hook across Neji's temple, Naruto staggered back. Gentle fists are ass. It felt like he just drove several four-inch nails through our muscles, thought Naruto as he rubbed one of the spots that had been hit. Neji couldn't chase after Naruto as his vision had become blurred and fuzzy, the spot over his temple already showing signs of bruising. How preposterous, you think you can beat the Hayuga style with brawling, Neji stated in disbelief. Naruto ignored Neji's words and shot a small thread towards Neji, yanking back as soon as the symbiote touched him. A quick chop from Neji severed the thread, but this didn't stop him from hurtling towards the wall. Instead of hitting the wall head first, Neji flipped his body and landed on his feet and prepared to kick off. At least that was his plan. Instead Naruto had already jumped onto the same wall, landing on all four limbs and lunged towards him. Naruto tackled Neji off the wall, his hands holding onto Neji's shoulders, while his feet planted themselves onto his torso. As soon as Neji's back touched the hard ground, Naruto kicked off, not but before the Hayuga slammed a gentle fist strike over his heart. Both teens' attacks rewarded them with pained grunts before the two separated. Naruto flipped away from Neji and landed on his hands and knees, his back facing towards the Hayuga's downed form. Coughing could be heard from Naruto and the white teeth of his mask slowly stained red with blood as he attempted to calm his breed. As soon as Naruto stood, a cold chill went up his spine. I can't believe, I've been forced, to fight you seriously, said Neji between pained gasps. Naruto turned around and saw that Neji was now in a different stance, one that had him lower his entire body so that his left extended hand nearly touched his foot and his right hovered high behind him. Before Naruto could even react, Neji blurred towards him and landed two strikes. Two palms. Neji declared. Naruto took a step back as the impact pushed him, and found that Neji wasn't done yet as he continued thrusting even more sets of strikes. As Neji struck he openly stated the set he was on. Four palms. Eight palms. Sixteen palms. Thirty-two palms. Each strike pushed Naruto further and further until his back met the wall. Sixty-four palms. Neji finished as he hit Naruto with the remaining 32 strikes of his attack. Cracks formed in the wall behind Naruto as his body became abused against it. With the attack finished, his entire body seemed to slump and it appeared that the only thing holding him up was the wall he seemed embedded. Neji took a step back and observed his work. A smile crept across his face despite his labored breeds. I told you that you were fated to lose. I've shut down all of your chakra points. The fact that you're still standing is surprising enough. Confidence exuded off of him as he turned his head towards Hayate. I've won, call the match. Deciding to take one last look, Neji turned back towards Naruto, only to have an open hand block his vision and slam him against the wall. 
Kanata amongst others that knew about the gentle fist stared on in shock as the two had now switched places. Naruto smiled as he held Neji, lifting him off the ground and proceeded to repeatedly slam his head against the wall. His chakra points had indeed been shut down as the pain coursing through his body made it easy to know even without the all-seeing Byakugan. But while Naruto had chakra points, his symbiote did not. At the moment Naruto wasn't truly moving, his symbiote was controlling his body like a marionette would a puppet. Despite his predicament Neji didn't simply sit or hang idly and allow Naruto to slam him against the wall and proceeded to attempt to fight back. He threw strikes to the arm holding him and attempted to throw kicks that would hopefully force Naruto to let go. But this proved useless as his kicks couldn't gain enough strength while being held above the ground and his strikes couldn't do anything to the already shut down chakra points. The cracks and indent created from Naruto's body being beaten into the wall paled in comparison to the crater that Neji's body created and continued to deepen. After the eighth slam Neji stopped fighting back and a look in between Naruto's fingers would show that Neji's eyes began to roll into the back of his head. Naruto brought Neji closer to him so he could whisper a few words of advice. I could care less if you decide to believe that everyone has a fate that they can't be avoid, but realize this, if there is such a thing, then fate gave us the unbreakable shield to your sword, fate decided to have you fight an opponent you couldn't defeat, and fate abandoned you to the beating you have received. One of Neji's hands suddenly shot forward and struck Naruto left pectoral, a defiant look in his eyes as he fought to stay conscious. Blood seeped through Naruto's mask and dripped down his chin. Despite the pain, Naruto simply chuckled. Good. Fight back, don't let a word decide everything for you, he said before slamming Neji against the wall one last time, forcing him unconscious. Neji's body dropped against the ground and Naruto walked away as Hayate declared him the winner. Jumping back onto the upper level, Naruto became aware of the stares he got from his fellow Leaf Nin. Shino shook his head as he understood what many were thinking as he couldn't logically explain how Naruto could move after having his chakra points shut off either. But Shino had learned long ago that Naruto defied logic on many occasions. Hoping to help one of his few friends from the awkward attention, Shino decided to speak up. Now do you see why I don't want to fight him? His fighting style reminds me far too much like a spider. The now red teeth on Naruto's mask mimicked the appreciative smile he had and Naruto sent a nod towards Shino, a hidden message Shino understood and returned. Many of the leaf nins took their attention away from Naruto, but some still kept an eye on him, especially Hinata. Can he continue to fight through sheer determination alone? She asked herself her Byakugan active and showing her yet another mystery as his chakra points began to turn on one after another like stars in the sky. Once Neji had been removed from the arena via medic nins the fights continued. Shikamaru ended up fighting one of the rain genin. Just as his teammate did, the rain nin created several genjutsu clones except he proceeded to hide in one of the shadows created from said clones. Anyone that knew about the Nara clan and their abilities would have known better. Shikamaru left the arena after forcing his opponent to slam his head against the arena wall. Afterwards Choji fought against Tamari. In the middle of the fight Naruto commented on how Choji never stood a chance. Especially with how Tamari could use her fan to float above Choji as he turned himself into a living bowling ball or meat tank as his jutsu implied. After Choji was forced to revert back, Tamari swung her fan and created a tornado that lifted Choji off the ground and proceeded to dig several slashes into his skin. Tamari left the arena untouched while Choji had been carried away. Lee's battle had him fighting Kabuto's other teammate. A fight easily won by Lee as his opponent's main ability revolved around him touching someone in order to absorb their chakra. A few punches ended the fight and the final fight between Konkuro and the last Rain Nin. Before the fight even began, Konkuro released the bandages from the contraption on his back and revealed a bizarre brown, human-sized puppet. A shaggy wig acted as the puppet's hair and it had been given three eyes. Its long dirt-colored cloak covered much of its body except for its four arms and two legs that hung lazily beneath it. At the start of the match, Konkuro's puppet flew across the room and latched its four arms around the rain nin. Let me guess, you are going to create clones and hide. Konkuro stated smugly. Well too bad. Give up or I'll have crow crush your bones, he threatened. With no way out the rain nin had no choice but to give in. Hayate, the Hokage, and the other examiners approached the center of the arena and signaled for the winners to approach. 
A week later Naruto traveled across Konoha in search of a sensei. After the preliminaries ended the Hokage explained that they would have a month to rest and prepare for the third and final part of the Chunin exams. Afterwards Anko walked in front of them and had them reach into a box to take a number. Naruto didn't pay attention to the numbers the others received and simply waited patiently for his turn while taking the time to properly admire Anko's curves. Something that Anko was fully aware of as she sent a playful glare at Naruto once it was his turn to draw a number. When everyone was done drawing their number, a chart was displayed to show everyone who they would fight. Naruto snickered at the fact that he would get to fight the person that beat Sasuke, Lee. Afterwards Kakashi had offered to train both Sasuke and Naruto, but Naruto had passed it up and warned Kakashi exactly what Gara was. With the new knowledge Kakashi immediately agreed and began making plans to train Sasuke in a more private area. Naruto had chosen to rest the next few days as the gentle fist strikes had harmed him a lot more than he let on. Afterwards he began trying to find the person he wanted to learn from. Only problem was that he couldn't seem to find his intended instructor. He could have easily asked the Hokage to set up a meeting, but chose not to as he felt the old man had enough on his hands. So instead Naruto began gathering information. He asked several questions about his hopeful teacher such as home address, hobbies, and even places frequented. Naruto didn't even bother with the home address as he got some unknown thrill from actually having to hunt down his target. So instead he simply waited for the opportune moment to strike. He didn't know when his simply search for an instructor became a game, but he enjoyed it. Landing in front of a small restaurant, he proceeded to walk in. Scanning the room, he quickly spotted his target and continued to silently move forward until he was a mere feet away. Hello Anko. Isn't it such a nice day? Anko quickly spun around with a kanai in her hand, stopping once she saw Naruto and a grin spread across her face. Well if it isn't Naruto, shouldn't you be training with Kakashi? Naruto took a seat next to Anko and ordered a plate of dango. We passed up the chance in order to seek training from someone that interests us. Anko's brow rose in interests. Oh, and who is the person you plan to have train you? Why, you of course. Naruto said playfully. His words shocked her only for a moment before her earlier attitude came back. Ha. Huh. And why would you want me to train? While we're at it why should I take time out of my schedule to train you? Naruto chuckled. Why wouldn't we want someone as skilled and beautiful to train us? Flattery will only get you so far brat. Naruto's order of dango finally arrived and Naruto slid the plate towards Anko. Oh we have much more than flattery to offer in return for your tutelage. Picking up one of the sticks of dango, Anko bit off one of the round balls of pastry. Hum but I can easily buy my own dango. Instead of getting discouraged Naruto simply decided to up the trade. Carefully walking behind Anko, he placed his hands on her shoulders and began messaging them. There are other things we can offer. Things that someone of your career could easily buy but wouldn't get the quality of service we offer. Em, mm, you have a point there. Said Anko as she enjoyed the sensation of the knots on her shoulders being rubbed loose. She had already decided to train him, but it wouldn't have been any fun if she gave in to his request immediately. Truth be told, Naruto interested her. The fact that the Hokage spoke so highly of him during the Genin team selections had made her curious and now she had been given the chance to actually train him. So tell me Brad, when do you want to start? The sun, damn did she hate it during the morning, or evening as far as she knew, like this. Her head throbbed, a noise too loud might as well have been nails across a chalkboard and she felt a pressure on her stomach that didn't usually exist. After five more minutes of unsuccessful attempts to fall asleep again, Anko finally cracked open one of her eyes and saw a head full of blonde hair lying across her stomach. A frown appeared on her face when she couldn't recall the specific details of last night. She tried to gain a closer look at his face, but the wild hair and the fact that he was facing away blocked her view. Moving wasn't an option as she quite honestly didn't want to move at the moment, and doing so regardless would most likely alert her intruder, guest. So instead she simply resigned herself to studying him and her surroundings. The blonde teen was sprawled out on his back on top of her bed with limbs hanging over the bed, much like herself, and used her stomach as a pillow. Aside from his black long-sleeved shirt and matching boxers, he was half. A closer look at herself revealed that she wasn't in any better condition as she was only dressed in her mesh top and skirt, her belt half undone. If we were planning on doing something, we passed out way before we could get to the good stuff. 
Now that she was done accessing his and her situation, she turned her attention to the rest of her room. Her dark green walls seemed to help dull the headache she had at the moment, while looking at her floor only aggravated it with how the light seemed to brighten from the cream color. Pieces of clothes littered the ground among various other things such as scrolls and ninja items. It wasn't exactly a mess, though it definitely needed some cleaning done. She attributed the knocked over lamp next to her drawer as a casualty from making her way to the bed last night. Her guest, as she accepted him as, finally moved his head so that it was facing the valley of her and Enko got a better look at him. Some of his hair still shadowed his face, but that was quickly solved with a slip of her fingers. Enko could admit to feeling slightly better knowing that Naruto was the one currently sleeping on her bed and not some stranger she got too drunk to scare away. Seeing his face reminded her of the last few weeks, and how she grew to like the blonde Genin and his, I don't give a damn attitude. Having been given the opportunity to train and observe Naruto helped Enko understand what the Hokage saw in him. While an Uchiha could copy a jutsu with a mere glance of their Sharingan, that was all they could do, just copy it. Naruto on the other hand was different, he was a fast learner that was for sure, it had only taken him a little over a week to learn and perform what she taught him flawlessly, but he didn't stop there. Anko learned exactly what Serutobi meant when he said that Naruto didn't really need a sensei. After learning the two jutsu he was taught, he continued experimenting with the jutsu and learning to use them in various ways Anko had never thought of. Another thing Anko found out was that Naruto didn't merely spend his time learning new jutsu like many would as he made sure to continue training himself physically as well, though looking at his body made that obvious. Deciding to observe his physical training brought Anko to Naruto's house and gave her further insight into who he was. Surprisingly Naruto was rather neat and kept his house clean for the most part. Another thing she learned was that he made do with what he had. Instead of sleeping in his bedroom, he slept on his couch. The reason for this was so he could turn his bedroom into a workout room, complete with a bench press among other weightlifting tools. Seeing the various weights made it easy to see how Naruto had gained the muscles that were uncommon on a teen his age. She hadn't truly expected it but at the end of each training day Naruto kept his word. A plate full of dango, a pleasing shoulder and back massage, and to top it all off, good company were her payments at the end of each day. Naruto, he was different from most people. It was rare to find someone like herself that didn't care about what most people thought. It's not like she was lonely. Anko had several people she could call her friends, but most of them were either co-workers or women her age and had their own stress to deal with. Naruto was a breathe of fresh air, just someone she could relax with without trading stories of dislike or boredom. A groan from Naruto woke Anko from her thoughts and hinted to her that he was waking up as well. She fixated him with a stare as she waited with curious mischief, pondering what his exact reaction would be. Throbbing, it was the first thing he felt, heard, and couldn't get out of his mind as he woke up. The sun caused his eyelids to scrunch as the rays of light were highly uncomfortable on his face. Nevertheless, he opened his eyes to begin the process of waking. Naruto hadn't questioned the odd sensation of his pillow or the fact that his couch felt far too comfortable or spacious, at least not until he came face to face with the thinly veiled bust that belonged to Anko. He was smart enough to not focus too long on the nicely shaped body as the facts that he was not in his house, not on his couch, and sleeping on top of someone became apparent. His eyes slowly made their way slowly towards Anko's face. The feral grin on Anko's face was all the warning Naruto needed and he quickly leapt to his feet just in time to escape Anko's reach. The sudden movement was a mistake on both sides as they both clutched their heads and groaned as the hangover hit them harder than before. Naruto staggered while attempting to find the nearest bathroom with Anko heading towards the kitchen. His first task once he closed the door was to rummage through Anko's medicine cabinet. Looking over and reading the ingredients of any over-the-counter medicine he could find, the throbbing of his head made it hard to concentrate, and the symbiote's angry chastising of how Naruto poisoned them didn't make things any better. After finding that none of the medicines alone would solve his current problem, Naruto grabbed a small white bottle of aspirin and swallowed two of the white pills. It wouldn't cure his headache, but it would be a good start. While he was waiting on the effects to kick in, Naruto thought about his current predicament. Nothing had happened between him and Anko. That was obvious despite his current dress attire. Oddly enough it was the fact that he was wearing little clothes that helped convince him that nothing happened. Normally he slept and the fact that he wore anything last night hinted that he had enough sense to keep at least some of his clothes on. 
Anko not killing him in his sleep was another nice assurance. Making his way back to the door, he allowed a small sliver of his symbiote to crawl through the crack of the door and check on where Anko was. Finding that she was not in her bedroom, Naruto opened the door and gave a quick command for his suit to add on a pair of pants for him. Afterwards he made his way to the kitchen, stopping only to raid the fridge in order to mix various ingredients to finish his, here. He gave his mystery brew a final stir before heading towards the living room and finding Anko laying across her couch while watching a program on her TV. If she was curious about where he found his pants she didn't show it. Instead she gave the red liquid Naruto was drinking a questioning look. What the hell is that? She asked bluntly. Naruto took another gulp before answering. Secret hangover cure. His answer being roughly sarcastic. Anko simply stared at the cup in Naruto's hand for several minutes before holding her hand out. Noticing the outstretched limb, Naruto decided to take one last swig before handing the remains over. Looking into the half-filled cup, Anko gave a cautionary sniff before jerking back like an animal smelling something possibly dangerous. What's it made of? She asked. Naruto's face split into a grin, already feeling the hangover slowly disappear. It wouldn't be a secret if we told you he stated with more glee than Anko liked. Pinching her nose, Anko attempted to drink the remaining red liquid in one gulp. The digits closing her nostrils did nothing to prevent the burning sensation that traveled down her throat. If it wasn't for the fact that her headache was dulling, Anko would swear she was being pranked into drinking a Tabasco-filled drink. Naruto chuckled as he watched Anko's face turn red, while she attempted to keep tears from spilling from her eyes. With his hangover slowly leaving him, his memories of the previous night began to return to him, though it held its gaps. Put line here the bar was filled with several voices, each talking about their own topics and news. Random chatter such as this was not uncommon in such a place, especially one that's common goal was to serve liquor of various flavors and potencies. But what was uncommon was the sight that many had focused their eyes on at the front of the bar. Centered in the center of the bar stools was Anko and Naruto, both laughing and drunk. Seeing Anko around wasn't surprising. And seeing Naruto, with his leaf headband on wasn't surprising either. Being a licensed ninja allowed anyone to be considered an adult, and Naruto wasn't the first genin to ever have a drink at a young age and wouldn't be the last. What did surprise many, was that Anko had walked in with Naruto and ever since sat, talked, and even drank with him. Most times that Anko came to have a drink, she did it alone, and any guy that had decided to, attempt, to flirt with her or openly stared at her figure too perversely, found that their good night was cut short. Yet here was a boy half their age, admiring, her body for all it was worth and openly making flirtatious comments about her. Some believed the only reason Naruto had not been beaten within an inch of his life was the fact that he was still only a teen. Others had believed that Enko had simply gotten too drunk to care, though this theory was quickly thrown away when a, what he must have thought of himself at the time, Stud decided to try and steal Anko from Naruto. Many could still remember Naruto's laughter while Anko began to tear into the so called Stud verbally and forced the man out of the bar with a whole slew of threats and promises. You've had enough, son, the barkeeper stated, as he proceeded to try and remove the bottle of whiskey from in front of Naruto. Both Naruto's and Anko's hand shot forward and grabbed a part of the half full bottle. Nows, nows, this is my students and I want us to celebrate his first time in the bar all proopers," Anko said. Naruto nodded sloppily while agreeing with Anko. Yeah, we stills have a BBBBAC, was needed SS and ABC. The bartender gave a confused look at Naruto, an ABC? Once again Naruto sloppily nodded his head, an alcohol's blood contents. Anko began laughing at Naruto's stupid joke and the waiter let out a sigh when he saw that he wouldn't be prying the bottle from their hands before they succumbed to alcohol poisoning. Have it your way. Gladly, both exclaimed. The two refilled their glasses before continuing their social drinking. Anko, you sure we should be drinking this mucus a few days before the Chunin EE exams? Naruto asked. Anko chuckled before taking another sip of her drink. Komasan. Why you've already learned the thingijis use wa anted to learn froms me. W what's a day or two's recoverings from a hangover? She said before breaking out into a laugh. The laugh seemed infectious, at least for Naruto as he began laughing with her. 
The rest of their night continued going along similar as time went by before they both left to retire for the night. Don't choke. Naruto said Anko's coughs slowly died down as the burning sensation slowly dulled. A glare was sent towards Naruto, not that he minded. Anko had opened her mouth to speak, but a hoarse wheeze was all she could manage. Getting up, she returned to the kitchen only to come out with a glass of water. She downed half of the glass before making her second attempt at speech. Ha, huh, so tell me, what all do you remember about last night? she asked. Bits and pieces. We went to a bar, talked, drank, and returned here, Naruto said. Nothing happened between us, he decided to add. Anko let out an amused laugh. I figured as much, still got my panties on, she whispered the last part, though Naruto's ears picked up on it. You never told me what your strategies are for your opponents, Anko suddenly brought up. Naruto simply gave Anko a curious look while she returned the look. Well don't you think as your sensei? no matter how temporary, you should tell me your battle plan. After a moment's thought Naruto began listing off the different strategies he had planned out. Hanada will be the easiest. We get the feeling she doesn't want to fight us, though if she does decide to fight us, we'll handle her like we did Neji. We guess we shouldn't be as rough. Shikamaru will be trouble, that is if he is taught the more advanced techniques of his family. Otherwise he'll just be an annoyance, we best assume he has been taught. Even so, so long as we keep our distance, he won't be able to get us. You shouldn't underestimate him, he may be lazy but he's far smarter than anyone your age. Naruto nodded in understanding, that might be true, but his stamina sucks. If I was fighting all three of the Inoshika Cho, then we'd be worried. But alone, he'll have to find a way to capture us himself, something we intend to only allow after we've exhausted him. Anko nodded her head. All right, how about the others then, such as your teammate Sasuke? Naruto began laughing. We highly doubt we'll have to fight Sasuke. What makes you think that he'll lose his match? Enko asked, a puzzled look crossing her face. Sasuke's first opponent is Gara. He's a fellow Jinchuriki. Naruto partially lied. At most, Kakashi could have taught Sasuke how to survive his fight. I doubt Sasuke could have been taught enough to actually beat Gara with only a month of training. She had to agree with him. A genin, no matter how talented, couldn't hope to actually beat a host of one of the tailed beasts with only a month's worth of training. Well how do you plan to beat Gara then? The question was followed with silence as Naruto's face scrunched in thought. We doubt that he has shown his full power, but from what has been seen it revolves around his sand, so far the only plan we have been able to come up with is to force him to chase us with his sand, then after it's been spread out far enough we'll close in and attempt to fight him. Hopefully his sand will be too thin to block our attacks. Anko's face mirrored Naruto's. That doesn't sound like much of a plan, she stated. Naruto shook his head. We know, unfortunately if we can't thin out his sand, no attack whether close or long range will be able to harm him. She saw the sense in that but, but still, you're relying on a theory, then again it's not like you can simply look up his information and find a weak spot. Okay well let's move on to your other opponents. Naruto continued explaining the rest of his strategies to Anko. Afterwards he headed home in order to truly rest for the remaining two days. Two days later Anko couldn't help but notice how quiet the stadium seemed despite how packed the rows upon rows of seats were. Yeah the final part of the Chunin exams had yet to start, but one would think the several hundred people talking would seem loud. I didn't think you would be here Anko, asked a feminine voice. Anko looked to her side to see Kuranai and Kiba approaching the empty seats next to her. Kiba still had bandages wrapped around various places on his body. Luckily his hood protected his head and hair from the majority of Sasuke's fire jutsu. Anko smiled as Kuranai and her student sat down. I really didn't plan on attending, but my student asked me to babysit his friend. I don't need you to babysit me, Haku growled out from the seat behind her. Kuranai ignored the feminine boy in favor of feeding her curiosity. Your student? I didn't know you had one. Anko chuckled. Well I didn't before last month, but three weeks ago he approached me and asked for my tutelage. Hum, he. Kuranai stated before she began openly ticking off the known male competitors and the reason they wouldn't go after Anko in order to learn. Can't be Sasuke or Naruto, they have Kakashi to teach them. After this was said Anko's smile grew mischievous and a small bit of her tongue stuck out between her teeth. 
This wasn't missed by Kuranai and she quickly moved on it. Which one? Anko puffed out her chest, much to Kiba's delight. It was Naruto, said I had something that Kakashi couldn't offer him. Kuranai's face scrunched up in confusion. What do you have that Kakashi, the copy Nin doesn't? Ah. I can't go and tell the enemy what my student has up his sleeves, Anko said. The enemy? Kuranai asked confused. Yeah, you have two students in this tournament. The other here having an unsuccessful talk with Pre Boy here. Having heard this, Kiba abandoned his one sided conversation. So where is Naruto? I don't see him down there yet. Anko simply shrugged her shoulders. Naruto's apartment. Naruto looked into the full body mirror, his clothes constantly shifting forms. Need something that's convenient for our fighting style yet appease the judges in what they believe a ninja should look like. His mimic Anbu clothing was instantly replaced by a black mimic Chunin outfit. No, don't want to appear cocky. Let's just start off with the first layer. The symbiote morphed into a skin tight bodysuit with a mask covering his head as well. All right, we want to be noticeable but not too flashy. Possible clients will want a face. The mask withdrew to reveal his tanned face, blonde spiky hair, and blue eyes. Add some sandals, some trousers, not leather, and maybe a loose turtleneck. The black suit shifted to his desired thoughts. He took one last look at his image before adding a few more changes. Make the sleeves wider and shrink the torso so that it's almost as skin tight as the first layer. And for the final touch, our own little insignia. The spider emblem that had been on his previous choice of attire bled to life among his new shirt. Perfect. And now for a touch of professionalism, he said before making his way towards his dresser, picking up his leaf headband and tying it to his forehead. The clock on his wall caught his attention, and a slight bit of panic coursed through him. Shit. Only five minutes till the Chunin exams start. Naruto didn't bother with the door and simply jumped out his living room window. Reaching the stadium had only taken him roughly three to four minutes, though this had been due to swinging, leaping, and what many called flying across the village. Now Naruto stood outside of the arena contemplating on whether to make a flashy entrance or simply walk in. His want to impress a few clients eventually veered him towards being flashy and he began running next to the sidewall of the stadium. When he reached a fast enough pace, he shot a long thread of his symbiote to the top of the wall, allowing his momentum to swing him forward. Seeing he would need a little more push for his swing to be successful, he swung his feet forward, giving him the needed inertia. Having swung full circle, Naruto found himself upside down and let go just as his swing brought him over the wall and towards the center of the arena. Instead of just allowing his body to fly towards the hard earth, Naruto curled his arms and legs to his chest before letting his body to spin with the motion. Just as he reached the ground his feet touched down and he slid several feet before coming to a stop in front of the other participants. A chorus of claps came from several impressed spectators with a few murmurs accompanying them. Naruto looked towards the other contestants to see their reactions. Hanada looked her usual self, blushing, and surprisingly she was one of people who clapped. Gara seemed uninterested in his acrobatic landing with his siblings giving mixed responses. Konkuro seemed confused and clearly didn't recognize Naruto. And Tamari was slightly impressed with a bit of shock added in. Shikamaru didn't seem to care and Shino was his usual stoic self, though Naruto had received the usual greeting nod. Finally Naruto looked towards his first opponent and found an excited Lee. Naruto chuckled at Lee's behavior. Most would be nervous from Naruto's display and the fact that he was their first opponent. Then again Naruto knew that Lee was no pushover in taijutsu, something both boys specialized in. On the stands, looks like he has the right idea, Anko murmured. Kuranai nodded her head in agreement while a puzzled Kiba simply stared at Naruto before voicing his confusion. Right idea? What are you talking about? Anko stayed silent for a few seconds as she observed Naruto. The final part of the Chunin exams is held with several local and foreign nobles, which in short means clients for us. Naruto's new wardrobe is closer to the idea of what most expect ninja to look like, with little alterations here and there. The small things such as the large spider emblem on his shirt and his bright blonde hair will make it easier for the nobles to notice and recognize him more while his dark and lightweight clothing help the examiners take him more serious. Add in his special entrance and now he has everyone's attention. Kiba thought over everything he had been told, he understood much of what was said, 
but there were small pieces that didn't seem to make sense. So what's so important about gaining the noble's attention? He asked curiously. Kuranai decided to take over seeing as she was Kiba's sensei, it only made sense that she teach him. By gaining the noble's attention Naruto has gained several possible clients. Even if he doesn't make Chunin, he will have several people wanting him for missions. Which will give him several chances to be promoted, Anko interjected. Before Kiba could ask another question, Kuranai decided to continue on. The more missions you perform, the more mission reports go in your file. If the cage of the village reviews your records and feels that you are ready to become a Chunin, then there is the possibility that you may be given an alternative Chunin test. Kiba seemed to get excited at the prospect of becoming a Chunin soon after the exams and Kuranai decided it was best to better explain things. This alternative test is rare though. It usually requires several high-ranking missions and compliments from clients or higher-ranked fellow nins before a cage will decide to review your files. In short, you would have to be doing exceptionally better than most in your rank, gain the satisfaction of various clients, and gain the respect of your colleagues. Naruto has already impressed Asuma, who has written it down in his mission report which was also copied as a footnote into Naruto's files. Kiba gave a whistle out of amazement. Damn, I didn't know mission reports were so important. You should always give full detail when writing a mission report, Kuranai stated. A report can show if you fought infamous foreign nins, how you handled various situations, among many other things. Anko laughed. Just don't go lying on your report, it isn't hard for the Hokage to discover if you're lying. One way or another, he will find out. And when that happens you better expect a lost in rank at the very least. Kuranai decided to only confirm this statement with a nod as she turned her attention to the arena instead as the final part of the exams began. A new examiner acted as the referee for the Chunin exams in place of Hayate. Who this new person was and why the sick Tokubetsu Janin wasn't present didn't matter to Naruto, as he simply stared at Lee with a feral and challenging grin while Lee returned it with fierce determination. My name is Genma Shiranui and I will be the referee for this portion of the Chunin exams. Now will everyone except Rock Lee and Naruto Uzumaki leave the arena floor? With that said the other participants made their way towards their observation level and waited for the match to begin. Both Lee and Naruto continued to stare each other down and made no other movements other than the slight shift into a battle stance. Genma looked back and forth between the two eager teens. Looks like you two are ready to go. The rules are the same as last time. Both of you will fight until one of you can no longer fight or you give up. Killing is allowed but if I've already determined the winner and you kill your opponent regardless then you'll be disqualified. Do you understand? Naruto and Lee simply gave a nod. Good, alright fight, Genma shouted. Lee dashed toward Naruto the instant Genma declared the start of the match. This didn't bother Naruto as he was just as impatient for the match to begin. A flying spin kick aimed for the head was blocked by both of the blonde Genin's arms. This had left Naruto open on his other side something Lee decided to take advantage of with a quick ride straight. Lee's attacks were successful but not without him receiving a similar punch from Naruto. The two stumbled back, or in Naruto's case, took a step back before fixing each other with a predatory glare. It was Naruto that dashed towards Lee this time, though not as fast and threw a quick series of jabs and hooks. The jabs had been easy to block and parry, unfortunately for Lee the hooks had either broken his guard or unbalanced him with their sheer strength. Ducking under an overextended hook, Lee grabbed the arm and threw Naruto over his shoulder. Said blonde simply righted himself midair before leaping back at Lee. The two once again engaged in hand to hand combat, except this time Lee was prepared for Naruto's fast and powerful strikes. Seeing that he wasn't making any progress with his fist alone, Naruto decided to switch tactics and used an overpowered kick to Lee's side in order to force some distance between himself and his opponent. The kick worked as planned and Naruto thrust his left fist forward. A thin tendril of his symbiote shot forward and connected with Lee's shoulder and he pulled back hoping to set Lee off balance. But just as he yanked his fist back, Lee used his own in order to form his hand into a chopping form and quickly severed the link between him and Naruto. Seems you learned from your teammates fight, Naruto stated. Lee reaffixed his stance before responding making sure that his left arm was held behind his back while his right was held in front of him, 
the back of his hand facing Naruto with his finger curled as if he was about to perform a come forward motion. There was much that I learned from that fight. A moment of silence filled the air before Lee burst from his spot. Such as the fact that you're holding back. Lee spun his entire body forward, leading with his right foot as the rest of his body followed the motion while airborne. Naruto didn't waste any time throwing his arm to his side and tensing his entire body, bracing himself for the blow. Duck! shouted Kiba as he watched the fight go on with his whole attention focused solely on the fight. Haku sat next to him, giving the match the same kind of attention. A thunderous boom filled the air as Lee's kick connected with Naruto's arm. Lee whirl. Lee's declaration was halted by his own shock as his kick only caused Naruto to lean slightly to the side. With his body still in mid-flight, there was nothing Lee could do as Naruto's right fist smashed across the side of his face. Why didn't he duck? Kiba asked, clearly confused. Because it was unnecessary, was Haku's response. Everyone's attention turned to the previously silent boy. While Kurenai and Enko understood that Naruto made the correct choice, they were also curious about Haku's thoughts on the matter. I don't know enough about all the fighters here, but from what I've seen there are key differences between Naruto and Lee. Haku allowed the thought to set in before continuing on. Lee is faster than Naruto, and possibly a bit stronger in strength. But Naruto's reflexes along with his heavier body gives him the advantage in close-range fighting. How does Naruto having a heavy body give him an edge and why would it even matter in a fight between Shinobi? Kiba asked. Haku took a moment to think, trying to find the best way to explain exactly what he meant. The answer's in reverse, when has this ever been a fight between two Shinobi? So far they have simply been brawling. As far as Naruto's weight, simply put, it makes it harder for Lee's attacks to have an effect. Understanding dawned on Kiba's face. I see, so that's why he didn't dodge Lee's kick. Cause he could withstand it, right? A curt nod was Haku's reply. There are other things to consider as well. Kurenai added. Such as the fact that Naruto's body was planted firm on the ground while Lee wasn't. Kiba turned his attention towards his sensei, waiting for her to continue. It soon became apparent that she had no plans to continue and Kiba switched his attention back towards the fight. It seemed that what Haku had said earlier was true. Naruto stood relaxed, a few scuff marks on his face but otherwise he was okay. It was Lee who seemed to have taken a beating. Naruto's mouth began moving but thanks to the distance between them, Kiba and several others could not make out what was being said. Anko on the other hand stood up and growled. During her ninja carrier she had been taught to read lips and understood exactly what Naruto was saying. We're tired of this Lee. We know full well that you're still wearing your weights. Take them off now and fight us seriously. If you don't we'll continue to fight you with the minimal effort needed to beat you. Lee's look went from determined to shock within a second. I told him not to instigate Lee into removing his weights, what is he thinking? Anko growled out. A look towards the judges showed them scribbling down on their boards, obviously having read Naruto's lips as well and marking him down. Lee suddenly turned his attention towards the stands and gave a questioning look. My guy appeared to be in a thinking pose next to his other students before returning Lee's look with a smile and gave a thumbs up. Naruto smiled as he observed the entire thing and waited as Lee began removing the weights. The ground trembled as the weights were dropped and Lee returned to his battle stance once more. Kiba could only wonder how the few weights Lee removed would help him. He opened his mouth to voice his question but was unable to say anything before Lee suddenly vanished, only to reappear in front of Naruto connect a solid kick to his face. Unlike before where Naruto would have simply taken a few steps back, he stumbled before writing himself into a fighting stance. But once again Lee disappeared and struck from Naruto's blind spot. The hell! Kiba shouted while he watched the fight completely turn in Lee's favor. Naruto threw a few punches and kicks, only to hit air and shortly afterwards, sent flying by another of Lee's attacks. When Enko had told him about the intense training guy had given Lee and the weights used in said training, Naruto had gotten excited. He knew he shouldn't have talked Lee into removing the weights but the idea of actually fighting someone his age that could actually fight on equal grounds with him was too much to pass. Naruto never believed he could lose against Lee, even now as the green-clad genin was pummeling into him. He believed there was a way to beat Lee. Once more his fighting instincts kicked in and he leapt back in time to barely dodge Lee and placed his back against the arena wall. 
He placed his arms in a tight guard in front of him and began watching out for the dust that was kicked up every time Lee leapt from one spot to the next. The dust was his only clue of where Lee was and he planned to use it to his advantage. Placing his back towards the wall was a way to ensure that Lee couldn't attack him from behind. Suddenly all traces of dust kicking up faded and Naruto narrowed his eyes as Lee had yet to appear. It was only thanks to the sound of air being pierced above him that Naruto tilted his body to the side fast enough as to only receive a grazing blow from Lee's downward kick and leapt away. The ground crumbled beneath Lee as his foot collided with it before disappearing. Now being forced away from the wall, Naruto was once more being attacked from all sides. Using chakra to stick him to the ground only helped him from being knocked to the ground while his body rocked from side to as the blows landed. A punch slipped through his guard and his head spun to the side, blooding flying from his lips. Gotta do something soon. Our body can only take so much. Despite the pain that was steadily increasing in his body, Naruto focused on all the details he and his symbiote could observe. One thing he caught onto was the fact that Lee wasn't aiming for any of his vital organs or one area in general, most likely due to the fact that while Lee was moving at a speed that made him nearly invisible, his own vision was impaired. If Naruto had to guess, he assumed he appeared as an oddly shaped blur to Lee. Another thing Naruto noticed was that Lee was visible a split second during his attack, something he could have taken advantage of if he didn't have to recover from Lee's attacks after they landed. But the most important thing Naruto noticed was that Lee was making a fatal mistake. He was following a pattern of attack, which made him predictable, he knew not if the focus needed to move at such speeds made Lee careless in other areas, but he couldn't think of any other reasons. Naruto realized he would have one chance. Just one chance to turn the entire match around, for if he missed this one opportunity then he risked Lee discovery his own mistake or worst passed out from the abuse his body was taking. He waited. More attacks came and left new bruise, but he waited. Waited to make sure that he was sure about the pattern and went so far as to close his eyes so other details would not mislead him. Suddenly Naruto's eyes snapped open and he made his move. It had happened so fast that most of the audience couldn't honestly tell what happened. One moment Naruto was being beaten within an inch of his life then, they didn't know what to think. Naruto suddenly ducked and Lee appeared behind him, his fist extended forward and over Naruto with his body still in mid-flight. Then without warning Naruto's body spun in a 180 degrees and what sounded like an implosion filled the arena. The only hint of what had created the noise was Naruto's fist buried into Lee's ribs and the pained expression on said Genin's face. After what seemed like minutes, Lee began to back away with trembling steps until he turned around and collapsed onto his hands and knees, all the while carrying the same pained expression as if he were silently screaming. Anko smiled when she saw Naruto perform two sets of hand seals. It's about time this ended. She merely stated much to the confusion of the others around her. Instead of pestering Anko for an answer, they turned back towards the arena and saw both Naruto and Lee standing. Neither looked as if they should have been even conscious, let alone standing. Lee was the first to attempt to move, only to grab his side and freeze into place. Naruto gave a knowing smile and chuckled. It was hard to move when you had several broken ribs moving, scraping, and grinding as you made any kind of movement that involved twisting or turning the torso. But broken ribs didn't seem to be enough to lower Lee's determination. Instead of raising his hand to forfeit, he chose instead to begin unwrapping the bandages around his forearms and allowing them to settle against ground as he prepared for one final attack. A quick dash was all Lee could do to close the distance between him and Naruto, who was prepared and had his fist reared back in preparation. Ducking under Naruto's punch, Lee launched a foot towards his opponent's chin from his kneeled form. His foot found its mark and sent Naruto flying towards the sky, but not without renewing the screaming pain in his side. The pain didn't matter though, this was a last attempt at winning the fight. A last desperate attempt. If this failed, there would be no other gates opened. The sheer stress placed upon his body would only aggravate his wound and most likely leave him a bloody mess on the ground. But his attack had landed and he felt assured that his attack would finish the fight. With a quick leap Lee placed himself within Naruto's shadow and began wrapping the bandages around Naruto's body, forming a cocoon of sorts. During his preparation, Lee noticed something that caused his sense to shout danger. Naruto's hair isn't brown, Lee stated in his mind. A savage kick to his ribs caused the green-clad ninja to let go of the now-dissolving mud clone. 
Li was able to turn his head during his fall to see Naruto, performing hand seals as if that attack to his shattered ribs had not been enough. Naruto wasn't leaving anything to chance. With the hand seals complete he threw an opened palm towards Li. The sleeve of his shirt bulged before five black snakes shot out and headed straight for Li. Each symbiote-covered reptile wrapped themselves around a part of Li. Two around his wrist, two around his waist, and the last around his throat. The hidden shadow snake hand jutsu, the one reason he sought out Anko. As much as he cherished his self-created web-like attack, Naruto also understood its limits. Such as the fact that a strong enough person could break the thin strands. Sure one solution could have been to simply increase its thickness, but that would mean he would have to use more of his symbiote to create it. So when Naruto saw Anko use her hidden shadow snake jutsu, he knew that he had found a way to improve his web attack without using too much of his symbiote. The mud clone was just a bonus that Anko talked him into learning. Her exact words were, Every ninja needs a clone of some kind that isn't that rookie illusion shit. Another bonus Naruto never intended for was signing the snake contract. Apparently Anko's jutsu was a variant of summoning and required the user to be a snake summoner. Yanking his arm back dragged the snakes back as well. Seeing as the two were still falling, the snakes had simply pulled the two closer together. With his arms restrained, Lee could do nothing as Naruto planted his foot onto his chest and used him as a platform to jump off of. Flipping forward caused the snakes to once again follow Naruto's motion. Finally landing onto the ground, Naruto swung his arms down and watched with a satisfied smile as the snakes slammed Lee into the ground. With a flick of his wrists, the snakes unwrapped themselves from Lee's prone body and slowly retreated back up Naruto's sleeve. Genma waited until the snakes were out of sight before walking over to Lee and inspecting the damage. It didn't take him long to declare Naruto the winner as Lee needed medical help immediately. A red stain was spotted growing on Lee's body and was quickly consuming the green spandex. Naruto didn't jump back into the contestant's box and instead made his way for the stairs. It was only after he was out of sight and within the hallway that he allowed his posture to slouch. A few more steps afterwards and he stumbled into the wall and clung to it for dear life in order to keep himself from falling over. He didn't hear her footsteps but he knew she was there, slowly making her way towards him. I was going to say it suits you right for antagonizing him, but you won so I guess I should be congratulating you. Good job Naruto. Naruto looked up to Anko and chuckled. Sorry, we know you told us not to, but... Save it. She shook her head. Bruises were beginning to form on his face and the shaking of his legs told her he needed rest, and help finding a place to rest. Come on. Anko held out her hand for him to grasp, knowing that offering her shoulder was out of the question with their size difference and carrying him there wasn't going to happen due to his pride. Naruto took a second to grab her hand and steady himself. Thanks. He merely said while he used his other hand to reach back to the back of his neck and pulled a tight mask over his face. The mask was midnight black except for the two white bug-like eyes. Anko merely assumed it was to hide his bruises but Naruto was simply ensuring his symbiote was covering his entire body and could work on slowly healing him. Kurenai, Kiba, and Haku waited for Anko to return and were shocked when Naruto returned with her. Naruto simply gave Haku and Kiba a nod before sitting next to Haku and laying back. Wake us up when it's our turn to fight again, was his request before allowing himself to sleep. Kurenai gave a worried look, you shouldn't let him sleep, he may have a concussion. It's okay, I checked already, Anko simply replied. Not that he would listen even if he did have one, stubborn jackass, she thought with a smile. Haku merely stared at Naruto's sleeping form. Observing the person who had beat him, spared him, and now even attempted to help him whether he wanted it or not. Fighting him had shown Haku that Naruto wasn't like most ninjas. Watching from the sidelines had revealed even more. At one time Zabuza had told Haku about a certain kind of ninjas and at the moment Haku couldn't help but replay those words through his head. If I had to categorize ninja, I'd put them into three different types. There are your jutsu types who rely on ninjutsu and genjutsu to fight. Then there are your hand-to-hand -hand types who use taijutsu and kenjutsu to fight. But the last type is the kind I consider the most dangerous. These ninjas rely on their wits in the midst of a battle. As ninja, we forget that something as simple as a kanai can kill us, but these last kind of ninja don't, and they make full use of that using any means they can. 
Most ninja realize this and try to imitate this by their veteran years, but it's like the saying goes, you can't teach an old dog can't learn new tricks. I've tried, but I don't have it in me. I find myself reverting back to old tactics more often than I do new ones. Haku I want you to become this third type of ninja. It's the best way you can serve as my tool, become what I can't and cover my weakness. Zabuza was right. You are dangerous, Naruto Uzumaki. With that thought Haku turned back towards the next fight once more. 23 minutes ago. You dumbass. Kakashi turned to see his male student, the one currently not fighting for his life, stand up and begin marching towards him. We warned you about Gara's status as a Jinchuriki so you could train him to survive the match. Not so he could kill him. Before Kakashi could begin to defend his action, Anko began yelling at him once more. The punk has just gotten the curse mark and what do you do? You give him an assassination jutsu? What were you thinking? I, have you thought about what could happen if Sasuke actually kills Gara? We don't even know if Gara's seal would hold up after death. The last thing we need within this arena is a four-story tall demon playing Godzilla with US. Naruto yelled adding more volume to his last three words. Blood. It's my B-L-O-O-O-D-D. Everyone's attention snapped towards the center of the arena and watched as Sasuke forcefully pulled his arm from the sphere of sand Gara had created around himself. Sasuke's arm wasn't the only thing to be pulled from the orb as what could only have been described as a bestial sand arm was dragged out as well. With one last tug, Sasuke freed himself from the sand's grip and watched along with the audience as it slithered back into the hole he created. While the last loyal Uchiha was recovering from his attack, Naruto and the others in the stand began to feel the effects of a genjutsu cast on them. Several of the ninja in the stand formed a quick hand sign and dispelled the sleep-inducing jutsu while Naruto simply ignored it, his symbiote already dispelling it. Looks like things are going to get hectic, Naruto stated. Present time outside the walls of Konoha Naruto swung through the forest he was in, giving up stealth so he could web-swing at greater speeds. He had already passed by Sasuke who had been given a head start against him. Luckily Tamari had set up traps and was acting as a deterrent so her brother could gain more distance from Pusuers. The symbiote bonded boy would admit to being impressed by Tamari. From what he could see, Tamari was tired from her previous fight, and instead of wasting what little chakra she had, she set up traps forcing Sasuke to watch his steps. As impressed as Naruto was, he had to acknowledge that right now Tamari was an enemy. While this was a fact that didn't mean that Naruto couldn't do the female sand nin a favor and not join the fight. So out of respect he continued onto his main goal and chased after Gara once more. The next interference came in the form of Konkuro. A quick fight with him showed that the puppet nin was more trouble than he was worth. Unfortunately Naruto couldn't simply attempt to turn his back on the cat dressed nin or else the puppet would cut into him with their poison coated blades and leave him in no shape to face Gara. As it was. He was still recovering from his fight with Lee and having something else slow him down was the last thing he needed. Luckily Shino showed up and decided to take Konkuro off his hands, something that Naruto was grateful for. A patch of red caught Naruto's attention mid-swing and a closer observation showed a large sand gourd. Having finally found his target, Naruto let go of the web he was swing from and allowed himself to fly forward. Thrusting his arms forward. Two small tendrils of symbiote shot forward and landed onto a tree branch in front of Gara. Gara became aware of the new presence behind him when the two black lines came from behind and went around him, but wasn't able to act on it as both of Naruto's feet slammed fiercely into his back and sent them free falling over the large branch. Naruto had easily shot another web-like tendril and guided himself to safety. Gara, on the other hand had only broken his fall by crashing onto one of the other large branches from the overgrown trees. Naruto stiffened when he felt demonic energy burst from Gara. He watched morbidly as the sand gourd on Gara's back morphed and began to favor his left side. The claw that had been dragged from the sand orb back in the Chunin exams arena began to show once more as it covered Gara's left arm. The sand didn't stop there as it began to crawl up the left side of his face until it had covered half of his face. When the metamorphosis was complete, Gara's face was a split between that of his human face and that of the demon inside of him, a glowing yellow eye with a pointed cross like iris and sharpened teeth filling a malicious grin. But the key feature of Gara was the blue tribal design spread across the sand. Yes. I and mother have been waiting for you. Let's see which of us can truly prove our existence. 
A swing of the sand-covered arm released several sand shurikens. Naruto had little trouble jumping over these as he charged towards Gara, but had received four long gashes across his abdomen from the sand ninja's claw. Ignoring the wound, Naruto laid a powerful hook across Gara's face. Hitting the exposed side of Gara's face had caused Gara recoiled. Unfortunately, Naruto had to jump back as his opponent's claw began flailing at odd and unpredictable motions. Naruto noted how the trees that were hit by Gara's claw were broken with such little resistance. Ducking under one of the wild swings, Naruto launched a series of punches and kicks while he was within range. A few attacks that had hit the sand covering Gara left Naruto's right arms and legs aching. He ignored the pain, however, as he was forced once more to dodge. That sand is too dense. Attacking it does little damage to him and leaves us open when recovering. Tired of being stationary, Gara leapt after Naruto. The blonde for his part changed tactics and used his symbiote tendrils to swing him to a safer spot. Looking back however showed that Gara was using a similar tactic to chase after him. The odd way the sand claw morphed and grabbed onto tree branches before swinging or pulling Gara closer to Naruto, thus forcing him to use an evasive maneuver. Having adjusted to the Sand Claw's attack pattern, Naruto made another attempt to get close and personal. Just as he was with range to land a powerful kick to Gara's face, he was forced once again to leap to the left as a new sand appendage came from behind Gara. After having put a safe distance between himself and Gara, Naruto looked back to find that the sand had now given Gara a grotesque sand tail similar to the claw he'd been attacking with. Damn it, just as we were getting used to the first one, Naruto whispered. Gara, having seen the agitation on Naruto's face, began laughing. What's wrong, Uzumaki? You angry that you and your other aren't capable of beating me? Having no choice, Naruto jumped back into the offensive, flipping, blocking, and attacking whenever he could. Naruto found himself hard pressed. The new sand appendage had given Naruto little chance to attack, but another problem was arising. Naruto was tiring. The symbiote had taken care of his bruises and had dulled the pain of his body to a small sting. But it could do nothing about his fatigue, and the small rest he had been given had restored little of his stamina. Right now he still had plenty of chakra, but his stamina was slowly depleting. The idea to use his snakes against Gara had crossed his mind, but he was unsure if they would be able to wrap around Gara without them being torn apart. Unlike Orochimaru, he wouldn't carelessly send his summons to their death. A whistling sound caught both Gara's and Naruto's ear and both looked towards Gara's blind side to see Sasuke throwing several kanai and shuriken flying towards the redhead. Gara simply grunted before raising the sand arm and expanding it to catch the metal projectiles. Gara looked between the two leaf nin and contemplated on who to attack first. After a moment, Gara turned his back on Naruto and laughed as he referred to Sasuke as fresh meat. Naruto for his was thankful for the chance to rest. Naruto. He spun in response to his name and saw Sakura make her way towards him with a small mutt following behind her. Naruto, what are you doing fighting against that monster so soon after your fight with Lee? Sakura asked with clear concern. Naruto shook his head. Don't worry about us, Sakura. Sasuke is the one you should be worried about. He was given a confused look. What do you mean? Sakura asked. I'm worried about him, but he hadn't fought as long or nearly as hard as you. Naruto didn't respond and merely thought over what his response would have been. He can't beat him, even if he is more rested. Only reason we felt we could stop him was because we know what he is, understand what he is capable of. They watched as Sasuke tried several methods to fight Gara, all of which failed except one move, his Chidori. But even that apparently wasn't enough as all he had done to Gara was cut through the sand claw, only for it to reform seconds later. He doesn't have our natural speed or reflexes. His jutsu may harm the parts that Gara has shielded, but he can't get close enough and truly hurt him. Naruto stopped his thoughts as he noticed Tamari hiding in another tree some ways off. Suddenly, getting up, Naruto gave a command. Stay here, Sakura, we'll be right back, said girl, only nodded as she watched Naruto disappear around the corner of the tree. She didn't like hiding in fear, but during times like this, where Gara had lost himself to his demon's bloodlust, she didn't have any choice but to hide from him. Tamari focused fully on the fight between her brother and Sasuke, amazed that Sasuke had managed to wound Gara twice by now. She would have been surprised even more had she shown up before Sasuke, 
but instead she had been given the pleasure of being captured by Naruto instead of watching him fight. Six black balls flew at her, pushed her back against the tree, and glued her in place. If it were not for the black substance that had covered her mouth she would have screamed, believing that Gara had noticed her and decided to finally end her life. Odd how the sight of Naruto made her feel relieved despite the look on his face projecting that this wasn't a joke. He reached up and ripped the black substance from her mouth. We're going to ask you only once. Do you know a way to knock Gara out? Tamari scrunched her face. She wasn't expecting someone to believe such a thing was possible. Shouldn't you be asking if there's a way to kill him? Her question was instantly rewarded with a hand around her throat. We could have killed him five times by now. Her eyes widened as his voice carried a tone implicating that he wasn't lying. Killing him could release the demon inside of him and that's something we want to avoid. So answer the question. Naruto tightened his grip around Tamari before releasing so she could speak. It took her a second to cough and regain her breath, but Tamari eventually began speaking. I don't know. This is the first time I've seen him actually hurt. Naruto cursed. He didn't detect any lies and seeing as Gara was a Jinchuriki, he didn't doubt that Gara was rarely hurt. He was about to question her further, but the same dark energy he felt back in the forest of death appeared and he turned to see Sasuke and Gara standing onto two tree branches parallel to each other and facing the opposite direction. It was obvious that the two had performed some do or die moment and were simply waiting to feel the damage, if any, that were done to them. Gara's sand arm fell off and Sasuke fell to his knees covered in the strange flame markings as before. Gara was the first to recover and had even replaced his claw though it was now on the opposite arm. He turned around and without hesitating, leapt towards Sasuke in another attempt to end the Uchiha's life. Naruto would have left Sasuke to his fate, but out of the corner of his eyes he noticed Sakura running in to save Sasuke. While he did not like everything Sakura did he couldn't simply watch her be torn apart either. The breather he had gotten thanks to Sasuke's interference had helped somewhat and given him some strength back. With a burst of speed he was able to meet Gara halfway and kick him across the face. The demon bond ninja was forced to use his tail to redirect his fall and land upon one of the branches. You again, he snarled, saliva dripping from his lips. S again. Naruto merely stated as he reached over and tore a branch from the tree. It was a rather large piece of wood easily as thick as his arm and twice as long. At this point Naruto didn't care what it took to take down Gara, even if that meant beating the boy into a coma. Gara used his two sand appendages to hold onto the branch he stood on and pulled himself back in order to launch himself towards Naruto. The blonde simply waited at the last second before ducking to the side and slamming his wooden club into the back of Gara's skull. He didn't let it end there either as he leapt after Gara and proceeded to hit him across the head again and again, causing him to fall back with each fierce blow. Gara had finally had enough and morphed once more. Now the sand that covered half of him began to devour the rest and replaced what was left of Gara's humanity with his demon's bloodlust. Naruto had attempted to club Gara over the head once more, but the branch in his hands broke, obviously having passed its limits. Before he could respond to his weapons, Destruction. Naruto found himself grabbed by both of Gara's claws and felt himself being crushed. Mother shall enjoy your death, now give us your blood, Gara yelled. Naruto struggled to break free from the grip he was ensnared in and only managed to pull one of his arms freed. He didn't know what he could accomplish with his next move, but the thought of being crushed to death without resisting in some form or other wasn't an option. So instead he thrust his bald fist forward and shot a glob of his symbiote at Gara's face. The black-clad blonde was more than surprised when Gara released him in favor of trying to rid his face of the black gunk. His shock didn't last long and he leapt back while performing a few hand seals and thrust both fists forward this time. Just like his fight with Lee, Naruto's sleeves bulged before releasing a torrent of snakes. The black snakes flew towards Gara and quickly wrapped themselves around the red head, allowing Naruto to swing under the branch his opponent stood on and land upside down. Once secured and safely planted, Naruto pulled as hard as he could, grunting as he forced more and more of his strength onto his snakes. The symbiote covered snakes hiss as they felt the strain on them increase but didn't break. With the symbiote covering them, they, just as Naruto was, were strengthened by the alien suit. Gara finally relented to Naruto's pull and found himself being rocketed down to the forest floor. 
Naruto watched Gara break nearly every branch he came in contact with before finally hitting the forest floor. Once the sand covered Nin had finally hit the ground and didn't seem like he was able to get up Naruto let out a tired sigh and prepared to head back to Konoha. He was quickly stopped however when a scream filled the air. There's no way I could lose, not like this. A large tower of sand quickly crawled towards the sky, destroying much in its way. A dust cloud had formed and blocked what the sand had formed. Landing onto one of the few remaining trees that were closest to him, Naruto laid Tamari onto the branch. During his moment of fleeing from the large quantity of sand he noticed Tamari still bond to a tree. Some form of guilt rose in him and he raced to free her from her bonds. His kind act had cost him though and part of the sand wave had caught him, leaving several bloodied skid marks all over his body. Tamari was too shocked by his chivalrous act and couldn't offer the thanks he deserved. His voice broke her out of her stupor and reminded her of the situation they were in. Any chance you can offer any suggestions, cause this is the worst possible outcome. Tamari shaking followed Naruto's sight and found what she prayed she wouldn't. The dust cloud had dissipated and in its place was the one-tailed sand demon in all its glory. You best get out of here. We can't protect you and ourselves. Naruto mentioned before jumping from the tree he was on and ricocheting off various trees as a flood of sand began to give chase to him. Naruto wasn't stupid, he knew he couldn't outrun the sand forever and decided to send a mental command to his symbiote. The right sleeve of his shirt rippled before crawling up his arm and exposing his skin. On his forearm were various seals, all meant for one thing, summoning. A digit of his left hand began to bleed thanks to the symbiote cutting him and Naruto proceeded to wipe the blood down his arm and along the tattoo-like seal. Afterwards all he had to do was pump the necessary chakra and a plum of smoke similar to the dust cloud Gara had created minutes earlier appeared. Gara had ceased his attack on Naruto, curious in what the blonde had brought forth to even the playing field. The cloud of smoke dissipated and revealed Naruto standing atop a large sapphire snake. The snake stared at the evenly sized one-tailed demon before hissing its protest. It's been ages since I've been summoned, and the first thing I find myself fighting is one of the tailed beast. Just shut it. You think we want to fight this thing any more than you do? Naruto bellowed back. Once more the richly blue snake hissed. I had heard we had a new summoner, but I hadn't realized he was one so young. As if our age has anything to do with our current predicament. Now are you going to help us out here or not? Naruto responded. The snake shook its head, forcing Naruto to cling to it with his chakra. There is no reason to respond so negatively, I was merely stating an observation of your age. As far as helping you, I see no problem with it, might as well seeing as I've been summoned. Interesting. Gara spoke from within his demon. Maybe for once, I can unleash my full power. Both the snake and his summoner quit their talk and looked towards the giant sand demon. A small spot in particular gathered their attention as they saw Gara raising half of his body from it and began forming hand signs. Naruto stood on edge prepared for an attack to come forth while his summon merely flicked his forked tongue out. Gara falling asleep wasn't what Naruto expected but he instantly became aware of just how bad that was when the demon's true voice came out. Naruto's eyes opened slowly. The visage of a white ceiling confused him and the repetitive beeping off to his side annoyed him. He attempted to sit up but immediately abandoned the idea for the moment when pain racked his body. It was then that he remembered the end result from fighting Gara, Remembered how his summon had helped him fight the giant sand demon Gara had become and how he finally succeeded in waking Gara only to knock him to a near unconscious state. Afterwards his summon returned to its home and he proceeded to move towards Gara. He could still clearly recall Gara fearfully screaming about his existence being destroyed along with the fact that Naruto's strength had to come from fighting for himself and the words of advice Naruto had given before passing out. He still didn't understand what had caused him to begin speaking. Do you really think we could have fought you if we were only fighting for ourselves? Gara? it's only because we're fighting for those dear to us that we were able to drag ourselves out here and fight you to this point. We're exhausted and have been since the start of this fight. Anyone fighting for themselves would have passed out long ago in our condition. With his thoughts ending he tried once more to get up, halfway succeeding before something pushed him back done. Geez stay down already, you've been knocked out for the last two days. Naruto snapped his head towards Anko. Bewildered by both the fact that he hadn't even sensed her and also that she was taking the time to visit him in the hospital. 
Hey Anko, what are you doing here? Naruto asked. Anko seemed to take his question as an insult. What, I can't visit a friend? Naruto quickly shook his head and corrected his mistake. No, of course you can visit us. He replied feeling odd to be referred to as a friend. Anko chuckled. Well I guess I have ulterior motives seeing as I don't want to help clean up the mess that invasion caused onto the village. Naruto began chuckling with her. Oh man, how much damage was caused. A few buildings flattened, part of the main gate walls knocked down, oh and debris littering the streets, she stated nonchalantly. Naruto's laugh got even louder. Oh god, the old man must be buried in paperwork. Suddenly he found himself laughing alone and the fact wasn't missed on him. Anko? She didn't say anything and her silence only caused him to panic. Anko, what has happened? She still didn't answer him. Jumping up and out of his bed as if he wasn't critically injured, Naruto grabbed Anko by her trench coat and lifted her from her seat to bring her face to face. Anko tell me now, what the hell has happened, he screamed to her face. Part of him knew the answer though the rest of him refused to believe it, not until he heard it from someone's lips. Two days later the weather seemed to reflect the mood cast upon the village and released several droplet of water from its darkened clouds. The funeral held for Sarutobi Hiruzen was visited by all except for Naruto. No Naruto stayed as far away from the gathering as long as the numerous people were gathered around the grave, he refused to let anyone see him grieve. He was back in his leather jacket and pants and had several bandages wrapped around his face to cover his still recovering injuries. Once he was sure that all the villagers and ninja alike had left, he made his way towards the grave of one of the few people he had ever truly liked. Once he had arrived there however, Naruto noticed that someone else had shared his plan. He did nothing to hide his presence and Anko heard him approaching, quickly wiping her tears away before facing him. Naruto turned around once more respecting her right to grieve alone as much as he did and began to leave. Naruto. Thanks but I'm done. You can stay now. He didn't say a word and merely nodded. He made his way closer and closer to the center of where the funeral was held, trembling being the only sign of his true feelings. Enko watched him for a few minutes before leaving in a gust of leaves. The second she left, Naruto fell to his knees, his trembling turning into a tremor and the tears in his eyes began flowing freely down his face. A small book fell from the pocket of his jacket and landed against the muddy ground. The splash caused by the diary Serutobi had left him in his will reminded Naruto of the real reason one of his closest and only friends had been taken from him and the world. Naruto shook once more except this time it was out of hate and anger. The dairy Serutobi had left him was full of secrets about Konoha and his decisions he made in life. Serutobi's gift to Naruto was all of Konoha and his secrets, it was easy for Naruto to see the trust he was given in receiving this gift. Naruto had spent the last two days reading over the book, as it was the only thing he could do to take his mind off of his despair. But now his despair was being replaced by rage. Rage at the fact that Serutobi's decision to spare Orochimaru had been repaid by the very student to return and cause his demise. He picked up the book with shaking fingers and pocketed it back into his jacket before walking closer to the grave. Looking at the picture of the person he had so fondly called old man didn't help quail his rage. A metaphoric string in Naruto seemed to snap and he released his rage in the form of a roar only stopping once he no longer had air to use. Orochimaru we will make you pay, no not just you, all missing nin. We shall become the poison to your traitorous ways. We will become venom. It had been nearly three weeks since Orochimaru's invasion, and Naruto was finding himself with one problem after another. After his grief had dulled, it had occurred to him that he had not seen Haku since the exams. He had tried visiting the mental health ward of the hospital but found that the room Haku had previously occupied was empty. And checking with the front desk clerk showed that he wasn't listed anywhere within the hospital itself. After searching through the village for several days, Naruto concluded that Haku had used the invasion as a way to escape the village. He felt bad that Haku had left but understood that if Haku did not truly want help then there was nothing more he could do. Shortly afterwards a tall white-haired pervert by the name of Jiraiya had dragged him off to find a new Hokage. This had been a large annoyance to Naruto and had found himself becoming angry when he discovered who would be replacing Hiruzen as Hokage and the spite she carried for her old homeland. But that was in the past, 
and right now Naruto was relaxing on a tree limb while Anko was sitting on a park bench down below enjoying some dango. Naruto began telling Anko about his trip to find Tsunade in order to pass the time and also to make her laugh at how he had troubled Orochimaru during the fight between the Sanin. We don't really see what's so great about the Sanin that would garner the respect most ninja give them. After we found Tsunade, days later Jiraiya had a sedative slipped into his drink by Tsunade while she cowered in fear covered in blood that wasn't even her own. Then there is Orochimaru who runs away at every opportunity. Anko picked up a cup and took a sip of her drink before speaking. When they were together they made an unbeatable team that had helped us greatly back in the third ninja world war. Add to the fact that they all have contracts with different summons and are some of the leaf's most powerful ninja, there's where their respect is earned. Naruto shook his head. We still would believe that their personality quirks would cause some loss in respect. Anko began laughing. Naruto had a point there. With Tsunade drinking constantly and an addiction to gambling, Jiraiya being a peeping Tom pervert, and Orochimaru being a traitor to Konoha, one would think that the amount of respect they were given would have diminished. Well enough about them, let's get back to what happened during the trip. Now where did we leave off? Naruto said as he began to think. You were fighting Kabuto. Anko pointed out. Naruto gave a feral grin. Oh yeah, that's right. One week ago a grass field some distance from Tanzaku town marked the fight between Orochimaru, Tsunade, and their assistants. Naruto and Jiraiya had arrived in time to turn the tide, but with Jiraiya still suffering from the sedative he had been slipped and Shizun tending to the fear paralyzed Tsunade, the fight had simply been brought back to a stalemate. Naruto was pushing his limits to keep even with Kabuto. The purple-clad spy was proving that he was far stronger than a genin. He had years of experience against him and was clever as well. Using his chakra scalpel, he was able to sever ligaments and muscle tissue needed in order move limbs. But Naruto wasn't simply standing by and allowing Kabuto to cripple him as he fought back by aiming bone shatter attacks towards Kabuto's joints and vital organs. The problem the two were running into is that they couldn't kill the other fast enough before they recovered. Kabuto thanks to his self-healing jutsu and Naruto thanks to the symbiote repairing the damage done to him. Shizun had finally wiped off enough blood for Tsunade to fight and Orochimaru noticing this called Kabuto back to him. It soon became apparent to Naruto what was going to happen when he saw both Tsunade and Jiraiya bite the tip of their thumbs. He quickly pulled up his sleeve to reveal his summoning tattoo and swipe blood along it, acting with the urgency that came with the concept of a race against time. Four giant clouds of smoke appeared and slowly dissipated. Jiraiya appeared on top of a large red toad wearing a blue vest. Tsunade appeared on top of a giant white slug with a light blue stripe running down its back. Orochimaru stood atop a bronx colored snake, gawking at the snake below him before turning a rage filled glare to Kabuto. You were supposed to summon Manda. Kabuto looked down at the snake he and Orochimaru were on in disbelief. What's going on? I know for a fact that I had used enough chakra to summon the snake boss. The three Sanins turned their attention to where the final cloud of smoke had been and had found where the infamous strongest colossal serpent was located under Naruto. Naruto let out a roaring laugh in success of having summoned Manda before Orochimaru and Kabuto. The large snake below him finally let its displeasure be known. Who are you and what makes you believe that I would serve you? We are Naruto. And we don't expect you to serve no one. As far as we are concerned you could just go bake on the grass. Manda's response was instant, then why have I been summoned? Because we want you out of Orochimaru's use, Naruto stated proudly. A few seconds passed as Manda allowed what he had been told to sink in. The Sanins and their summons had begun their fight long ago. You're not a part of Orochimaru's group? Manda asked as he initially believed that he had been summoned to aid Orochimaru against his former teammates. No, we summoned you so that you couldn't fight alongside him. As long as we have you summoned, he can't. The colossal snake began chuckling. The chuckling soon turned into a snicker and eventually grew into a boisterous laughter. The snake charmer himself is out summoned by a child three times younger than himself. You realize that he will make you pay for this. Naruto's face instantly turned to a hate filled scowl. Then we welcome his anger, for we are only starting to be a thorn in his side. Manda sensed the hate within Naruto's voice and the sides of his jaw creased up in a mimic of a devilish smile. 
Hem, it seems like there is conflict amongst the snake summoners. The malevolence in his voice grew. Very well, I accept you as one of our summoners, but I cannot assist you in your fight against Orochimaru or any other being that has a contract with his snakes, no matter how much I'd like to devour his cowardly hide. Afterwards Tsunade and Jiraiya had driven Orochimaru away and we began heading back to Konoha. Naruto said while Anko was still laughing. Apparently she took as much joy in Naruto screwing over Orochimaru as Manda did. We love the way she laughs. His eyes widened as he questioned the choice in words he used in his thought. He shook his head and passed his word choice off as a mere misuse of expression. Suddenly an Anbu dropped down and appeared before the two. Anko quickly whipped the tears out of her eyes before addressing the masked nin. How may I help you? Actually I'm here in order to inform Naruto Uzumaki that the Hokage wants him at her office immediately, the Anbu said before disappearing. Naruto shook his head. Sorry Anko, but the old bitch has summoned me. Anko let out a sigh. You know, you should really show her more respect. If you had seen what we saw Anko, you wouldn't be able to respect her either, he said before heading off towards the Hokage Tower. New Hokage or not, Naruto wasn't going to change his routine of entering the Hokage office. So he once again began crawling his way towards the window. Entering through the window had caused Tsunade to send a glare. You sure you're not Jiraiya's student? She asked. Naruto ignored the question and made his way towards the front of the desk. You summoned us, Hokage. He said while forcing the word Hokage. Naruto understood that Konoha needed a leader and a strong one at that, but he couldn't accept anyone else as the Hokage, not so soon after Hiruzen's demise. The thought of the old man caused the mask on his face to reflect a somber look and he unconsciously gripped the diary located in the inner pocket of his jacket. I summoned you here because of a last request written in my deceased sensei's will. He asked that the next Hokage promote a single genin in the case that he himself was unable to. I don't believe I'll need to mention who that genin is. A smile grew on Naruto's face and he nodded to show she was right. I'll be honest. After reading the reports concerning the Chunin exams and the notes left by the examiners, I don't feel that you are deserving of a promotion. But the third had written down on his will several skills and qualities that he felt qualified you to be a Chunin. Before the new Hokage could continue, a knock on the door was heard. Lady Hokage, I've returned with that package you sent me to retrieve. The voice belonging to Shizun explained. Come in Shizun. Said Tsunade. The door opened slightly and Shizun walked through and handed over a green scroll to Tsunade. Naruto tried to catch any signs on the scroll that would indicate its purpose, but was distracted from his observation when Tsunade began speaking again. He really liked you, you know that. She stated, my sensei hasn't always done the right thing, but he always meant the best, and so I'll follow his wishes. Tsunade unrolled the scroll in her hands and revealed a storage seal. Pumping chakra through it caused a plum of smoke to appear and dissipate shortly afterwards. After the smoke was gone a single custom-made chunin vest was visible. Instead of being green, the vest was midnight black and even had an exact copy of Naruto's spider emblem stitched into it. Seeing that his attention was glued onto the vest, Tsunade decided to regain his attention. He paid for this to be custom-made out of his own pocket instead of simply giving you one of the mass-produced vests. It's rare that a ninja is given such a thing. Cherish it and congratulations on becoming a chunin, Naruto Uzumaki, she said before handing him the vest along with the scroll that contained the documents of his promotion. Thank you, he said in a near whisper before taking the items from her. He quickly replaced his jacket with the chunin vest, zipping up the front to keep it closed unlike how he wore his jacket. Afterwards he placed the scroll snug into one of the many pockets in the vest before slinging his jacket over his shoulder. You're dismissed Uzumaki. Tsunade stated before preparing to sign a few papers. Naruto simply nodded and headed out the window. Tsunade simply shook her head. At least he closes the window when he leaves. Two weeks later Sakura was becoming worried about her team. Ever since the invasion, nothing seemed the same. Naruto had changed. He had stayed mute to them and had completely ignored Sasuke. Originally she believed that it was this simple change that had caused the negative feeling that seemed to float around whenever she was with her team. But as time passed, Naruto began to seem more like his old self. But Sasuke started to become angrier and distant. 
It had all started when Naruto had shown up wearing a chunin vest and Kakashi had verified that Naruto had indeed been promoted along with Shikamaru. Sasuke had acted like he didn't care about it, but she could tell it had bothered him. Sakura had tried to reason with him that the invasion had prevented Sasuke from showing his full capabilities in front of the judges. Unfortunately this had only seemed to insult the Uchiha and he had snapped at her, telling her not to patronize him. It only got worse as Naruto continued to ignore Sasuke's presence. Before where Naruto would make an insulting comment, Sasuke had shown irritation and responded with an insult of his own. But now he felt that Naruto considered him as little more than a stray dog on the road. This idea had been cemented further by the fact that Sasuke had challenged Naruto to a fight, trying to antagonize Naruto with various belittling comments. But Naruto had passed by Sasuke without even a glance back or word to show he even heard him. It had been a shot to his pride that had left him furious. Sakura feared that Sasuke would have attacked Naruto while his back was turned if their sensei had not been present. She had gone to Kakashi time and time again trying to find some way to repair the damage that had occurred in the team's ability to work together, but the lazy Nin had simply stated that things would settle down and that the two were simply bothered by events during the invasion. Her sensei's words didn't help her feel any better, and while the team she had been assigned to could hardly be called that it was still her team, and she didn't want to see it break apart. So here she was, walking towards Naruto's house during the late hours of the night, she was hoping to talk with Naruto and convince him to at least acknowledge her and Sasuke's presence. And that's when she saw him. He stood alone, facing away from her and silent. The look on his face told her that he had just made a decision, one she felt she would be uncomfortable with. Sasuke? She asked, unsure if it was truly him. He turned to her in response. The next day Black Boots kicked off the ground as Naruto pushed his limits in speed as he pursued the group of Sound Nin and his teammate. It had been odd waking up to the sound of someone banging on his door. Being jerked from his sleep had put him in a foul mood and the only thing that had stopped him from tearing the person knocking on his door a new asshole was the recognition of Sakura's panicked voice begging him to be home. It only took her mere seconds to explain between sobs about Sasuke's defection and even less time for Naruto to disappear to his room long enough for his symbiote to form his leather jacket, pants, as well as his spider-marked shirt and teeth-imprinted mask. Naruto you have to stop him, but please, I'm begging you, don't kill him. The thought echoed through his mind just as he caught sight of his target. Later that day. This is just too damn troublesome. Why is Sasuke attempting leave us for Otto? Said Shikamaru running through the forest while being followed by the team Tsunade had him form. The team had been constructed for the sole purpose of tracking Sasuke Uchiha down before he reached the border of Otto. Shikamaru looked back to look over his unit. He had Kiba there as a tracker and Neji so they weren't ambushed. The beauty of this was that Neji and Kiba could work in junction and prove without a doubt where Sasuke was. Then he had Choji with him as, well he just preferred him as a partner. They worked on the same team and trusted each other better than they would others. There had only been one person that he had wanted on the team but couldn't find. Damn it, I wish Sakura would have gone to Tsunade first about Sasuke instead of Naruto. Well at least she had gotten him to promise not to kill the traitor. Shikamaru, there is something up ahead, looks like a corpse, Neji stated. Having been warned, Shikamaru gave a sign for them to slow down. Once they arrived at the edge the clearing Shikamaru waited till Kiba and Neji gave the affirmative that no one else was around. Walking up to the corpse Shikamaru noticed that the orange-haired, large-built corpse wore a sound headband. Several purple splotches covered his body and blood dripped from his mouth as a thick stain. Neji activated his Byakugan for a closer inspection. His skeleton is a mess. Just about all his bones are broken or fractured. Death was most likely internal bleeding but a hard hit to the heart could have caused it to stop as well. Geez who could have done this to him and why? Kiba asked. Troublesome. The only person I can think that has this brutality and strength is Naruto, at least on our side. We should move on. Chances are Naruto is still chasing after Sasuke and apparently he has back up as well. Shikamaru said while pointing at the deceased Otto Nin. Naruto leapt upward off the tree branch he stood on and grasped another in time to angle his body out of the way of the bronze like boomerangs thrown at him. Once onto the new branch, Naruto redirected his gaze back towards the sound Nin that stood before him. 
He wore garbs that had matched his previous opponent and had six arms instead of the natural two other humans had. Oddly enough the man looked similar in appearance to Uruka and even held his hair back in a high ponytail. The man snarled from having missed the black-clad spider nin once more. Stop jumping around and just die already. Naruto jumped behind a tree and instantly camouflaged himself, forming the mask he had used after the chunin exams to ensure total invisibility. He let out a dark chuckle while stealthily moving closer to the sound nin. We would have thought that you would be enjoying yourself. It's not every day that you would be able to fight a fellow spider, he said while making sure to throw his voice in order to hide his position. The six armed man scanned the area before jumping into some foliage for cover. Naruto, who had witnessed the act, had to stifle his laughter. The fool believes that he is hidden from us. A poor assumption, he thought before joining the Otto Nin. The sound of the leaves shuffling were his only clue that he had been found before a black covered fist had collided with his face. Naruto had aimed his punch so the Otto Nin would be sent falling down where no tree limbs would break his fall. He'll either hit the ground hard enough to break every bone in his body or use a large amount of chakra to save himself. Either way this fight gets easier for me. A thick string of webbing had been shot out of the Otto Nin's arms only for Naruto to swing by on his own black thread and rip them apart. Having lost his safety lines and seeing Naruto sitting by, preparing to repeat his last action. The Otto Nin bit his finger before performing three hand seals. Naruto watched as a thick cloud of smoke formed around his opponent and his eyes widened when he saw a large black spider with the Otto Nin on top. The spider seemed to be a tarantula by the hair on its body and the thickness of its legs compared to the rest of its body. Two thick orange lines ran down all three parts of its body. Naruto camouflaged himself once more before moving to a new position, instead of moving towards the Otto Nin. He moved a bit further away and behind a group of people waiting in ambush. They went that way. Naruto stated while pointing. Shikamaru and the others instantly turned around. Neji was the first to speak. Are you certain? Naruto moved his pointed finger into a new direction. That tree is marked to point out the direction. Before our fight with this guy started, we broke a tree limb pointing in the direction the Otto Nin went and covered it with our webbing. He's telling the truth. Neji confirmed. Shikamaru nodded his head. Good, then after we finish this guy off we'll continue the chase. Not necessary. Naruto objected. He waited till the rest of them had his attention. We alone can handle him while you continue to chase after Sasuke. We don't know for certain how fast they can travel and if they get too much distance we'll never catch them before they cross the border. He saw that Neji was about to object. We've been fighting him okay on our own. There are still two Otto Nin escorting Sasuke. If you can catch up with them you'll have them outnumbered but if you stay here and fight with us that chance will be smaller and smaller. He could see that none of them liked the idea and Shikamaru cemented this with his next statement. We outnumber this guy 5 to 1. If you've been doing so well against him on your own then we can quickly finish this up and head out. Naruto shook his head. He's too cunning for numbers to work against him. Even if we did attack him all at once he would simply target the slowest of us and take that person hostage. Even if we did manage to free the hostage we'll be too busy trying to cover each other to fight him effectively. And besides, he's a coward but a smart coward. Even now he is setting up traps and setting the stage to his advantage instead of chasing me. Neji activated his Byakugan. He's right. The area is covered in chakra. Troublesome. Fine we'll do it your way. Shikamaru said before ordering the others to follow him. Naruto nodded before making his way back towards the Otto Nin. It wasn't hard to find him or to be more specific, the battleground he prepared. The area was covered in webs from the forest floor to the canopy. The large spider had positioned itself above, hanging from one of the new formed webs while baby versions of it descended and crawled around their new territory. The Otto Nin was not within sight as far as Naruto or his symbiote could see. Done chatting with your friends, echoed the nin's voice. Naruto chuckled. So you knew? Of course I knew. You haven't retreated once during this fight. Why else would you do so now? He knew there was more to it but that, but Naruto didn't persist and instead veered towards another topic. So you've set the stage. One fitting for our kind. Naruto's booming laughter had caused many of the spiders to stop their movement. Our kind? You're sadly mistaken if you believe to be one of us you lack the bite. 
The once calm voice turned heated after that remark. We'll see who lacks bite once you're left paralyzed and fed upon. This game is over. Back in Konoha, interrogation department due to her occupation as an interrogator, Anko Midarashi had been one of the few people to be warned about Sasuke's defection or his current attempt at defecting. She was looking forward to interrogating the overprivileged snot. Then again she didn't know if there would be anything left to interrogate thanks to the fact that Sakura ran to Naruto first about Sasuke. She still didn't know if that was a stupid decision or smart one. On one hand Naruto was the closest chunin, knew the target well, and would help reduce how much of a head start Sasuke got from the village. But then again everyone knew that Naruto was looking for the first chance to kill Sasuke and get away with it, becoming a defecting nin did just that. If Naruto did kill Sasuke, there would be absolutely nothing that the council or the Hokage for that matter could do about it. Even if they did attempt to punish him there would be several fellow chunin and Jonin that would support his action and speak up for him. I wonder if he'll really keep his promise to Sakura, she said aloud. Ibiki gave his co-worker a curious glance, what are you mumbling about? A few of the other nins nearby perked up and listened in. Anko chuckled. You guys know about the Uchiha brat going rouge last night? Several nodded or gave a verbal confirmation to show that they did hear about it. Well a team had been formed by the Hokage and sent out a couple of hours ago to retrieve our wayward Uchiha, but before that the one to discover our new missing nin was his teammate Sakura Haruno and she had gone to her other teammate's house and begged him to chase after and bring the Uchiha back. The name of this teammate is, she paused for suspense. Naruto Uzumaki. PSSSH the Uchiha's fucked, said one of the nearby nins. Ibiki nodded his head in agreement. Anko decided to fill them in on her earlier remark. I would normally agree, but Sakura had Naruto promise not to kill him so I'm not so sure if Naruto will keep his promise or not. Come on. This is a no-brainer. The Uzumaki has been using the Uchiha as his anger management crutch since their early years in the academy. Now that the Uchiha has gone and become legitimate rouge, there is nothing stopping Uzumaki from murdering the guy. Another nin stated. Ibiki decided to cut in. I don't know. Naruto has shown loyalty to his village and teammates. He had a good chance to kill Sasuke during their rank mission in Wave. Or at the very least allow the Uchiha to die by the hands of that ice user he brought back. Yeah that's true. Anko stated. The nin from before scoffed. The only reason Uzumaki didn't drown the Uchiha in a nearby lake during that mission was because it could still have gotten him in trouble. The other nin began murmuring with each other on the possibility of the Uchiha dying today. All right if you're so confident then why don't you put your money where your mouth is? Everyone's attention turned to Ibiki and the wallet he held up. $60 says Naruto brings Sasuke back, alive. He said before pulling out the mentioned amount and placing it on a nearby table. Anko broke out into feral grin. I'll add to that. 80 on Naruto returning with the Uchiha alive. She added onto the table. The nin from before didn't seem phased. All right, 60 on the Uzumaki returning with the Uchiha as a bloody corpse. The other nins began making their own bets and Anko grabbed one of the random clipboards lying around, ripping off the current page and began scribbling down the bets on the fresh page. Come on Naruto, this could be an easy 12 servings of Dango. Back with Naruto he had taken care of the miniature spiders dodged the onslaught of trap triggered kanai that the spider auto nin kept unleashing and even succeeded in killing the enormous spider that continued to spawn the miniatures so how is it that he found himself stuck on a large tree branch his arms being pulled back by all six arms of the spider auto nin and whom had transformed into a demon incarnate like the previous auto nin the man had transformed into a red demon with a third eye his build had slightly increased and his hair had turned gray and doubled in size Pushing his foot down onto the spine of the half-kneeled symbiote bonded Nin, the auto Nin's grin broadened as he heard Naruto's pain-filled grunt. We were careless, should have never allowed ourselves to be lured towards the spot he was shooting from. Naruto closed his eyes as he focused, not that his opponent could see this past the mask he wore. Slowly Naruto began putting more and more effort into bending his arms forward. The auto Nin's smile faded as the tide was turning at a painfully slow but definite pace. The muscle of his biceps, triceps, and forearm bulged while his entire upper body violently trembled. Kitamaru couldn't believe this fight had lasted this long. 
It was bad enough that one of Konoha's nins had pushed him so far but a kid at that. He thought for sure that once he entered his second cursed seal form that things would have been settled. Creating his bow and readying his arrow, he had been prepared to finish the little spider look alike. But black clad nin had disappeared once more and he didn't know where the kid was till he got within a few feet of him. It had been sheer luck that he had lured the leaf nin to one of his sniper spots before ambushing him. The struggle would have been over in a minute had it not been for the freakish strength the boy possessed. He wouldn't have been able to hold onto the nin had it not been for his additional arms. How the hell does he still have more strength? He couldn't help but shout in his head. Having felt that enough was enough, Kitamaru gathered chakra in his mouth and used it to form an arrow in his mouth. It slid out a ways before stopping. He knew he wouldn't be able to jam it into the nin with just his mouth. The black goo as he began to think of it that covered the leaf nin was similar to leather and wouldn't be penetrated easily. So instead he readied himself to remove one of his hands from the arms they held to jam his weapon into the skull of his enemy. All right. One, two, three. Now, Kitamaru's plan proved to be a mistake for as soon as his one of his left hands removed themselves, Naruto put his full body weight on his left side. This had resulted in Naruto lurching forward with his left shoulder and dragging Kitamaru with him. Just as it seemed like they would both fall over, Naruto jerked back, smashing his head into Kitamaru's bottom jaw. The sound of metal breaking followed by a guttering scream resounded through the forest. Naruto didn't care about this as he shot a thread of web and swung himself to another tree. As he landed against the bark, he turned back to face Kitamaru but found the man no longer there. He kept his back to the tree as he thoroughly scanned the forest for any sign of his enemy. Can't let him get the drop on us again. Naruto thought as he slowly blended in with his surroundings. Just as he finished applying his camel fidge, he heard the sound similar to a whistle. Eyes widened as he recognized the sound far too easily and leapt from the tree. A gold arrow tore through the spot he once occupied, leaving a gnarled hole. So he's gone back to using his bow. Better move slowly. Don't know how but he can spot us with that third eye open when we move too fast. Naruto was careful to move from tree to tree without disturbing the leaves too much. Several problems were occurring as he searched for Kitamaru. The main problem revolved around the fact that he didn't know where exactly the man was hiding. They were both searching for each other. Both keeping a keen eye constantly observing their surroundings. Naruto's eyes snapped onto a few leaves that floated slowly to the forest floor. Though this was a sign that Kitamaru was getting either sloppy or impatient, Naruto didn't smile. Last time he had jumped at the chance to take out Kitamaru and it had nearly cost him his life. Now though he would take his time and ensure that victory was his before attempting to claim it. He stayed at what he considered was a safe distance away while moving to a better spot to view the location where the leaves feel from. He stopped once he found Kitamaru and understood how the leaves fell. Kitamaru was suspended midair by five white threads that extended from his hands and attached themselves to various tree limbs. This allowed him easier maneuverability as all he needed to do was let go of one web and form another one to pull himself to another direction. Oddly he had his bow stabled by his hand while he used his mouth and feet to pull the string of the bow back. Naruto was confident in his ability to sneak up on Kitamaru and kill him in one swift move. Unfortunately if the slightest thing went wrong as he went for the kill, accidentally rustling leaves, the bark beneath him giving out, or even Kitamaru's paranoia going off. Then it would take even longer for him to locate him again or worse Kitamaru put an arrow through his heart. A plan formed in his head and he formed a single hand seal. It wasn't an extravagant plan or even brilliant. But it will do, he thought as a mud clone formed next to him. Without a single word the clone began moving elsewhere but out of Kitamaru's sight. Naruto on the other hand moving higher though closer to Kitamaru's location. Once he was on the branch several feet above his enemy he stopped and positioned himself upside down and on the lower part of it. Naruto propelled himself forward the second Kitamaru shot his clone. He intended to simply pounce on the man and snap his neck, a simple plan but as he thought early, it will do. To Naruto's annoyance, Kitamaru's shock didn't last long and he immediately checked his blind spots. His initial two eyes were unable to spot Naruto from above, but he the third demonic eye caught a mere glance of him. Unfortunately this mere glance caused the other two eyes to focus directly onto Naruto. Kitamaru quickly aimed his bow and formed another arrow in his mouth. Naruto on the other hand quickly thrust his fist forward, sending two globs of his symbiote forward. 
Having succeeded in blinding his opponent, Naruto smiled though this didn't last long as a searing pain erupted from his left shoulder blade. The hanging spider Nin's aim had been thrown off thanks to the gunk blocking his vision but not by much. So instead of bleeding to death from his heart, Naruto found himself with blood dripping down his now limp useless arm. He looked back at Kitamaru to find the man still suspended by his threads of web and quickly reformed his plan. Instead of grabbing his enemy's neck and snapping it, Naruto instead angled himself so that his right arm hooked around Kitamaru's neck. The spider threads were unable to support both of their weight and quickly snapped, sending the two to plummet towards the forest floor. Much like his threads, Kitamaru's neck snapped as soon as they came in contact with one of the many tree branches. Naruto slowly peeled himself from the bark having unfortunately received little cushion from the Otto Nin's body. Looking towards his diseased enemy, Naruto was proud to have found the man reverting to his human form only this time his neck hung loose at an odd angle. Nearly an hour later after his fight Naruto had located his marked tree and continued the hunt. There was nothing more that he could do about the hole in his shoulder than to have his symbiote fill it, hopefully clotting it long enough for the flesh to heal. His left arm was still useless which prevented him from web swinging through the forest. As he went, he discovered the others off in their own fight, he chose not to help them due to the fact that the sand siblings from Suna were present and even helping them. Naruto wouldn't question it for now, it wasn't important and he was more interested in catching up with Sasuke. Naruto's sudden stop would have confused any that witnessed it, but his eyes saw clear signs of a fight that had recently happened. Slashes against trees, scorch marches, and obviously used kanai and shurikens. Strangely enough, the signs of battle led off to the edge of the forest. Following the now man-made path, Naruto found himself walking towards two large statues of the first Hokage and Madara Uchiha. Neither the two statues nor the beautiful waterfall between them kept Naruto's attention as his eyes instantly darted to the bloody body at the bottom of the statues. He quickly scaled down the cliffs as quickly as possible. Caution had been thrown to the wind as it was obvious that he had just missed the fight. Once down, Naruto easily identified the body as Neji's due to the long brown hair pearl-like eyes, and beige clothes. Blood dripped from the sides of his mouth and a deep, wide hole located right over his left lung bleed at a steady rate. It was obvious that Neji had attempted to apply pressure to his wound and prevent himself from bleeding to death. Naruto shook his head, not delusional enough to believe that Neji would live. You, you just missed him, Neji suddenly said. Naruto nodded, but said nothing. Neji took this as a sign to continue, and at least make his last words worthwhile. I see caught up with him, a ways back, our fight EVE eventually lead here. Afterwards, he transformed, into T this demon. He took a long drawn out breath in hope of steadying his voice. Couldn't stop him. He simply said, he's already crossed the border. It seems L like I can't continue to fight fate any anymore. Those words caused Naruto's eyes to widen. Hey ha ha. Just as I start to fight, this happens. At this point, Naruto felt the need to say something, anything, so long as the Hyuga didn't pass away in silence. Is there anything you would like us to tell your team? Three weeks later, three weeks, has it only really been three weeks? The thought was one that had repeatedly entered Naruto's head today as he went about packing supplies for the three year training trip. Three weeks. The thought repeated. It had been three weeks since the failed retrieval mission and since Neji's death. Oddly enough it wasn't Neji's death that bothered him, but Neji's last words to his teammates. Tell them, I'm sorry, he was dying and he was sorry. Naruto just couldn't understand it. Telling the Hyuga's sensei and teammates went as expected. The flames of youth duo cried waterfalls intent and excused herself, obviously to go where her grieve could not be seen. After reporting with Shikamaru to the Hokage. Both were reprimanded for not only the failure of the mission but the death of Neji Hayuga. No punishments were given, but Naruto felt like he had been punished. As soon as their reports were over, Tsunade informed Naruto that he would be taking a three year training trip with Jiraiya. He had tried to fight it, bitch about it, and even threaten. Nothing deadly, just promises to annoy her to the point of insanity. In the end, Naruto solved nothing and he ended up preparing for the trip. Closing the door to his house, he began making his way to the village gate. As he walked, Naruto double checked that he had everything taken care of before it was outside of the village. Bought clothes so Jiraiya doesn't become suspicious, gave Anko and Sakura a key to our apartment, 
ask Shino to go by and get rid of the bugs that decide to make our home theirs, anything else? Naruto had given keys to Sakura and Anko to ensure that his apartment could be dusted while he was away, and the only people he could think of that he could trust, other than Shino, were the only women he kept in contact with on a daily basis. Speaking of the pink-haired team member, Naruto had been surprised by the lack of sadness or anger she showed when he informed her that the mission was a failure. Instead there was a burning resolve. Anko had been another story. Naruto couldn't get much out of her other than disappoint in the loss of Free Dango. He made sure to inform her of his trip at the very least and was somewhat pleased that she didn't find the idea all that appealing. Naruto chuckled when he thought back to his last conversation with Shino. The look on the bug user's face had been priceless after he had received his answer as to why he wasn't given a spare key to Naruto house. Then again Shino's reaction to being told that the reason he didn't receive a key was due to fact that Naruto thought he could pick the lock with his bugs was understandable. The fact that Naruto was right was beside the point. Hey Brad good to see your other sensei's sense of punctuality hasn't rubbed off on you. Jiraiya said all too familiarly as far as Naruto was concerned. Let's just get this over with. Said Naruto as he walked past Jiraiya. Get this over. How the hell are we just supposed to get over three years? Jiraiya thought. The end. Now we will see you in the next video.